All right, ladies and gentlemen. It's not quite eight o'clock, but we're going to kind of start getting things. Can't hear me? I got to get closer. Oh. Hello? Oh, turn it on. Jesus Christmas. You know what? I should be better at this stuff than I am. All right. Thanks, Fenderson. All right. So it's not quite eight o'clock, but I want to get things moving so that we progress through the day uh, and have plenty of time. We're going to handle some of the, the, the business as it is right now before we start. First, I appreciate everybody who's uh, made it here today. I appreciate all those who are volunteer fire department members and firefighters who are here today. Um, I know that it could be a rough day, so I appreciate you. And I, I also acknowledge if you have to get up because the beeper goes off, that you have to get up because the beeper's going off. So uh, I hope everything's okay out with the West. Um, with that, just a few of the housekeeping items, of course, cell phones off. You guys all know the rules. Uh, parking, get the parking when you need to leave. If you're in the parking garage, check with the lady, Stacy in the back when you leave. She'll give you the permit to get out of the parking uh, garage and, and not have to pay for that. We also have tickets for breakfast uh, in the morning. And so make sure you have your breakfast tickets. That's pretty good. Our CCA credits. I pushed the wrong button. You're getting credits, so don't worry about that. But normally we do credits at the end of each session with the QR code. I have one for each day. So we're going to give you the QR code at lunch, before we go to lunch. And at the end of the day, it is the same QR code. So just know that you only have to do that once. So somewhere along the way, instead of getting a QR for each session, I pushed the wrong button, got a QR code for each day. But we do have the CCA credits. Don't worry about that. You're getting plenty of soil water, plenty of soil, uh, uh, soil fertility, and all that good stuff. We will have our one ag plant for those online. Ag plant is not going to be a virtual option. ODAF needs that, that in-person signature. We will have the ag plant two hours for those online. And for those that want to know, the two hours of ag plant, we're going to have it saved. It will go into a SharePoint for the county offices. And so the county offices will have access to these recordings so they can do, they can host meetings in the office where they play multiple series of these ad plant for Oklahoma applicator licenses. Does that make sense? We'll pass out all the papers when that's needed. Uh, a couple of things that we're doing that I want you to be aware of is that like years in the past, we have our graduate student poster competition that's going on. Uh, why we'll be solicitating judges for this afternoon. Uh, we don't want the faculty to be the judges. We want the audience. And Mike's already said, Mike, Mike's first step. Mike's already said, I want to do it. Uh, the judges will be compensated with an eat wheat license plate. So we need a couple of judges to look through this. Uh, for the graduate students, uh, we have money on the line. With the passing of Dr. Ron, there were some monies available. And so for now, at least for the, the future, we're going to be awarding prizes for the Winter Crop School Poster Contest in honor of uh, Dr. Bill Ron. And so we're looking at first place is about, I think we're going to do like a three, two, one first place, 300 for first place, two for second, 100 for first. But we're going to have about 20 posters. So folks, these are master's PhDs. They were told that take what you're doing and make it apply. So the content, it's all about being ethical to you. We hear all the times like we don't know what's going on at OSU. This is how you can figure out what's going on at OSU with our research. These are the folks that do the research. And so this is a way to get in and see what's happening. Again, we're going to have a little bit of a, a flow, difference of flow because we are virtual. We have somewhere around 40 people watching virtual either now or recorded. So we are recording this. So there's going to be a little bit of a pause there, but we're going to move through that. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to ask me any problems, ask me. Uh, and we have Stacy Payne and the group with uh, conferencing out the door that's helping with that. But with that, if we could uh, share the screen on the Zoom, Grace, I don't know if you can go into that and do the share screen. 
And we'll start the meeting with uh, Caleb Stone. So our first meeting is a nutrient management. Uh, we have really good speakers. We're working at first to the 590. And this is an important aspect because 590 changed. So Caleb is going to take a look at it as far as um, the NRCS viewpoint of the 590 change. This is nutrient management standards. Uh, Dr. Zong will then come in and address, you know, the science behind the changes. And then I, I'm pleased that we were able to pull in some outside speakers. And, and one, we have Dr. Infinito and I, Jim, I always say your name wrong. I'm sorry. And, and you're so good. Yeah. And so uh, Colorado State Wheat Specialist, uh, Nutrient Management Specialist will come in and discuss uh, a lot of work he's doing in micro. So with that, Caleb. Swing that around. Next. Okay. All right. Can everybody hear me fine? Okay. All right. Uh, thank you guys for having me. As you said, I'm Caleb Stone. I'm an agronomist for USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. I'll apologize up front. You have lots of good speakers lined up for the next two days, and unfortunately, you started with me. Um, we have, as he said, we have updated our 590 nutrient management standard this year. If you do anything with the poultry industry, you have probably already seen three quarters of this presentation. Uh, we've been working with Claude Best and the extension folks to present that to our uh, poultry producers that it really affects them. So just to start with some background, most of you are probably aware of this, but you know, what is a conservation practice standard? A standard is a structural practice like a pond or a terrace, vegetative measures like cover crops, brush management, things like that, or a management activity such as nutrient management, pest management, no-till, things like that. But those practices are designed to address, protect, or stop the degradation of soil, water, air, plant, and animal resource concerns. If you work with your County offices, they probably talk about resource concerns and that's what they're referring to. These standards, they're set nationally. They set the minimum criteria, the minimum guidelines and requirements for that conservation practice. And that standard, like I said, it's set nationally. It sets a definition. It sets the purposes, where it is applicable, and then it establishes criteria. So for nutrient management, one of the purposes is water quality. Therefore, there are specific criteria to address that water quality. And if you look at the standard, whether it be in Florida, Oklahoma, California, wherever, that standard, since it's set nationally, will look very, very similar. But what we have the option of is here in the states, we can refer to a specification that takes into account local research, working with OSU, to make that standard where it is applicable to our area and reduce the risk of failure. And this establishes the this standard and specification as a package establishes the minimum acceptable level of quality that's required to plan, design, install, operate, maintain that conservation practice. It is required by all NRCS employees to follow this. However, we are a voluntary technical agency. We are not like the IRS, the EPA, we don't go knocking on doors and saying, you must do X, Y, Z. A producer can voluntarily walk in our office, call somebody, say, hey, I'm interested in erosion, water quality, whatever it is. A lot of times they already know what they're interested in. But our planners will then go to the field and work with them to come up with a plan that includes alternatives. And ultimately that producer picks I want to do X, Y, Z, whatever that may be. If they enter into some type of a federal contract, then they have to follow these requirements. Otherwise, it's entirely just information, technical, technical information. The development process, these standards are updated every five years. All of them are, whether it's cover crop, no-till, pest management, nutrient management, they're all every five years. It goes through an internal review and then it goes to the federal register for 30 days. Nutrient management is interesting. Our last revision was in 2012. The five years expired in 2017. They had so many comments nationally from the ag retailers, the commodity groups, the fertilizer industry, all of those groups, environmental groups, 
they had enough comments that it actually went through this process twice and we didn't get it until July of 2019. So we're long overdue for this. Once it's released, if a state wants to adopt that standard, if we're going to plan that in Oklahoma, we have to adopt that national standard. We can incorporate any changes, like I said, through a specification that are from, make it adaptable to Oklahoma, but we have to be more stringent, not less. So we work with OSU, we work with ODAF. As soon as this came out, we had meetings with, with them and sat down and started going through how to revise this. And we go through this whole process and then ultimately it goes out to our entire state. Uh, I say our entire state, our technical committees, we have folks that review it and make sure it will work in every county in Oklahoma. So the big difference you say, well, why is this important to us? Well, because we write this as a practice standard, as a voluntary agency, but Oklahoma is one of three states that has the NRCS 590 written into state law. So every time we update this, we affect the state poultry law. So if we had to sum it up, everybody in here is, you know, does something with crops. We can sum up the 12 or 13 page standard in these two bullets. It applies to all nutrient sources, whether that's organic sources, poultry litter, feedlot pen pack, swine affluent, or inorganics, uh, anhydrous, uh, urea, DAP, whatever that may be. But it even applies to food scraps and compost, things where there is a nutrient value in that and it's being land applied. Whoops. And then we're just following the four R's of nutrients. Right time, right source, right rate, that same stuff that we've all, we all know about to reduce our environmental impact and, the, and those losses to the environment. We'd go through a nitrogen leaching index tool. This has been in here since the late 90s. It hasn't changed. Um, Russell is an erosion modeling tool that we use. I was hoping it was going to disappear a couple years ago. So I took it upon myself to take the data out of that and make an Excel spreadsheet. That's what that nitrogen leaching index tool is. It basically looks at soil runoff curve numbers as well as your rainfall data for your county and comes up with a leaching index. We then look at that map that's in the bottom of the uh, screen there. That is our original, very crude map, but you can tell it pretty much follows the river channels in Oklahoma, the major river channels in Oklahoma. We now have this map in Google Earth and various data layers where you can, you can pull that information. But if we have a leaching index of say a 6.7 and a moderate groundwater vulnerability rating, then we can look and get an overall rating and come up with mitigating activities. There are 11 of these mitigating activities. There are, some of them aren't too bad. The common ones that we run into is instead of testing every two to three years, we test annually. That way we can adjust our nitrogen rates based on a more current soil test. The other that's popular with the poultry growers in Eastern Oklahoma, if they've got a four ton yield goal, we reduce that yield to three tons, therefore, we're we're putting out less nitrogen to meet that yield goal. There's other ones like using uh, nitrogen efficiency products, um, incorporating your nitrogen products, things like that, splitting applications, but those haven't changed in 20 years. The big change that affected most of us was they changed how we do uh, their definition of how we do a phosphorus index. And they set it in the standard that basically anytime we exceed, our phosphorus application rate exceeds land-grant university fertility rate guidelines for the planned crops, which Oklahoma State's is soil test phosphorus is 65. That's sufficient. Hyland's going to talk about that a little later in the research that, that goes into that. Or if that is in a planned imp phosphorus impaired watershed, which we have those across the state, even in parts of western Oklahoma, it's not just an eastern Oklahoma problem, or if we have, uh, have not defined site-specific conditions that equate to a low risk of phosphorus losses and, uh, and worked that out with basically DEQ, and we don't have that in Oklahoma. But any fields that are excluded from a phosphorus index risk assessment must have that agronomic need. So back to the soil test phosphorus 65. That wasn't too bad to meet, but nationally they set what this risk assessment would equate to. So a low risk, we could apply phosphorus at rates greater than crop removal. If it was a moderate risk, 
we could only apply not to exceed the crop removal rate. And if it was a high risk, we had to have a phosphorus drawdown, phosphorus drawdown strategy. We had to have uh, site assessments to determine if mitigating practices were needed, or we had to go to the chief of NRCS. So we wanted to stay out of that high risk category, but we had some issues with that moderate risk, especially in soils that have historically received manure application or litter applications. So we won't spend a lot of time. This is what 2012's documents looked like. We had two tables, they were pretty busy. We had one for nutrient limited watersheds, one for non-nutrient limited watersheds. I just wanna point out before we move on, our old rating cut off at 65 soil test phosphorus, which is what Highland's gonna show you here, here shortly. That's agronomic sufficient. Depending on where you were at, that moderate rating cut off at either 120 or at 250. And that was where we had the big discussion with OSU and ODAF was how do we handle those soils that have had historic litter applications that are above 65. And then you can see that basically, depending on where you're at, a full rate, um, if we were at 120 to 250, depending on where you were at, they could get a full rate. Uh, full rate was 200 pounds, P205 surface applied, 300 pounds if we put that out through sprinkler irrigation, typically with hog farms or dairies, uh, 400 pounds if we incorporated that, and then a half rate was half of those rates, or we could split that application uh, basically 30 days apart. What we came up with for this version, um, those tables really hadn't changed a lot in 20 years. This is our new, new table. You'll notice that our soil test phosphorus index, we've doubled agronomic sufficiency, that, that agronomic sufficient rating for our low, our low range. If we have fairly low slopes, zero to 8% soils, deep soils, that is a low risk. So that is back to that 200 pounds P205 surface applied, 300 pounds if we run that through a sprinkler. If we increase that slope eight to 15%, now we have a greater chance of that litter, manure, the nutrients, whatever, running down a slope if we got a big toad strangler rain, you know, a heavy rainfall event or something, those nutrients move. And so you notice it's still a low risk, but there's a footnote of a one. That one is that we're going to split apply that. So we can still apply up to the 200 pounds P205, but we're splitting that out into two applications of 100 pounds. If we, regardless of our slope, but we, if we shallow that soil up, there's not as much area to store those nutrients. There's not as much area for root growth. And so therefore we're not trapping and storing as much so you notice there's a footnote of a two, that is a reduced rate only, 100 pounds P205, 150 pounds if we put that through a sprinkler. And then if we, like I said earlier, that moderate rating, once we get above 120 is where we really struggled with what we were going to do. And so it, when we got to 120, that 120 to 300, that was where we established our cutoff you notice it's still a low risk. And we sat around and talked with all of our partners and came up and started asking, I guess, what conditions would be in a field where when we go out to write that plan and assess that site, that those field conditions would assess to a low risk of nutrient movement in that setting. And so we came up with these three things. If it's a crop field and there's a 30 foot buffer between that, the edge of that crop field and the transition to a water body, that's an opportunity to trap those nutrients. And so research shows we can trap those, that's a low risk. If it's a hay meadow where they bale that hay, load it up, haul it off site, take it someplace else, it's not fed there, then that's a low risk because we're essentially mining those nutrients and hauling them off. If they graze it or they feed the hay back in the same area, it defaults to pasture. We look at basically the grazing practices out there. We wanna make sure there's perennial vegetation that's covered 80% of that field or more, less than 5% bare ground, minimal livestock concentration areas, no compaction, no erosion, things like that. If we can meet those things, then it's a low risk. If we can't, it defaults to a moderate risk. And a moderate risk, like I said before, they defined that nationally as P205 applications only to the crop removal rate based on uh, table five. We've got a national 
manual that has tables of crop removal rates. So when we don't meet those management conditions or we shallow the soils up, get above a soil test, the moderate risk. And then outside of that, it's a high risk. So some people have asked, what about incorporation and injection? Well, incorporation and injection no longer justifies that really high rate of 400 pounds of P205, P205. Our previous agronomic or our previous low rating was zero to 65. Agronomic sufficiency is 65. We've essentially doubled that. And every time that we've gone back to specifically meeting with ODAF, we have had consistent issues with defining incorporation and injection. Primarily this comes from the advent of vertical tillage tools. Not all of them are made identical. So all of us in here may agree that a disc will incorporate the litter, a disc will incorporate the manure, but you start putting vertical tillage in there and then it's aerators and it's, it gets to be a bigger and bigger stretch. We also had issues with putting that um, incorporation practice into a pasture setting and not running into issues with sod busting and HEL provisions. So we've revisited this several times with ODAF, it's always come back as uh, a no. So what does this look like? You know, in, in reality, if we had a nutrient limited watershed, good Bermuda grass pasture, no overgrazing, everything's perfect. Our soil test phosphorus is getting up there with a 275 uh, or 274, excuse me. In 2012, this would be a high rate, be a half rate application of hundred pounds of, of poultry litter or, or livestock manure. In 2012, it's a low risk, Yes, we've still, we're still putting out 100 pounds, but we can do it twice. So we've got a, up to 200 pounds applied annually as long as we don't exceed the nitrogen needs of that crop. However, if we overgraze that field and we don't have a lot of perennials in that system, uh, our 2012 rating doesn't change. Our new rating though, that's a moderate risk. And so we can only apply to, to P205 removal. And so here's the math that goes into that. If we have a litter test that is 59.7 pounds of uh, P205, we're removing a th three tons. When we convert that to dry matter, it's 2,100 pounds. When we take into account the phosphorus content of that dry matter, we're actually only removing 9.2 pounds of P205. And when we divide that by what's in the poultry litter, we can apply a whopping 0.15 tons of poultry litter. There's no feasible way we're ever gonna be able to do that. And I, there, there's just no way. Um, Hi Lynn has mentioned several times about maybe we double that rate to apply two years worth in, in one year. That's still 0.3 tons, still not a real good way of doing that. So this is where crop advisors, extension staff, your NRCS office can work with that producer to try and come up with ways to improve that management to allow an application in future years. Um, it may not work for that year. We have run this example. I've run it on poultry, dairy, cattle, feedlots, uh, basically situations all across the state. One of the other things I'll point out, just due to time, we're only using this, but one of the big things that several uh, producers have noticed is there's a huge difference between grazing out wheat, harvesting wheat for grain and that removal, but even take that further and start rotating crops and maybe putting a silage crop in there because we have some instances where a moderate, moderate rating still resulted in applying 10, 11 tons of feedlot pin pack or something like that. So this is where whoever's advising and working with that producer can work with them on some crop rotations and things like that to help with with getting that litter applied or that manure. So some examples of what we look at out there, this was a site, uh, we did some field checking in Eastern Oklahoma, this was in Delaware County from the road. Um, when we drove up, I'll admit, I thought, boy, that's grazed off like a carpet, it's all even, there's no dead weeds, there's no plant skeletons, nothing like that. And when we get out there and start walking, that's a beautiful stand of Bermuda and fescue with clovers coming up in it, it was, it was great. And then the producer actually met with us. He grazed this in a rotational grazing system. The cattle had grazed it. They got enough rainfall that he then turned around and bailed that 
uh, came in and bailed it. The cattle were at the far end of his rotation. The cattle had just come back in and just left this field. This was in August of 2020. So this is ideally what we're looking at is just somebody, we don't care about the rotational grazing. We just want to make sure that they are grazing to maintain a minimum, you know, maintain some plants out there that will take up the nutrients. This was the other extreme that we saw. I think this was in Adair County. Cattle were out there, like I said, August of 2020. They had overgrazed it all summer. They were still out there continuing to graze it. You can see the cow pies. They've even grubbed off right there close to the cow pies. Cattle don't typically do that. But every time that plant is using root reserves to push a leaf back out, the cattle were nipping it off. So going into winter, those plants are not healthy. And so this is a site where we would call this overgrazed and, and we would have to throw it in that moderate category. So that's pretty much the poultry side of things and the big impact on phosphorus. Since I had you guys' attention for a little bit, I wanted to share uh, a couple things kind of in wrapping up about some common questions that have come up. In the process last spring of going through this, um, one of our state ag groups uh, sent some letters out. They sent them, I don't know who they sent them to in Oklahoma. I know where it went to out of state because I got copies of it from some people. But um, the comment was that NRCS was shutting down the fertilizer industry and putting all farmers out of business because of these four bullet points. These four setback areas have been in our standard for 20 years. Um, basically 100 feet of a well, perennial stream, pond, sinkhole, 50 feet of intermittent streams don't apply to areas greater than 15% slope or less than 10 inches to bedrock. We did move this, this statement um, in the past, it only applied to organic nutrients, so it applied primarily to poultry litter, but we had issues uh, in some counties that, and I was one of them, that when I was in a field office, we put this on all fertilizer applications that we helped with. Um, but we had some areas where they were applying, you know, urea over the top of wellheads and things like that. Well, that kind of defeats the purpose of water quality. So we moved this to where it applied to all nutrients. Now, before everybody says, well, that we're not doing that, blah, blah, blah. I just wanna recap, we are a technical voluntary agency. There are two groups of people that that setback affects and this whole standard affects. One is, is the people or one group are the people that are tied to that Oklahoma state poultry law. It went into, this went into effect in April of 2021. If they have a poultry litter plan that was dated prior to that, they're grandfathered in. This is not retroactive. Um, they can operate that plan until it expires. If it expired in June of 2021, when it's updated, then it new nutrient management plans for applications, it will have to meet these. The other group of folks that this affects that some of you in here may be working with are folks that are tied to an EQIP or a CSP plan through or contract through one of our field offices. And that is where we are providing an incentive, financial incentive for those producers to change their nutrient management and basically bring it up to some type of a new standard within 590 and protect that resource concern. Um, I'm working on some documents right now to try and help our field offices with communication of that to the producer of what that is and help them communicate that to you guys who might be working with them, to those of you that might be applying on those. We've got some documents. I hope they'll be out maybe in January to those field offices to help with that. I was going to go into some more other stuff, but due to time, I'll just mention this. In the last two years, I've had a lot of questions come up about soil testing labs and NRCS not allowing this or that. As I said, we're tied to our land grant university, tied to Oklahoma State. They use Malik 3 as an extraction method. Everything in their soil test uh, recommendations Fact sheet 2225 on the soil test interpretations is all based on Malik 3. So if you are using, we, we can't say what soils lab to use. You can use OSU, you can use another lab, but please, 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 when you use those other labs, make sure they're using Malik 3, because if they're not, we have no way of correlating that back to anything, and therefore we can't do anything with that. So I don't know how I'm doing on time, but if there's questions, 
I'll be happy to answer them. I'll be around today and tomorrow if, if you have questions and don't want to ask them now. Yeah, time, Oh, okay. So, yes. So as a CCA, can we go into that field office and get a template to help our producers make sure we can check off those boxes? So sure we're not forgetting something right. that before they go in their office and they sign their contracts. So part of what I'm trying to work on and get to our offices is exactly that, where our, the producer, because you can't walk in an office, it's Freedom of Information Act, they can't give out any of that information. But if I give it to the producer and say, hey, Mike's going to be applying on this, you need to give him that, that's what we're hoping to get to those offices here soon. The other thing I'll mention, I hope I'm not stealing Highlands Thunder, but I think he's worked on some modifications to some questions that if they're doing poultry litter or something, there's some questions that go with that soil test to help with that as well. So good question. So Any? We, can, we can go in and get that template. Yeah. Here. Oh, yeah. You can go in and ask for the standard information. They just can't give you anything on a specific producer. No, right. right. Okay. Okay. Producer. Yes. Yes. Yeah, because each one's going to be different. Right. Yeah, and or email me and send you the information <coughs> to you. I've sent stuff to several of you in here. So yeah, either way, you can go into that local yeah, office. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna overwhelm everybody with that. <laughs> so good question. Anything else? Any other questions? All right. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. If you just hang over this, this over your head. Your pointer? Yeah. Hey, good morning. Um, my name is Hailin Zhang. I think I know many of you. Uh, I'm a professor at OSU, work on nutrient management, also serve as a director of the soil testing lab. So if you send samples to OSU, that's to my lab. I'm sorry if there's any problem, we try to improve all the time, right? So what I like to visit with you this morning, basically just uh, follow up with Caleb's uh, outline of the 590 standard. The standard basically is try to balance crop production and environmental quality. There were a lot of uh, signs uh, went into that. So OSU worked with NRCS to revise the guideline. Uh, what I like to do is uh, to highlight some of the um, basics to justify some of the rules they set up. Now, this is my understanding. It doesn't mean uh, it accounts for all the, you know, scientific basis that they used. So hopefully you have a better understanding of the uh, How do I forward the slide? It's not moving. Okay, so basically this uh, guideline is not only ap just applied to the porch litter, it's also applied for swine operation and feedlots, dairies, as well uh, as they get a uh, permit from ODAF, like AFOS, they have to comply with the same rules. But this is primarily address the application beyond the agronomic rate. So the recommendation you get from our soil test report, that's uh, agronomic rate. 
So it's all in the low risk category. You don't need to worry about that. But when they're using livestock waste because they have it, in the past, they may just, uh, okay. They used excessively. That's why they try to address that issue. But the main point uh, for those uh, 590 standard is to consider both nitrogen and phosphorus when they decide how much litter or manure they can apply. So for nitrogen, basically the crop requirement is upper limit. Uh, you should not get over that. Also consider leaching potential in certain areas, nitrogen leaches faster than other areas. Uh, as Caleb showed, the map will highlight that. But more importantly is the phosphorus. You know, when we were in school, we were told phosphorus is immobile, right? That's true. It's relatively immobile compared to potassium and, ni and nitrogen. It still moves a little bit. So apparently there have been some issues directly related to phosphorus contamination of water. This is why they try to uh, categorize the risk of P loss into low, medium, and high, and then have a strategy to uh, address these issues. Well, it's not moving. Maybe we're too far from the computer, right? Go ahead, just forward for me, please. Exactly. Yes. On your soil test P, does it take into account subsoil P in your recommendations, or are you just going off the top three or top six inches on that initial soil sample at the north of the day, or do that subsoil phosphorus need to be accounted for too? Currently, we do not consider subsoil phosphorus. Our depth is six inch. I think six inch probably will cover 80% of the roots. So that's what we thought is the best depth to use. But for nitrate, for certain crops like wheat, bumida grass, it would be nice to get subsoil nitrogen as well. Okay, anyway, um, right now the fertilizer price is so high, I don't think any farmer would uh, over apply it, right? But with portulator, that could happen. Particularly, portulator and other animal waste contains all the 16 nutrients crop needs, uh, particularly nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, right? It's a really good resource. Plus, it has uh, organic matter. Uh, in the future, you may hear people talking about carbon credits if they apply uh, manure to their field. But one problem is that. Uh, the ratio between nitrogen and phosphorus in that uh, organic amendments like manure does not match the crop requirement. Crops need more nitrogen, less phosphorus, right? However, the manure contains a one-to-one -one ratio. So if you use the manure to supply needed nitrogen, you over apply four times of phosphorus. Just like me, I have a small stomach. I need a, only a burger. I buy a meal deal. I get an extra fries and pop. I don't, I may not need it. So this is, it has been uh, created some issues in the past because uh, some people just try to get nitrogen benefits, neglected the others. For example, if you're using those to fertilize the corn, 
it only removes a small amount. But if you're using dairy or poultry litter to supply that uh, nitrogen, you over applied a lot of this phosphorus. As you know, when you over apply phosphorus, it builds up. It shows up in your soil test. The soil test of phosphorus gets higher and higher. So this is why uh, we developed a soil test calibration, okay? We test the soil, find out the soil supplying capacity. And then we determine whether you need a phosphorus or not. It's not just a base on nitrogen for phosphorus. Now the phosphorus in Oklahoma is based strictly on soil test. We don't consider crop removal. If you are old enough, you may remember the late Dr. Johnson using the dipstick theory to uh, explain our strategy for nitrogen and uh, phosphorus management. Phosphorus is like the oil in your car's engine, right? You use the dipstick to measure it. You, it don't care how far you drive. The nitrogen is like the gasoline in the tank. It's proportional to the distance you're gonna drive. So that's a yield based for nitrogen, soil test based for uh, phosphorus. So this diagram showing how we make agronomic phosphorus recommendation. As soil test G increases, the soil's ability to supply phosphorus also increased to 100%. 65 right here. That means it's 100% sufficient. You do not need to apply any. If it's less than that, it's less than 100% sufficiency. So in order to get to the optimum yields, you need to apply this much phosphate. So that's how we uh, constructed our recommendation. Now the 590 basically is uh, addressing beyond this point when it still allowed them to apply, but may or may not uh, get to the benefits. So what happens if you keep applying when the plot crops are no longer response to it, right? Like uh, here, you already have adequate amount in the soil test, like uh, 65 right here. Crop does not respond anymore if you keep applying. However, the phosphorus in the runoff will dramatically increase. When this phosphorus gets into creeks, streams, lakes, there is a problem. So that's why we try to address here, okay? And we establish a relationship between malic 3 phosphorus and a water-soluble phosphorus. Normally we don't do water-soluble phosphorus because typically it's a very small amount. It's like only 6% of malic 3 uh, so test P. However, if you build up to very high metric strip P, you have more water soluble P. Therefore, the runoff water can carry it down the slope and get into our water bodies. So that's the relationship between soil test P and water quality impairment. When you have some conditions favorable for the phosphorus to get uh, moved from land to water, that's a particular uh, concern. For example, in eastern Oklahoma, we have the slopes, we have a lot of porch litter we apply to pasture, and we have lots of rain. So it's very easy for the farmers to get in downstream. If you're in the panhandle, you don't have any rain, you probably don't need to worry that much. So, uh, like Iowa, they have a lot of drainage system. It could get to the leachate and get into the water system as well. So although phosphorus does not move much, uh, it can still get into our water body systems. And when the phosphorus gets into the water, the algae will start to grow. They're like a cr crops, right? When they get the nitrogen, phosphorus, they start to grow. Most of fresh water is controlled by phosphorus because uh, some of the algae can fix nitrogen by itself. Even you cut off the nitrogen supply, 
they can manufacture themselves. But if you cut off phosphorus or any other one of the 16 nutrients, they're not going to grow. But when you supply phosphorus, you're going to have this kind of situation. Okay, just like uh, you put phosphorus in your uh, field crops, it can grow the biomass, increase the yields. So that's uh, how phosphorus in our soil can potentially impact our water qualities. Different soil would have a different capacity to retain the soils. We need to treat it differently. Like we measure the phosphorus absorption capacity for these three Oklahoma soils. You can see here, the maximum amount can be retained by this soil is 64, but this one is almost 300. Why is that? Because the clay content is very different. Organic metal content are well. So uh, some states actually treat different soil different. We have a qualitative uh, guideline. Uh, it does not uh, uh, treat specific soils that uh, specific, I mean, exact. But the leaching index does tie to different soil series because the soil so does highlight uh, the soil clay content, organic matter. Uh, so in order for phosphorus to cause the problem, typically there are several factors need to be considered. One of them is called a source factor. That means uh, either the phosphorus already in the soil or you apply a lot on the surface. The other one is transport factor how phosphorus move from land to water. Is there a big slope? Is there uh, intensive rainfall? Or does erosion takes place there? So those are the factors will determine is the phosphorus moving or not. The second is the water body sensitivity. And the water is very sensitive. If you are living in Eastern Oklahoma, the Scenic River phosphorus standard is 0 0.037 ppm, it's very, very low. Most of our instruments cannot even quantify that precisely. So that's how sensitive the water body is to uh, phosphorus. And unfortunately, those are available in some parts of our state. So that's why we have to uh, pay attention to those issues. Now, this is a table uh, Caleb just showed. It's a uh, core of the 590 standard. You know, here, soil test P, basically this is a source factor, okay? As soil test P increases, the potential for phosphorus increase, uh, phosphor loss also increases. And here you have slope, soil depths, plus pasture management. Those are actually the transport factors. If you have a steep slope, the chance for phosphorus get lost is much higher. If you have a shallow soil, it does not retain a lot of phosphorus. So that's why they make distinction here uh, by slope and uh, depth of soil. Uh, so based on this, you get uh, low risk to high risk, okay? So associated with risk, we can recommend the producers to uh, manage it accordingly like when the risk is high, they should not apply anything because uh, nutrient can get lost very quickly. If it's moderate or medium risk, they can apply just small amount, crop removal uh, amount of phosphorus. If it's low, it depends on how they manage the pasture or the field. It, uh, it could apply to the full amount, 200 pounds of phosphate, that's equivalent to three and a half tons of poultry litter. That's quite a bit. Right now, if you calculate the value of poultry litter, it worth over $80 a ton. So if you guys are interested uh, uh, to find a substitute uh, source of nutrients, that's a good time. I heard the uh, Oklahoma Conservation Commission is going to provide an incentive to buy poultry litter starting in January. I think. Uh, 
you get eight cents per mile per ton within 100 miles distance from uh, uh, the source. So just check it out with your local conservation district office for specifics. Uh, if there are some other conditions are required to reduce the rate or split apply. So that's all based on the risks for that particular field. Now, when they already build up so sort of phosphorus to a high level or like over 120, they only can apply the amount of phosphorus removed by the crop. Is that practical? Well, Caleb showed the 0.15 tons per acre per year. That's a very small amount, right? That depends on what crops you have, how much you harvest. So you can calculate the amount of phosphorus removed. For example, if a pasture has a Bermuda grass there, it removes roughly about nine pounds of phosphate per year per ton. If they get four tons per acre, that's 36 pounds of phosphate. That's equivalent to about a half a ton per liter. Still, it's difficult to apply half a ton per liter uniformly or economically. So the advice to them is try not to build up to a high level. Otherwise, they are run out of fields to put their porch liter. So if the field is already high in phosphorus, can we use a plant to lower it? Theoretically, you can. Practically, it's very, very slow, okay? Uh, based on our research, we found that you need to add or remove 14 pounds of PDO5 to change metric strip by one, okay? It's not a one-to-one -one relationship because the soil will retain a lot of them. Some of them will get lost. If you base on that calculation, uh, it will take uh, 20 years to lower soil test speed by 100. If you can harvest eight tons per acre. Now in practice, uh, the time may be shorter than that because you have a natural loss, like a runoff loss. But even cut it by half, still need 10 years. So it's a long time to wait. Uh, if they ran out of the fields to put, it, they have to give it away or sell the porch later. And I found this information from, I think, North Carolina. They also did a drawdown experiment. What they found was that uh, it dropped uh, from uh, here to here about 150. It took uh, almost 20 years, 18 years. So. Uh, just to further illustrate how long it would take to draw down the phosphate. Sometimes I hear people say, you know, my field tested 250 last year and uh, I didn't apply. This year is 120. Probably the sampling has some problem there, right? It cannot uh, decrease that fast. So that's for nitrogen. And for phosphorus, what about nitrogen? How do you determine the maximum nitrogen you need? Well, if you send a soil sample, you have to uh, mark what crop you're going to grow, what's the yield goal you want to achieve. Based on that, we can determine the amount of nitrogen needed. You know, the rule of sum is like two pounds of nitrogen per bushel of wheat, 50 pounds of nitrogen per ton of Bermuda grass. Then we give credit to the nitrogen, nitrogen in the soil. Uh, the difference is the amount you need to supply through fertilizer or from manure, right? And uh, here I have a diagram showing uh, the way we recommend nitrogen for Bermuda grass, depend on yields. Uh, less than four tons is 50 pounds per ton, about four tons, a little bit more the use efficiency is getting a little lower. So we have to know what crop you're going to grow and the year ago you try to achieve in order to get a nitrogen recommendation. But unfortunately, a lot of counties or co-ops, they put same year goal every year for all the fields. 
that seems to me is not very appropriate. So we need to help them to establish a realistic year goal for different fields. How do we do that? Well, the recommendation is that aim a little bit higher. If you get a good year, you are not missing out anything. Uh, then you take the average of the three highest years in the last five consecutive years. So that's a little bit higher than the five years average or add a percentage to the five years average yields. So that's being optimistic. That way we don't have to guess what yield we put there or with the same yield for every field uh, every year. So this is an example. Uh, we farmers probably already have records of the yields. So if they harvest uh, in the last five years for Bermuda grass range from two and a half tons to 4.5 tons. So there's big differences too. And the five year average is uh, three and a half. The three highest uh, years is four. If you add 15% to that five year average is also four. So four tons per acre is a realistic yield goal for this field. You can do similar calculation for wheat, for corn, for other crops as well. That way you get the more precise nitrogen recommendations from us. Okay? I think any states uh, will use nitrogen, uh, using year ago and crop to make nitrogen recommendations. But some states do consider yields for phosphorus and potassium, but in Oklahoma, we do not. We're using the sufficiency concept. Other states may using maintenance and build up uh, approach. They add a little bit more than what's needed for this year, try to build up the soil test the phosphorus. Finally, I guess the, the 590 standard also recommend to follow the 4R principles. I think uh, most of you, or all of you already familiar with that. I mean, if we follow these 4Rs, it's going to be environmental friendly, socially acceptable because we're not causing any problem. But it's also more economical because we want to uh, conserve the resource. Uh, when I was in graduate school, we were told uh, we would run out of phosphorus in 25 years. That's 30 some years ago. Now they say we have another 100 years uh, supply of phosphorus. But they're just getting less and less. We have to uh, be cautious about that. Also, we don't want to waste any nutrients, any money, right? So how do you decide what uh, the right source and the rate? Well, if you get your soil tested, we can recommend exactly which nutrients you need, how much you need. If you're using organic amendment, get it tested so you know what's available, okay? The manure is not like commercial fertilizer. They have the labeling, labels there, but you, they have to get tested. Both of them require a good job to get good samples. Otherwise, uh, the results are not going to be uh, very useful. Now, back to your question, you know, NRCS does have a, this uh, phosphorus assessment tool. It covers almost all the aspects Caleb mentioned there. So, if you go to county extension office want to, or conservation district office, you want to get to the rating of the risk, how much phosphorus they apply, they may ask you a few additional questions, like what's the slope, uh, what the depth of the soil this field has, and what there are some other questions need to be answered in addition to the soil test level, okay? So this one actually, you will calculate the risk level and then spits out what amount of phosphate need to be applied. So from our soil test, you get the agronomic rate. From this assessment tool, you get the amount allowed by Oklahoma law. So what is the right time? what well, depends on what system you have. For root crops, the rule of thumb is, uh, you know, apply uh, as close as the crop needs. 
if you have pasture, you also need to consider the different species there. Like if you have warm season, a cool season system, and try to match their growth patterns. Like uh, for fescue, probably late uh, fall, late spring would be a good time to supply some nutrients. For summer, warm season, mira grass, uh, probably early summer is a good time. So if you have both grass in the same system, you don't want to apply too much. Otherwise you chook up this uh, Bermuda grass. So basically the time is also important. And the other significance of time is that sometime of the year we get more rainfall. So we get a more runoff and we try to avoid that to minimize the phosphorus get lost. Right place, well, definitely we don't want to apply to the area most uh, subject to phosphorus or nutrient loss, like uh, big slopes, shallow soils, and the fields with very high phosphorus already. Uh, if you apply to those fields with low phosphorus, you not only get the nitrogen benefits, you also get the phosphate benefits as well. And the buffer strip, I think is uh, very, effective in removing particulates and the soluble nutrients. I think NRCS recommends 30 feet wide. Why? Well, there are some research showing 30 feet is very effectively removing most of uh, soluble and total phosphorus. Even 15 feet wide, it removed a lot. But you increase the width of the buffer strip removes more, but you take more land out of the production, that's not a, a very ideal. I think a 30 is a pretty good number, I guess. Okay, even 15 feet wide will do a very good job. Okay. So I think that's all I like to uh, just uh, follow uh, Caleb's presentation to make some points. Uh, as far as how I understood, basically the nutrient management is very important in terms of crop production and uh, environmental quality. And uh, the 590 considers both nitrogen and the phosphorus when they determine the amount of uh, fertilizer or manure uh, should be applied. Basically, uh, to maximize the efficiency of the nutrients, they need to develop a nutrient management plan, follow the right source, right rate, right uh, uh, time and the place for our rules, okay? So I think we should have some time to address some questions if you guys have any. I did so much work on Bermuda. Is there a difference in varieties on the phosphor level that plants are moving, or is it just a blanket? You know, is Tipton the same thing as the old common? Well, the, the question is uh, is there a difference uh, of phosphorus among different Bermuda grasses? Um, that's a good question. As a matter of fact, I have not studied the different species of uh, different varieties of Bermuda grass, but I did try with different grass. I found crabgrass removes more phosphorus than Bermuda grass or uh, orchard grasses. But I'm sure there's some difference among different uh, varieties of Bermuda grass. I think I saw Dr. Alex uh, Rattelli came in, I think he has variety trials on Bermuda grass. We can determine the phosphorus in the future. But, you know, a lot of, uh, that gives a lot of bad publicity about how much feed the golf course is are actually, you know, do more runoff than what Ag does. Somebody else is in that room too. So. You make good point. You know, the lawn is the largest crop in the United States. Um, 
and uh, we get a yeah. uh, soil test from homeowners. That was going to the yeah. average phosphorus yeah. is 220. The farmer's field is 45 or 50. Mm -hmm. so the difference here? Yeah, I, mean, I think in the 90s, when they started to establish the rules your, for poultry farmers, yeah, yeah, somebody yeah, got a sample in front of the state capital in Oklahoma yeah. City. I think uh, the picture was not yeah, very pretty. It's like in the 300 the level of phosphorus. Yeah. So basically, yeah. they're saying, you know, you're putting your backyard and now you're regulating us. So yes, uh, I do a lot of uh, teaching for mass gardeners. That's my main focus oh, okay. is to let them know there's a potential uh, problem with uh, the way they have been fertilized. The fertilizer industry also got the message like Scots, they don't put any phosphorus in most of their fertilizers. But 10 years ago, you could not buy any long fertilizer with lot of phosphorus, but today you can get it like 31, 0, 4, et cetera. So yeah, they are pay attention to that too. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, thank you everybody. Um, we've got one more speaker in this session, then we'll take a break, we have plenty of time. Uh, Dr. Ippolito, uh, Jim Ippolito, okay. Uh, he came all the way from Colorado State, so right now it's not easy to get folks to travel in. So uh, visit with him, you know, show him your appreciation, but brought him in because of the work he's done. He's a soil health and environmental science specialist at Colorado State, uh, but he has nutrient management, does a lot of that work, and I've heard tell from other people that he does some really great work at Wheaton, so that's why I brought Jim in, and I appreciate him traveling down to Stillwater. So with that. All right. Well, you make me sound really good, Brian, thanks. Good morning. Yeah, that's the enthusiasm I like to hear. I, you're, you're, you're prepping me for teaching in the spring of 2022, so thank you. Um, <laughs> That's usually the response I get from my students, to be honest with you, so I, I get it. First of all, I really appreciate the invitation to come and speak to all of you this morning, and I appreciate all of you being here. Um, this is quite a crowd. I'm really impressed. Um, I also want to say that I, if I knew it was going to be a phosphorus show, phosphorus is my first love in soil chemistry and, and soil fertility, and so if... You know, what you heard this morning actually resonates within the state of Colorado, your, your neighbor. And so the, the um, practices that you're following here in the state of Oklahoma are almost identical to what we practice in Colorado. The, the results that I've seen this morning from Caleb and, and Halen are almost identical to what we see in Colorado as well, to be honest with you. But I'm not here to talk to you about phosphorus. I'm here to talk to you about micronutrients in wheat and the importance of those nutrients. And specifically, I'm gonna focus on iron and zinc, okay? Even though it's not in the title. And so the focus is really on the central high Great Plains and roughly where I circled on this map here, the wheat belt, which you know, touches <clears throat> the western half of Oklahoma. And, and really the specifics of this talk focus on those, arids, or those areas in the wheat belt that are semi-arid to arid. So soils that are alkaline pH and the effects that we see due to micronutrients and wheat growth, specifically winter wheat. So you've probably all heard this, you know that there's 17 essential nutrients or maybe you've learned that there was less or more when you were in school. And we're gonna focus on micronutrients and micronutrients are are needed in relatively small quantities, but you've probably learned that if they're lacking, you still have issues with deficiency symptoms and crop growth or lack thereof. And when we talk about micronutrients, you'll see on the, on the far right-hand column, this gives you the average parts per million of those micronutrients that are present in plants. And if we focus specifically on iron and zinc, and you'll see why I'm focusing on iron and zinc here in a few minutes. But if you focus specifically on iron and zinc, the average concentrations in plants are 120 parts per million respectively. Now to put that into perspective, if you look in the top right-hand corner of this slide, the four big nutrients 
I call them big nutrients that are found in plants are carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. And we typically express those on a percentage basis. And why don't we express those on a parts per million basis? And the reason why we don't do this is because it's probably easier for most, if not all of us to wrap our heads around those numbers in the top right-hand corner. For example, nitrogen's needed, or it's on average, it's 2% by weight in a plant, right? That's an easy number to kind of wrap your head around, right? If you put that or express that on a parts per million basis, that would be 20,000 parts per million. That number just, you know, it doesn't seem to float really well. Carbon, 45% in, in most plants on average. That's 450,000 parts per million. Does that come off of your tongue easy? No, it doesn't, right? And so what this does, what I'm trying to do is set the framework for the importance of micronutrients. They're needed in really small quantities, 100 or 20 parts per million for iron and zinc versus carbon, which is needed at 450,000 parts per million, right? So that's the difference. Nonetheless, if we're lacking of any of these nutrients, the plant suffers. It's called the uh, Liebig's law of the minimum. Maybe you learned that a while back. And he actually touched on that actually in the first two talks this morning. So what I wanna do is I wanna get into some basics and then I'll show you some data at the end to really close the story of iron and zinc and dry land winter wheat in the, in the high grade plains. And so the background that I wanna to present to you and I've done this a number of times at, at conferences like this and and hopefully this goes over well, all right? But just to give you a refresher on how iron and zinc work in soils and in plants. So in soils, this is the iron and zinc cycle that you see in front of you. And it's relatively simplistic compared to say the phosphorus cycle or the nitrogen cycle where arrows go all over the place. The iron and zinc cycle in soils is relatively simple. And this is how this works. So. The, the center part of this picture is the plant available pool. This is the iron and zinc that's available in the soil solution. This is where your plants obtain iron and zinc from the plant available phase. Now you can see arrows going in basically four different directions. Iron and zinc can be immobilized in organic material, i.e. microorganisms, right? Like microorganisms are just like you and I we need, among other elements, iron and zinc to survive. Microorganisms need the same thing. They can immobilize iron and zinc and put it into their tissue. Eventually that degrades. They're, those organisms die. They're attacked by other microorganisms and iron and zinc are released or mineralized back to the soil solution where plants can obtain it. Iron and zinc, they're both positively charged ions. They can be sorbed they can go to the right and they can be sorbed onto cation exchange sites and they can be desorbed. And then the last point on this slide is the arrows going up and down at the very bottom. And iron and zinc in arid to semi-arid soils love forming, well, they love forming mineral phases in both arid and, and human environments. In arid environments, they form iron or zinc oxides or hydroxides and they precipitate out. And those minerals can actually dissolve and release iron and zinc back to the soil solution. And that process is based on a number of factors like the amount of moisture that's present, temperature, et cetera, okay? So if you look at this, this is, this is really simple. This is why I like talking about this because it's really simple to follow. So if you look at this picture, where, where are the loss pathways? When you look at this diagram, the major loss pathway by which we lose iron and zinc from soils is by plant uptake. There's no doubt about that. However, I didn't show you the other loss pathways. If you have soil loss, like we were talking about earlier with phosphorus, if you lose soil, if you lose sediment from a system, you're losing some micronutrients. It's minor, but you're still losing iron and zinc. And there's actually some downward transport of iron and zinc that you probably don't need to be highly concerned about but iron and zinc can be, be sorbed onto dissolved organic phases and those dissolved organic phases can move downward through your, your soil. And I can tell you for a fact that we've studied this for probably 30 years in Colorado and other, other people have studied this as well. And downward transport, it's present. It's, it, it likely will not affect groundwater quality, to be honest with you. The concentrations are uh, one to two orders of magnitude lower than what you would consider probably damaging to groundwater. Nonetheless, the major loss pathway in this system is crop uptake. And that's important for the wheat belt 
especially in areas where iron or especially zinc haven't been applied for decades. And we've mined essentially these elements out of the soil or the soil solution. So there's five factors that affect that diagram that I just showed you, right? So there's soil pH, touched on that a little bit. Organic matter content, we touched on that a little bit. Texture, we'll touch on that. Water content and something called redox potential, oxidation reduction or how wet, saturated or how dry, unsaturated the soil is. And then last, the interactions with other nutrients. And so what I wanna do is walk you through these five points and how iron and zinc are affected by each one of these factors, okay? So soil pH. And this is what we teach our students. You probably teach your students here at Oklahoma State University this, this figure as well. So pH affects iron and zinc availability in our soils. And so if you look at this graph on the x-axis, you have acidic conditions on the right and alkaline or basic conditions on the left. So the pH is increasing from right to left. And then you have availability of either iron or zinc on the y-axis. So you have low availability in the bottom left-hand corner and you have high availability in the upper right hand or upper left-hand corner. And the way we teach our students this, and you know, this is, this is really general, okay, and without getting into the specifics, but the slopes of the lines you'll notice are different. And those changes in the slopes of those lines are dependent on the charge of the ion, okay? So this is how this graph works. If you increase the pH of a soil, one pH unit, you get a decrease in, I'll pick on zinc first. You get a decrease in zinc availability on a log scale of 10 to the power of the charge of that ion. Okay, so 10 to the second. So if you increase the pH of a soil by one unit, zinc availability decreases 10 to the second or 100 fold. If you increase the pH of a soil by one pH unit, iron decreases by 10 to the third or 1000 fold. Okay, and that's expressed on those, the way the slopes look on this figure. And the exact opposite happens if you were to acidify a soil, okay? And this is really general, and I can tell you that sometimes this works and sometimes this doesn't, <laughs> all right? But this is the general rule of thumb in terms of availability of iron and zinc and pH. What about organic matter? We know organic matter contains iron and zinc and it contains other nutrients as well. You learned about phosphorus this morning, it contains nitrogen. It's an important source of micronutrients. There's, there's no doubt about that. Just like you and I, microorganisms, organic matter, organic materials contain iron and zinc among other elements. When they degrade, they release nutrients, including iron and zinc into the soil solution that can be taken up by crops. And you've already learned that this morning, and you already knew this, that organic materials are good sources of, they're good sources of phosphorus, they're good sources of nitrogen. Most people don't think about micronutrients, but I think about these all the time. And so they're good sources of micronutrients as well. So there's some, there's some important factors about adding organic materials to soils. And that factor is that sometimes when these organic materials break down, they form chelating agents, all right? And the chelate, I always forget if this is Greek or Latin, it probably doesn't matter but a chelate means claw-like or crab-like. And so you have these organic complexes that are created during the degradation of organic materials that can grab a hold of micronutrients and carry them from one point in the soil to another. And in fact, the way this works is, and this, this picture doesn't show you iron or zinc, it shows you copper. This was easy for me to find on the internet. So that's why I copied and pasted it here, okay? But this is how this works. You have a chelate that's a, an organic complex that has sort of a hole in it and it complexes copper, it grabs a hold of copper, and it carries, it, it carries copper from an area of high concentration in the soil, like the bulk soil, to an area of low concentration, such as near the root, where copper has already been taken up. And when it moves from an area of high concentration, captures the copper, or captures iron or zinc, it moves to a low area, it releases that iron or zinc, or in this case, copper, and then the plant can take it up. Right, so there's natural chelates, they're created naturally. There's man-made chelates that you probably know about. We'll talk about those in a few minutes. What about tech?
sort of a no-brainer. Uh, coarse textured soils typically have relatively low organic matter content. And we talked about organic matter already on the last slide and the importance of organic matter and micronutrients capacity, meaning that there's less sites for adsorption of iron and zinc. So they typically, in coarse textured soils, many of you probably know this, there's less cation exchange capacity, right? Cation exchange capacity typically is derived from two sources, from clays or the presence of organic matter. And coarse textured soils are low in bulk, typically. So there's less ability for the soil to buffer against a change in iron or zinc when you work in these systems. And the exact opposite can be said for heavier textured soils or clay textured soils. Clay textured soils have greater clay content, they have greater CC, and they typically have relatively greater organic matter content. Okay. So let me ask you this, and hopefully I'm not putting anybody on the spot with this question, but can you influence soil organic matter content by your management practice? Yes or no? Yeah, yeah, I see, good, good, okay, good. Bacon up and down, exactly. And this is some of the work that we've done, right? Scientists have done this for, for, for decades, looking at changes in management, what effects, among other soil organic matter, this for a fact, right? Reduce, I mentioned, it's easy to, to change organic matter content. So I'm glad you said yes. So I'm not gonna put you on the spot with this next one. I'm gonna put myself on the spot and I'll answer the question, can you change soil texture with management practice? And you should say, no, Jim, you cannot. And that's true for the most part, right? So soil texture is a combination of sand, silt and clay, right? We measured this in a lab and good luck changing that right, especially in the short term. Unless you wanna bring in sand, silt, or clay to modify a field, you're not going to do this. So the answer is no. The fourth factor that affects availability of iron and zinc is something called redox potential or water content. And this affects iron, but it does not affect zinc, all right? And you'll see why on this slide. So when we, when we look at iron in soils, iron is typically found in two different forms, in the plus three form or the plus two form. And the plus three form is under well-drained or sometimes we call it oxidized conditions. There's oxygen present in the soil. Iron two, on the other hand, is found in saturated or waterlogged conditions, right? And it transforms from iron three to iron two. The importance of this is the fact that iron three is relatively less available than iron two, right? It could be 10,000, it could be maybe even 100,000 times less available than iron two. Um, the interesting point about this is that plants can utilize both iron three and iron two, which is, looks great on paper, but if you're a plant growing in an arable soil, an agronomic soil, we don't raise our plants under waterlogged conditions, do we? Bummer for a plant. So we, we raise our crops in well aerated conditions and in arid to semi-arid environments where we have say pH values above 7.2, iron concentrations are relatively low in terms of availability to plants and plants can suffer whether you see it or you don't see it. And that's a little, that's a little foreshadowing for what to come, what's to come. On the other hand, zinc only has one oxidation state. It's always plus two, it's not affected by redox, and that's the only form that plants can take up. The last point that affects the availability of iron and zinc and other elements is interaction with other elements. And this is where it gets really fun. So the literature is telling us, not, we're not 100% sure but the current literature is telling us that copper, iron, manganese, and zinc all compete for uptake within the plant via one transporter or one transport mechanism. And that's highly important. So if, you're, if you have a system, say flooded, if you will, with copper, copper is likely gonna be taken up to a greater extent than the other elements. And you may see a deficiency in the other, other elements, but it's, it's a, it would be a copper induced, iron can, can um, tie up zinc and iron and cause a zinc or iron deficiency. 
So you can form zinc phosphates or iron phosphates and reduce zinc and iron availability to your crops. And actually the, the opposite can happen. And this will almost never occur in agroecosystems. But if you have excess iron or zinc in a soil, it can bind phosphorus and limit phosphorus uptake. Again, this likely will never happen in your systems. So I, I also play in uh, mineland reclamation and this happens often in mineland reclamation systems. Ah, and, and like, uh, I think about the tar, the tar Creek area and... Okay, so, okay, so you might, you might see this then if you're farming in those areas. Thanks. Fun. It, it makes being a soil scientist a lot of fun because you see something and you think you know the answer and then you really don't know, know the answer until you start digging. So I learned something that's great. So what I wanna do now is I wanna sort of switch gears and I wanna talk about specifically iron and then specifically zinc, just to maybe uh, refresh your memory on how these things work, how these elements work within plants. And so some functions in plants of iron, has everybody seen an iron deficiency? Yeah, either in class or well, you're seeing one right now. Maybe you've seen it in the field. Iron deficiency, you typically see this, it's intervenal chlorosis. That tells you something about what iron is doing or not doing when it's deficient. And it has a role with chlorophyll synthesis. And so under low iron availability, when the plant perceives a low iron soil, chlorophyll production is reduced. And you see this classic intervenal chlorosis. And I'll steal my thunder for the next slide, next couple slides, but it's intervenal chlorosis on young leaves, on newer leaves. And that tells you a story that iron within plants is not translocated. It's not readily translocated from older leaves to newer leaves. And that's highly important. If you're, if you're out walking a field and you see a deficiency, you should know where that deficiency is going to be observed to classify it, right, or characterize it. And I can tell you, we all know that, well, hopefully we all know this, but when you see a nitrogen deficiency, it's on older leaves. And that tells you that nitrogen is translocated within the plant from older to newer leaves. And nitrogen deficiencies are intervenal chlorosis as well, in general, right? So they look real, they, they don't really look similar to me, but they, they may look similar to you. And if you can diagnose where they're located on a plant, you're, you're winning half of the battle. So iron deficiencies are located on newer growth. Um, really, I love this point. I love teaching this. I love talking about this, that iron is a component of the enzyme nitrogenase. It has nothing to do with wheat, all right? But it's really fascinating. So nitrogenase enzyme is found in, among other places, within root nodules on legumes. And so you see that classic red or kind of pinkish color in nodules. Who raises legumes in here? Oh yeah, good. So many of you do. Have you cut open a nodule and looked at it? Yeah. You see that classic pink color? That pink color, the, the red in that color comes from iron. And the compound that's actually creating this color is called methemoglobin. It's hemoglobin. It's like what's flowing through, or it's our blood. All right. So when I talk about this in my class, I tell my students that I feel that humans are just giant walking blobs of microorganisms because we kind of are, right? We've morphed in from, we've morphed from that to what you see around the room. It's meth hemoglobin, it's really fascinating. So without iron, these microorganisms could not do their job. The forms that are taken up by plants are iron two and iron three. We already talked about this. Underwater block, iron two dominates. Under aerated conditions, iron three dominates. Iron two is probably 10,000 times more available than iron three. And this is why if you're gonna see an iron deficiency in arable soils, it's because iron availability is low. All right, I guess I already, I already answered that. So how do you identify? We talked about this, but let's, let's talk about it again. So I'm gonna show you some more pictures. This is corn, you've already seen this. It's typically found in newer leaves, right? This is an extreme picture in the bottom right-hand corner. When the plant is really suffering from an iron deficiency, you might see that deficiency across the entire plant itself. But if you look at that picture in the bottom right-hand corner, 
you'll note that the deficiency is more pronounced in the newer leaves. And that's either a telltale sign when you see a picture like this, or if you're walking the field, it's either iron, more often than not, it's iron, but it could be manganese. Manganese looks a lot like this. Here's a picture of some uh, grapes in Western Colorado. You see the iron deficiency, it's on newer leaves. It's classic iron deficiency. I see this on my street in Fort Collins. Somebody planted some silver maples on the street and um, boy, they hate living in calcareous soils. They, they suffer every year. They look, they look just like that last picture. Here's a, a young peach orchard on the Western slope of Colorado. It may be difficult for you to see the deficiency, but it's on newer growth. And if you were to look up close and personal at those leaves, the new leaves coming off of the stem that's growing are the ones that show the deficiency. So it's newer growth. So that the take home message is that iron deficiency expresses itself on newer growth or younger leaves. And it's intervenal chlorosis. That means yellowing in between the veins. The veins are the veins are green and the remainder of the leaf is yellow. If you look at this list, I won't go through this entire list. This talk is really supposed to be focused on wheat. And you can find these lists on Google. You can Google lists for sensitivity of different crops for different micronutrients. And here's a, a list for iron. And you'll, you'll note that wheat falls somewhere in the mild to low sensitivity range, which is good, all right? But we still, I can tell you, I, I'm gonna show you some data at the very end of this talk that tells us a good story about the fact that I think iron and zinc deficiencies in wheat are, are changing or have changed over time. Again, foreshadowing. So how do plants alter iron uptake from soils? You can have a plant, and many of you have probably seen this, where you don't see a deficiency, but the deficiency is prevalent or present and the plant can somehow either overcome it or try to overcome it. And plants are pretty dang smart. And so there's two strategies by which plants alter the soil to take up more nutrient, micronutrient. And there's, it's really creative. It's called strategy one or strategy two, really, really original. Strategy one is used by dicots and non-grass monocots, so not wheat. So strategy one is a means by which these types of plants can either pump free hydrogens or um, a reducing agent across the root membrane into the soil surrounding the root and alter that surrounding to increase iron availability. So if you can pump free hydrogens across the root membrane out into the soil, that lowers the pH and that increases iron availability. Or you can pump something, a substance, plants pump something called citrate across the root membrane to cause the environment around the root to become reduced, and that increases iron availability. And this happens in plants that are not wheat or, or monocots, small grains. So how, do, how does wheat do this? Wheat can actually do this, and they've created, wheat among other monocots, have created a strategy called uh, the creation of phy phytosiderophores, essentially chelating agents that they create within the root that get pumped across the root membrane and into the soil to capture iron. And so here's a picture of, I always forget where I pulled this picture from, but there's two varieties side by side and we'll make believe it's wheat. It looks like, it looks like there's some cheatgrass in this field, but there's two different varieties and one does a better job of creating phytosiderophores than the other. And so you don't see this iron deficiency in this plant on the, or the plants on the right versus the plants on the left. So this is how this works. Here's the cycle. So when a plant perceives a deficiency, it creates something called a phytosiderophore, which is essentially a chelate that gets pumped across the root membrane and moves out into the soil solution. It seeks out iron and it captures iron. And then it moves from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. There's a concentration gradient back to the root. And there's a concentration gradient on, for a reason because the root's already taken up iron around the root itself. So the phytosiderophore moves out, it finds iron say on exchange sites, it grabs a hold of it, it chelates it and it moves iron back to the root 
And this complex is actually moved or transported across the root into the root itself, and then it's released within the root. And it's actually a really interesting concept because it doesn't allow for iron to be dissociated from that complex outside of the root and maybe form an insoluble mineral phase. So this is, this is really useful in our, in our monocots. And so we, let me take a step back. So this work was published in 86, almost 40 years ago. <laughs> We've known this for probably 50 years, to be honest with you, because the work just doesn't happen instantaneously. You know, as scientists, this takes years to develop these kinds of concepts and understand them. So, oops, here we go. So here's some work that was published in 1990, so 30 years ago. Is that right? Yeah. I don't even know what day it is. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, this was published 30 years ago. And this, this work shows you the amount of phytosiderophores that were created by these five types of plants, including wheat, in the presence or absence of iron. And in the presence of iron, these plants, there's no need for the plant to expend energy to create this chelate. And so it doesn't. There's plenty of iron in the environment and the amount of phytosiderophore in that column on the, on the left is relatively low. Now, when you remove iron from the system, these plants respond and they respond really well to greater or lesser extents in terms of creating the phytosiderophore, the chelate. And you can see that in the far right-hand column. The concentrations of that phytosiderophore increase sometimes greater than an order of magnitude. And that helps these plants capture and bind and sequester and then take up iron. This is the mechanism by which wheat in the central high grade plains overcomes an iron deficiency. So how do we influence it? This is a no brainer, right? We add fertilizers. Um, this is where it gets really interesting because how many people, let me ask you this, how many people add iron fertilizers to dryland winter wheat? I, I bet you zero, right? I know nobody in Colorado that adds iron fertilizers to dry land winter wheat. Zinc, probably, but definitely not iron. Nope, okay. And why would you? You probably, and I'll ask you a question about this in a, in a few minutes. So you could though, and in some crops you would add ferrous sulfate. It's 19% iron by weight if you calculated the, the weight on a molecular weight basis. When you add it to arid, semi-arid soils, soils that are above pH 7.2, that iron hates to be as ferrous sulfate. In fact, that's a salt. And it dissociates instantaneously, almost instantaneously, depending on the water that's present. And it loves to form iron hydroxide. And it precipitates out, and it forms a mineral phase, and it's locked up, and it's not available to plants. What a bummer. So it's not good as an application to soils because of that reaction. If you banned it, that would inc increase effectiveness, but you're probably not gonna do that in winter wheat. You're just not gonna do it in winter wheat. If you wanted to overcome an iron deficiency, and this is what we teach our producers in the state of Colorado that have a perceived iron deficiency, typically in high value cash crops like gra uh, grapes, peaches, et cetera, foliar application. And you use ferrous sulfate, a one to 2% solution, and you apply 20 to 30 gallons per acre. And if you're organic, that can be certified organic because we can mine this and not alter it, just FYI. There's some chelates on the market that you can purchase. Probably know that, right? There's commercial chelates, they're expensive. They're used for high cash value crops. They're not gonna be used in dry land winter wheat. Price point's just too, it's, it's too great to overcome. You can apply it foliarly or on the soil. And the nice thing about these is they're liquid when you purchase, well, you can either purchase them dry or in liquid phase, but you can mix them with other fertilizers and use them as fertigation. And I think I'll, I'll skip this part, right? There's different chelates on, on the market and they have greater or lesser effectiveness for iron. And there's some other organic chelates. Let's skip all that. So this is where I, I like the state of Oklahoma's fertilizer recommendations. And I, Hey, Lynn or Brian, did you guys have any part in putting this list together on this HTTP website? No, no, okay. So I, I really like the fertilizer guidelines that you have in the state. And based on what I just heard, and I've, I've questioned this because when I go to this web page, I can't tell whether or not this is Melic 3 extractable iron or not, but I'm assuming it is because what I heard before, 
in the previous talk. It's use MELIC-3 in the state of Oklahoma. Okay, so this is MELIC-3 extractable iron. And if you went to the fertilizer recommendations for um, the soil test interpretation for iron, you would see this, this table. And it's actually really similar to Colorado. We, in Colorado, we say that if you're below five parts per million extractable iron, that you're probably deficient. And in Oklahoma, you use four and a half. And for dry land winter wheat, you probably use a value of two. And I think that's identical to Colorado, right? So if you're less than two, you're really deficient. And you either foliar or band apply iron. And you wouldn't do this in dry land winter wheat, would you? There's no way. And I keep saying that because I'm going in a direction that you'll see here in a few minutes, okay? So let's talk about zinc real quick. So plants only take up zinc as plus two. There's a lot of text here. I'm gonna to cut to the chase that zinc plays an important role in growth hormones within plants. That's really the take home message here, okay? So iron plays a role in chlorophyll synthesis and zinc among other things within the plant plays a role in hormone creation. And so when you have reduced zinc, you have reduced hormones present in the plant and you tend to see stunted plants, the internodes are shortened and the leaves are smaller than quote normal, right? Let me show you some pictures. So here's a picture of tomato on the left and corn on the right. And I, I love corn because corn's sort of the king. If you're gonna see a deficiency in any plant, it's gonna be corn. It's probably not gonna be dry land winter wheat. So it's hard for me to show you a deficiency of zinc and wheat because it's just really hard to find pictures of it. It's, it's actually hard to induce it. All right, so corn is the king. And this is classic, this is a classic image of zinc deficiency in corn on the right-hand side. You see that the inner nodes are shortened, at least they look shortened to me. And you'll see uh, this sort of muddled yellow or green splotch on newer leaves. You typically see intervenal chlorosis, but it looks unlike iron really, right? muddy green in the center of the leaf. Sometimes it's yellow. If it's really extreme, the leaf will turn white. So you see that sort of broad band of kind of yellow in the corn itself, in the, in the new growth. It's in new growth, by the way. That's classic zinc deficiency. Now in the tomato, that could be, that looks like zinc to me, but it could be, it, it could be, it could be molybdenum. Um, it looks mottled to me. And so if you're unsure of, of course, you always want to get a tissue test, but this is classic zinc, all right? Uh-oh, I lost control. There we go. Okay, thank you. So shortened inner nodes, smaller leaves, um, delayed fruit set, mouth, mouth set, fruit, et cetera. So tying back to the, the actions and interactions of other nutrients, here's an example. And I can't tell you if the people that performed this study meant to do this or not, but this is a phosphorus induced zinc deficiency, right? So somebody applied, in, somebody applied P205 at 80 pounds per acre. To me, that doesn't sound like, I mean, yeah, that sounds sort of normal. Um, Nonetheless, if you look at the plants, they're shortened, of course, they're stunted. If you were to look at the inner nodes, they would be shortened and there's intervenal chlorosis and probably some, you can't see it in this picture very well, but that muddled green or, or white splotch on the newer growth. So take home message in, this is in corn, but this is actually in all monocots. If you see a zinc deficiency, you typically are gonna see intervenal chlorosis you might see this kind of yellowish or white band in the newer growth. And in, in severe cases, the entire leaf is going to be, or the entire plant's gonna be, it's gonna suffer. And so here's a comparison. Iron deficiencies on the bottom center and zinc deficiencies in the top two pictures. They, they don't look anything alike, do they? Uh, they? They look totally different. When you see a zinc deficiency, one of the things that I'm, I've noticed over the years is that the, the veins themselves tend to be a little bit darker green than the veins when you see an iron deficiency. 
And if you see a zinc deficiency, you often see that muddled green or white splotch on the newer leaves as well. Then it's newer leaves, okay? And that means that zinc is not easily translocated within the plant. Here's another table of sensitivity of crops. And you'll notice that wheat falls sort of in the center. It's mildly sensitive. So how do, we, how do we as humans affect zinc availability? Again, fertilizers, right? So we can use manures or other organic amendments. It tends to have quite a bit of zinc present in it. We can use zinc sulfate. The interesting point about using zinc fertilizers or micronutrients, or zinc, zinc specifically, is that it tends to have more residual value in the soil than iron fertilizer meaning that iron loves to form associations and precipitate out as mineral phases more so than zinc. So zinc tends to, I'll say, stick around in the soil solution to a greater extent than iron. And you probably can get maybe two to four years out of a, a, a zinc micronutrient fertilizer if you apply it to the soil. And that's, that's a real bonus for what I'm gonna share with you on the next few slides. You can buy zinc chelates, and, okay, I already mentioned this, that the application to soils is generally more effective with zinc than it is with iron. It just tends to last longer because it doesn't form as quick of an association with oxides and hydroxides and mineral, precipitate out as mineral phases in the soil as iron does. Here's your recommendations for Oklahoma. In Colorado, we're really, we're pretty similar. Your high end, if you're above two part per million, milk, that's milk three extractable zinc here in Oklahoma, you're adequate. In Colorado, we use a different test, but we, on the high end, it's, it's we're 1.5 parts per million. On your low end, if you needed uh, zinc for dryland winter wheat, you're below 0.3 parts per million. In Colorado, we're below 0.5. So we're really similar. And in fact, if you look across the US as a whole, we're all relatively similar, to be honest with you. And it doesn't matter on the extractant that you use. You use Melic 3 here in, Col in uh, Oklahoma. Your, oh, your DTPA. Are you DTPA for iron and zinc? Okay, that's good to know. That's what we use in Colorado. We use DTPA. Thanks. I, I can't find that information on the fact sheet. It's, it's buried somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. If you need some help, let me know. <laughs> so you use DTPA. So it's a chelate. Hmm, interesting. We'll talk about that in a second. So when you, when you test here in... Now this is gonna ruin my slides there because I took a guess, but when, here in Oklahoma, you use DTPA for micronutrients. Now that I know that, that's good. So most iron and zinc in the soil are found either bound to organics, organic phases, or they're mineral phases. And a little bit is on the exchange sites, all right? And so knowing what you know now from this talk over the last, I don't know, 30 minutes, that you know that wheat, uses a phytosiderophore or basically a chelate to go out into the soil to find, among other elements, iron, and it also does it for zinc, all right? And so we use a chelate as a test or a proxy for iron and zinc availability. We use, D you use DTPA in Colorado, we use DTPA. All right, so that, that's basically what's shown here on this, on this figure or this table, or this page. So. All right, so I'm gonna, you can scrap this image here or scrap this slide here, but you can look at the image, all right? So um, you don't use Melic 3, I took a guess, and you use DTPA. And DTPA is a chelate, it's, it's a big long mouthful, diethylene triamine pentacetic acid, right? It's a chelate. It's used when you add it to the soil solution in the soil testing lab, it goes out into the soil while you mix the solution with your soil and it moves out, it finds zinc or iron or manganese or copper and it chelates and it captures that, that element and keeps it or holds it in the solution. And then you filter, like you see in the bottom picture here, you filter the solution, you filter the chelate with the iron and zinc attached to it. And then we analyze that solution for iron and zinc. You do that here, Halen does that here at the soil testing lab at Oklahoma State University. So lastly, why, why am I telling you all this? And I have a short slide set for, for some data that I wanna share with you because it's a big deal. 
And it's a big deal in the central high Great Plains where we grow dry land winter wheat. I already asked you this before, but has anyone in this room ever seen an iron or zinc deficiency in wheat? No hands, I was expecting that. We in Colorado have never, as far as I know, seen an iron or zinc deficiency in dry land winter wheat. And in fact, our fertilizer recommendation guidelines at the very bottom of our wheat fertilizer recommendation guidelines say that there has never been a perceived iron or zinc deficiency in dry land winter wheat. And I think that's not correct, right? I'm gonna put my neck out here. I'm gonna tell you why. So here's a field in Eastern Colorado that I've worked on for 20 years. And where you see pale color, I can tell you that that's a, that's a nitrogen deficiency. We force that. You can't see an iron or zinc deficiency, but I think that there's an iron or zinc deficiency in this, in this product that we raise in the central high Great Plains. And in fact, when you get to this point and you're ready to harvest, there is no way you can tell that there's an iron or zinc deficiency. You can't tell there's a deficiency in general, right? But if you harvest and you take a look at the grain, this is where you can see the iron or zinc deficiency. And most often, what do you do with the grain? You bring it to a bin, right? And it's done. You're done with it, right? Oh, you probably, somebody measures protein content, right? They don't. Does anybody typically measure iron or zinc concentrations in wheat grain? No. Okay. So this is where, as a geeky scientist, I can tell you a really interesting story. It's something that's really compelling. And before I show you the next slide, I can tell you that globally, there's 3 billion people that suffer from micronutrient deficiencies, including iron and zinc. 3 billion. That's like a third of the, the global population, right? And there's areas in the world that rely heavily on one food crop as a staple, and that's wheat. I mean, this, these are areas that are third world countries that only persist or subsist on, on one or two staples, including wheat. And it's, it's rather scary to think about this. Maybe you don't think about this. I think about this all the time because I don't know where your wheat goes when you sell it. Where does it go? It probably goes to what, bread making here in the US, but sometimes it's shipped overseas and it might go to a place where they're suffering from a micronutrient deficiency like iron or zinc. And so here's a paper that came out six years ago where they used, um, they used two years of data from Nebraska. And then I think they combined a bunch of data over several years from Oklahoma. And this is where it gets really interesting that we've done such a great job in the US in terms of wheat breeding to improve our yields that we are diluting iron and zinc in the grain, right? And that's shown in these three figures. So in Nebraska in 2012 and 13, and you can see the on the x-axis is yield, on the y-axis is zinc concentration in the wheat grain. And I, I wasn't, I was living in I, uh, Idaho at the time. So I can't tell you if Nebraska was dry in 2012, but I'm gonna take a guess and say yes, because the the grain yields were lower in 2012 and 13. Actually, that was a drought year, right? Didn't we have a severe drought across the central US? And so the, you see the yields are lower and we have a concentration effect in 2012 in terms of zinc versus 2013. And in Oklahoma, that data is a combination, I believe, of a number of different years. You see the blue line? The blue line is telling you that as you increase yield, you decrease grain zinc concentration. And that gray line across the center is 25 parts per million. And this is a, a value that was set forth by Harvest, I, have to look, I always had to look down, Harvest Plus. It's a global, um, a global group that sets sort of target limits for, for biofortification of, among other things, iron and zinc in grain. And that limits 25, right? And so you can see that we're trending down or we're below that 25 part per million limit. Why is this important? I, I think about this, I tell my students this. When you go to the grocery store and you buy a, a box of cereal, you know, and it says biofortify with iron, hmm, it's biofortify with iron because the grain that they developed that cereal from was low in iron and they added iron back so you wouldn't suffer as a human. <laughs> we have that luxury in the, in the US. Other places globally don't have that luxury. So here's some data from some work that we're just finishing up in Colorado. And this is under review right now. 
And what we did was we looked across the northern to southern part of the eastern plains of Colorado, the high Great plains. We looked at 12 site years, so six locations over two years. And the top bar shows you iron in terms of the grain and the bottom or the top picture shows you iron concentrations in the grain, wheat grain. And the bottom picture shows you concentrations of zinc in the wheat grain on the y-axis versus yield. And there's a whole bunch of dots. What we did was we looked at the three top varieties that we raised in Eastern Colorado, Canvas, Langan, and Snowmass 2.0. And they all basically tell the same story. As you increase yield, you decrease concentration of iron and or zinc in the grain. And you can see that for grain zinc, the 25 parts per million, we don't even reach in Eastern Colorado. And I would assume in Western Oklahoma, you don't reach it as well. I'm just gonna take a wild guess, but you probably don't reach it. In terms of iron, we sort of touch the upper boundary for biofortification and wheat, but more often than not, for these three main varieties, we don't touch it. And so, you know, you, you asked a question about varieties in Bermuda grass. I can tell you that based on this data, there's no difference in varieties, really. They all basically tell the same story that they accumulate or don't accumulate iron and zinc to the same extent. And why is that? I learned this a few years ago and I should have known this probably for 30 years, but I just learned this a few years ago. So when you look at the grain kernel itself, where is iron and zinc located? It's located in the bran. And what do we do when we mill? We remove that bran, all right? So when we remove the bran, we're actually removing iron and zinc. That's where iron and zinc are found to the greatest extent in the bran. And if you increase yield, you increase the plumpness of that grain, the bran doesn't increase proportional to the endosperm or the germ of that grain, of that seed, right? It's just the outer coating. And that's where the micronutrients are found. So it's, it's actually a rather interesting story. And it's, to me, it's a little bit, uh, a little bit alarming. One step further, so what we did across these site years is we pulled soil samples from the top foot. That's what Colorado recommends, zero to one foot depth. And across these six locations over the two years, every single location was below what Colorado considers deficient, which is 0.5. If we were in Western Oklahoma, 0.3 is the, is the cutoff. And you can see if I drew a line at 0.3 parts per million DTP extractable uh, zinc, you would just be touching it, right? So it's, it's rather alarming. And so we have some work to do in Colorado in terms of micronutrient additions. Um, I can probably go on and on about this, I won't. And so what I wanna do is, Brian gave me the high sign, I have like four minutes left. I wanna thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? How many times have you gone out and the herbicide interaction where herbicide mimicked the deficiencies or the cause the problem or actually we actually had a, a nutrient deficiency that mimicked the herbicide? That's a great question. So the question was, have we gone out and looked at herbicide effects that mimic the micronutrient deficiency? And I can tell you that we've never done that. And that's a, that's a great question. I, I have no good response for you. Because you know, we've got some bleachers and corn products, so if we apply dye you're running out of too long, we get those white spots on the leaves. So more often than not, when you see, you're talking about damage from an over-application of herbicide. You know, when you see damage from over-application of herbicide, it, it affects almost the entire plant, doesn't it? Or at least the upper portions of the plant. So yeah, I guess it could be perceived as an iron or zinc deficiency. Um, possibly. Yeah, and, you know, and sometimes when you see effects of over application of herbicide or you just apply it at the wrong time, it's not over application, but it burns the leaf, it looks, it looks necrotic, right? So it looks unlike nutrient deficiencies completely. Same with, with pathogens, you know, like, like rust, they look completely different. Yeah, that's a great question, but I haven't studied it. I have, I have one, Jeff. So this is not wheat, but it's in, in the realm. So we're looking at IBC and soybeans as we're moving further in the, the north, northern panhandle. We have soybeans moving into more calcareous, high salt, high carbonate. 
the whole gamut. Can you briefly explain to me or help me understand why increased nitrate levels could increase IDC? We're, we're seeing it in Kansas and in Minnesota. So. All right, Re remind me what IDC man means. Uh, I, I always think indirect cost recovery. Chlorosis, so. Oh, iron deficiency chlorosis. So this is, this is really interesting. So in soybeans, soybeans use strategy one to overcome the iron. You know this already? I, I need to know more. Okay, so soybeans are their dicots and they use strategy one to potentially overcome an iron deficiency. And soybeans are really interesting. And I, I actually had some data and I pulled it because I wanted to focus on wheat, but soybeans, depending on the variety, can either pump more or less free hydrogens from inside the root to outside. And it's variety dependent. And so Marshner back in the mid eighties did some really great work on varieties in soybeans. And he showed using some fluorescent, fluorescent dyes that um, to greater or lesser extents, depending on the variety that you grow, they can pump more or less free hydrogens across the root membrane and acidify the rhizosphere, the soil surrounding the root. And that's highly important in calcareous soils, right? Because if you're a plant and you can't overcome that iron deficiency, then you're kind of hosed. And some of those varieties can, and some can't. And I, I can't tell you which do and which don't, but that's, if you're seeing an iron deficiency in soybean, then they can't. Any further questions? All right. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Uh, a few housekeeping before break. One, thank you for making the trip down here. That was great. There is a slide in there. That made a ton of sense if you think about our, our high plains and which is more sensitive to high pH or the, the iron chlorosis. The, the sorghum versus corn, while we say sorghum is much more sensitive to iron chlorosis, look at that uh, phyto, that, that one word. The production of that and that sorghum was a 0.5 while corn was a 2.5. So that capability of the plant to compensate for that. Uh, we'll, we'll go more, but. One thing you might be getting, and I didn't tell you as an audience, but I have requested that our speakers for this winter crop school hammer a little bit into the mechanisms. Instead of just telling you how to deal with stuff, we're wanting to take a step further in this crop school and talk about the mechanisms of what's happening. So as we go through these future talks, we're not just going to be about, okay, apply this, apply that, do this, do that. We're going to get into why are we doing, why are we telling you to do what we're telling you to do so that you have more of that mechanistic approach to, to management and understanding instead of just the push the easy button, that you're getting a little bit more in depth and understand the mechanisms behind what we're doing, which, which is why we have that. Uh, two announcements. If you're virtual, use your chat option. We have people checking the chat. And so if you're virtual, check the chat option. If you could delay, using the chat box until the speaker's about done, it's throwing up some errors here on site. So just use that chat box and two. Uh, announcement, I'll throw up some stuff. Uh, keep in, uh, this is an announcement for future meetings. The Red River Crop School will be January 19th through 20th in Jackson County. There's gonna be lots of CEUs and CCAs available, so keep track of that. We'll throw up some other things. We're going to take a 15 minute break, convene back here. We will start the speaker at 10.15, sharp. I'm keeping things on dot. Uh, if you uh, wander over there in the posters and see that, uh, they'd be thinking about, I am looking for about six judges for the posters, if not a couple more. Three o'clock, we're gonna have a full hour and it's only five per judge. That's my goal. Um, so like Dr. Arnall said, my name is Taylor Denman. Um, I am the new Carter County Ag Educator and also a multi-county forage specialist as well. Um, today, I'm gonna be talking to you a little bit about overseeding or some people call it interseeding, uh, different forages in some forage systems. This is gonna be kind of like a, just a general overview of, of some different options and things like that, okay?
So kind of starting out, uh, what is, what is the, the point of overseeding or also known as interseeding forages? Um, what, why would we want to spend the time and the money to do so in a, in a perennial forage system? So one reason why we would potentially want to interseed forages into a perennial system is to help extend the grazing system or the grazing season of our forages. So for example, if you have a Bermuda grass pasture, that's going to be your warm season perennial forage system. And then if you interseed some cool season annuals, you can get more days on that particular pasture that you are able to graze. The more days that you're able to graze, theoretically, the less days that you're going to have to feed hay. Hay is very expensive, so if we could try to decrease the amount of hay that we feed, we could potentially save some money. Um, another reason why we could interseed some forages is that we improve the quality of the forages that are available at that particular time. In general, these cool season annual forages that you can interseed into Bermuda grass are going to be very high quality forages. And so, you know, in the fall and in the springtime, when nutrient demands are high, you definitely have the ability to graze those forages that are high quality. Um, one other potential, and I'm not 100% sure if this has been done a whole lot in the state of Oklahoma, but it has been done a little bit in the southeast, is using uh, clovers interseeded into tall fescue as a tool to try to mitigate, or well, not mitigate, but to technically dilute the effects of a toxic tall fescue stand. Again, this is something that I'm not 100% sure if it's been done a whole lot in Oklahoma, but it has been done in other places. Okay, so starting out talking a little bit more about extending that grazing season and um, the potential of that with interseeded forages. Uh, so if we take a look here, this green part of our uh, chart here is going to be the general, uh, the general yield of a Bermuda grass stand. So you can see here, you know, May, June, you're getting you know, pretty significant amount of yield of that Bermuda grass. Uh, it's going to slope a little bit in the middle of summer and then pick a little bit back up. But in general, you know, the summertime is going to be, spring and summertime is where we're going to get a lot of that Bermuda grass forage. So if we interseed these cool season annual forages, like annual ryegrass, for example, we'll get a little bit of forage in the fall, and then we'll get some additional forage in the springtime as well before that Bermuda grass starts to green up. You see this a lot with cereal grains as well. So you can get, depending on, um, rainfall and planting date and all that kind of stuff. You can get some of this forage in the fall and then again some additional forage in the springtime. Again to extend those number of days that you're able to actually graze your forages and reduce the number of days getting hay. Same thing with clovers as well um, and there's also some some other alternative type forages like brassicas and things like that can, that can also help um, extend that grazing season. One thing that can be a little bit tricky with interseeding, uh, for example, cool season annual forages in, for example, a Bermuda grass pasture is that sometimes for like annual ryegrass, for example, it produces quite a bit of forage in that late springtime. And so if you have a perennial Bermuda grass pasture, you have to be careful to make sure that you either, number one, try to suppress that annual ryegrass to make sure that your Bermuda, grant, Bermuda grass stand um, to make sure that it's able to thrive and, and do pretty good in the summertime. Or you could sacrifice a little bit of your Bermuda grass stand and let that annual ryegrass play out. So as long as you try to manage those different transition periods, you should be doing pretty good. Another thing about inter interceding clovers is you do have the potential for nitrogen fixation as well. And also clovers are... Uh, pretty high in quality, high in crude protein. So again, you're increasing the quality of that forage. Um, also, grazing, like I said, it is going to be quite a bit cheaper um, to do so rather than spending more money on hay. So the most profitable forage-based livestock system is um, they require very little stored forage, okay? And what they say is that generally, if you graze your forages, it is one third the cost of feeding and producing hay. Um, one quote that I always find kind of 
kind of it really hits the nail on the head is that the most effective forage harvester has four legs. So as long as we utilize those cattle to, the, to harvest the forage that we're growing, rather than using all of our equipment, all of our fuel and things like that, we can save some money. So talking a little bit about the quality differences, like I mentioned, a lot of times, especially these cool season annual forages, they're gonna be a little bit higher in quality. So if you look here on this graph, you can see these cool season annual grasses and these cool season legumes, they tend to be a little bit more in that higher production, higher quality than for example, your, your tropical perennial grasses like Bermuda grass. This is again, just to reiterate the, the differences in forage quality. Um, so you can see here, you have your cool season annual grasses. You got pretty good crude protein. Total digestibility is uh, also as good. And you're getting pretty decent uh, tonnage per acre on these forages, oh. as long as you manage it and fertilize it and get enough rainfall, okay? And again, uh, if you, if you yeah, use clovers yeah. to intercede, again, you're bumping up that crude protein for that particular okay. time of year. I'm watching, a, I'm, I'm attending a crop school. And like I mentioned, uh, for the toxic tall fescue, uh, again, this is something that I've seen in the Southeast, I'm not 100% sure as much about, the, about in, in Oklahoma. But the theory behind this is that if you were to uh, intercede some clovers into, for example, a toxic tall fescue stand, it's not necessarily diluting the, the, the alkaloids in the tall fescue, but it is allowing those animals to eat some of the clover and some of the tall fescue, therefore diluting the amount that they actually consume. So this is not necessarily an extension of the grazing season, um, but again, it's more of like a dilution effect. And white clover and red clover are typically the most common that you would see in, in, in this particular situation. So while, um, while interseeding forages seems all well and good, you know, you can extend that grazing season, you have to feed less hay, you get good quality forage, there are definitely some considerations to think about, especially in, in Oklahoma. One of the considerations is that it can be a little bit risky because rainfall is imperative, okay? Sometimes the weather gets a little crazy in Oklahoma and we don't know if it's gonna rain or not, or the weatherman says it's gonna rain and then it doesn't for three weeks, right? So um, rainfall is definitely imperative. And um, like I said earlier, you have to be careful to make sure that you either suppress the cool season annual or make sure it plays out so it does not decrease the productivity of that perennial stand. Your perennial forages are gonna be a little bit better of an insurance policy, especially in times of drought and things like that. So you definitely wanna make sure that you take care of that perennial stand. Um, one reason that it, it's um, that you have to be careful with this, the productivity of your perennial forages, and that's one reason that it's not necessarily beneficial to use in native grasses. I know there's quite a few native pastures here in Oklahoma, but um, typically those native pastures are going to have some native cool season and warm season forages. So if you introduce and intercede some annual cool season forages, for example, you're definitely probably going to shift that balance um, away from those native forages and potentially make those less productive in the future. Uh, another important thing is that establishment is critical. You have to make sure that these annual seeds get good seed soil contact and that you plant at the proper time of year to make sure that they, um, they can grow optimally. So as I said, that rainfall is very critical when it comes to interseeding, especially cool season annual forages. So if we take a look at the cumulative rainfall in the different parts of the state of Oklahoma, if you look here, so east central Oklahoma is this blue cumulative rainfall line here, okay? And then if you look here in the western part of Oklahoma, your cumulative rainfall line is this brownish, orangish color here. So definitely in Eastern Oklahoma, as we all probably know, they're getting a little bit more rainfall than Western Oklahoma, right? 
So these interceding of cool season forages is going to be definitely a little bit better adapted to eastern Oklahoma, where you have that increased chance of rainfall to get a good stand, okay? And like I said, establishment is also very critical as far as getting a good stand in these cool season forages and getting your money's worth, okay? So um, when it comes to establishing, there's a couple things you need to think about. The first thing is gonna be suppress those competing plants. So for example, if you have a Bermuda grass pasture, you need to make sure that the Bermuda grass isn't growing green and lush as fast as it can when you're trying to plant a tiny little seed in there for it to try to grow and try to outcompete that Bermuda grass. Uh, you wanna make sure that you place the seed at an appropriate depth. Typically, generally speaking, smaller seeds are gonna be planted at shallower depth than the larger seeds. Clovers are very, very tiny seed. You're gonna to wanna to plant them um, very shallow compared to like a wheat seed or something like that, which can afford to be planted a little bit deeper. Uh, you wanna, like I said, you wanna make sure to provide good seed soil contact as well, just so that the, when those seeds germ, they can get into the soil, get the nutrients they need to be able to grow. And then pray for rain and fertilize. <laughs> so, you know, rainfall can be a tricky thing around here. And so just hoping for rain and doing the best you can. Also, a couple other things to consider. You already done it. Is make sure that you are planting the appropriate variety for the environment that you're okay. in. Okay. Uh, for example, what are you oats doing? a little bit less winter hardy, so maybe not in far northern Oklahoma. Um, rye tends to be better on sandier soils. So if you have a little bit sandier location, you may want to consider rye instead of something like wheat or something like that. Uh, make sure that you are planting at the appropriate seeding rate. This is gonna depend on a couple different factors on what your seeding rate would be. Um, one of those factors would be if you plan on planting a forage mixture, say you wanna plant a clover and a cereal grain or something like that. Um, you, you would want to adjust your seeding rate according and then um, broadcasting versus using a no-till drill or something like that, uh, you would want to, to adjust your, your seating right a little bit. And make sure that you plant at the right time. Make sure it's not too hot or you're not waiting until too late in the season where it's cold and you don't get that full fall forage that you're, that you're looking for. Um, as far as an establishment timeline, I can't read that. Um, so six to 12 months prior to planting, you want to um, start controlling the weeds that are in your pasture and do a soil test. If you only take one thing away from this talk, please test your soils. <laughs> um, so Oklahoma State has a fact sheet online that you can look at that tells you, gives you an idea of how to properly sample your soils in your pastures. But in general, you wanna get the, uh, use a soil probe if you can. Um, top six inches of soil. And you wanna make sure to not sample near areas that you feed hay or don't sample near areas that, that they kind of congregate or anything like that. And then what you can do is you take these samples, you mix them up in a bucket and you send them off to your local county uh, ag, ag educator. And then they will send them off. I'm sure you all know this, but they will send them off and then um, they'll get the information back and then send you a soil recommendation or fertilizer recommendation. So approximately two to three months prior to planting is when you really wanna start thinking about the plant species and the variety um, that you're wanting to plant. So a couple of pitfalls to avoid um, when trying to select your variety and species and everything like that that you wanna plant um, is um, go with the forages that have been grown and have been known to be successful in your area. So like I said, if you have a sandier soil, maybe you wanna consider growing rye instead of some of the other ones. Um, make sure that your varieties and species are a little bit more winter hardy if you're up in the Northern part of Oklahoma and things like that. Um, also avoid these miracle forages and different promises. Marketing will get a lot of people and so you just got to make sure that what you're getting is, is, is there's been research and there's been data and everything like that, that, that can back the, the claims that they're making. 
Um, sometimes you'll see mixtures of, you know, 12, 14, 16 different, different forages all in one bag and that kind of thing. Um, and if you are leaning towards that, just make sure that you know what you're getting and make sure that there's been data to prove that it is, that it will produce a good stand for you. Also, cheap is not always the best. Sometimes the market seed is a lot cheaper. Sometimes that seed that's cheaper is gonna be old. Um, it's gonna have a low germ percent, things like that. So make sure that you know what you're getting and make sure that you're getting good seed because you only wanna have to plant it once. So approximately one to two weeks uh, prior to planting, you're going to want to graze your field. So for example, if you have Bermuda grass, you're gonna to wanna to graze it two to three inches of stubble height, um, start making sure you got the equipment you need, that kind of stuff. And then uh, think about suppressing your stand, your existing perennial stand, whether that's just simply grazing or using some sort of chemical to, to suppress that stand. So here's one example of an option to suppress Bermuda grass sod. It is uh, Paraquat and you can apply that to the Bermuda grass and it'll suppress that the sod. So then when you plant, the, the plants that you plant into the ground are gonna have a little bit better of a competitive advantage um, to get a little bit better of a head start because start, they're not competing with that Bermuda grass. Uh, glyphosate is also another option that you can use uh, to help try to suppress, for example, Bermuda grass sod. So then when you plant into it, um, it won't be competing. As far as when to plant, so if your established grass sod is tall fescue, uh, you would want to plant in you know, February, early March. Bermuda grass, late September, October timeframe. Uh, sometimes I, I would say probably mid-September, honestly. And then if you want to frost seed, February to early March is an option for that. So the day of planting, um, you just want to make sure that you're double checking that planting depth. Um, that's really critical, especially with these smaller seeds. If you bury them in the ground, they're not going to come up. They don't have the, the carbohydrate stores to be able to germ and make it all the way to the top of the soil before they can start photosynthesizing and things like that. So the seed depth is definitely a big, a big deal. This is also a time somewhere around in there is when you can apply any P and K that's needed as well. So as far as planting options go, um, you do have a couple different options. There's pros and cons to each, of course, um, but no-till seeding is one option, and that is where you're going to suppress the sod that you have, and you're going to plant directly into that thatch. Now, this is important because you got to make sure that you're cutting through that thatch so those seeds can get seed soil contact, okay? Because if they're just sitting on top, that's not going to do a whole lot of good. Um, this is a good way to help conserve soil moisture. So if you have that thatch on the ground, you've got the, the it's be able to hold in some of that soil moisture. Um, it's able to prevent erosion and things like that compared to if you're wanting to till it. Um, also, it saves you a little bit of money because you're not going out there and tilling it and that kind of stuff, right? It saves you fuel costs. Another option is broadcast seeding. And like I mentioned earlier, a lot of times if you're gonna use broadcast seeding versus a no-till drill, you do tend to wanna to use the little bit higher end of that seeding rate range just to make sure that you get a good stand. Um, so same sort of concept, you wanna take the material, you wanna remove it, have to two to three inch double height, suppress it chemically as well. And um, a couple things, when you go to broadcast seed, if you're doing a mixture, don't mix your clover seed with your ryegrass or cereal rye or something like that. So the seeds are very different in size. So when you put them all in the hopper, they're gonna kinda, this, the smaller seed's gonna fall to the bottom and the bigger seed's gonna be at the top. So in your pasture, you're gonna have one whole area of clover and then some, some wheat in, the, in a different area. So make sure that you don't mix seeds of different size and then also, if you're going to fertilize with nitrogen, make sure that you don't try and mix nitrogen with clover seed. 
because that could potentially cause problems with the inoculant that's on the clover seed. And I don't think I mentioned earlier, but inoculant on a clover seed is very important to get those seeds jump started for the nitrogen fixation. Uh, if you do plan to broadcast your seed, uh, you do have to have some sort of scratching of the ground or something to make sure that that seed gets that important seed soil contact. So you can, um, you can lightly disc it and things like that. And I've also seen people do it where they broadcast it and then they put their cows out there. And so the hoof traffic of those cows is actually helping get the seed to the soil and get that seed soil contact. Uh, frost seeding is another option. And that is when you take the seed and you broadcast it out into the ground. Um, and you allow the freezing and thawing effect to, to get that seed worked into to where it can get that seed soil contact, okay? Uh, red and white clover are the typical clovers that you will see um, in frost seeding. And this can be typically done in like February or March timeframe in Oklahoma. As far as seeding rates go, again, this can be dependent a lot on a lot of different things. Uh, the number of forages that you have in a particular forage mixture, or um, if you're gonna no-till drill versus broadcast, that kind of thing. But these are just the general seeding rates that you'll see. Uh, also, like I said, the larger seed is probably gonna have a higher seeding rate than these smaller uh, clover seeds. And like I said, rule of thumb, uh, what you can do if you have a, a, a mixture of different forages is that you just divide that seeding rate by the number of forages in that mixture, and that'll give you a better estimation of the seeding rate. Here's some seeding rates of some legumes into grasses as well. Um, yeah, so here's the annual legumes here. Like I said, you can see that smaller seeding rate just because that seed's a whole lot smaller. Um, and like I said, if that's in a forage mixture, make sure that you divide that by the number of forages that you have in the mixture. So then after planting, um, you wanna make sure that you fertilize with nitrogen. Um, if you want fall and spring, if you wanna try to focus on having fall and spring forage production, uh, you can split your nitrogen application uh, between the two, and then you can begin grazing. For wheat in particular, the rule of thumb is about eight inches of wheat growth, or better yet, if you go out there and you look at the root growth. So the root growth, if it's a well-established wheat plant and you've got, it's, got a, it's got a good root, root basis there, then um, you should be able to, to graze it fairly easily. The shallower the root, the harder it's gonna have to come back once it's grazed. As far as fertilization goes, um, properly fertilized sod seeded grain crops, or well, forage and grain crops can produce about one ton per acre of fall forage and a total of about two to three tons per acre of full season forage, so in the fall and in the spring. But that is gonna be highly dependent on the species. Annual ryegrass is gonna typically produce a lot more forage material than something like cereal rye. It is recommended to put about 60 to 150 pounds per acre of nitrogen, depending on your yield goal. And for, uh, if you wanna use this forage, if you wanna use it as a dual purpose, so you have the foraging and then you also have the, the grain crop as well, uh, you can expect about 15 to 20 bushels per acre of grain yield. Um, however, the grazing must be terminated at the first hollow stem stage. Otherwise, you're going to have problems with the grain yield later on. Um, also, proper weed management and fertilization is also imperative to, to get a good forage yield and then also a good grain yield. So an example of fertilization, if you want a dual purpose crop, if you expect one ton per acre of forage yield, 20 bushels per acre of grain yield, um, that's gonna require approximately 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So in summary, 
Uh, interceding forage systems are, can be beneficial. It can be beneficial in extending that grazing season, um, introducing some really high quality forages into your pasture. It's making good use of that pasture for a longer period of time. So less of that pasture is sitting dormant for longer. And also the potential for uh, kind of diluting the, the effects of tall fescue in a tall fescue pasture. Uh, your options for planting are going to be no-till drill, uh, you can broadcast, or frost seeding is also an option. Uh, it is important to make sure that you're fertilizing these forages, uh, just to make sure that you're getting the best bang for your buck, you're getting the, the high yields that you're expecting. And it's also important to fertilize if you're using it for a dual purpose crop. But like I said, it can definitely be a little bit risky. Like I said, it's probably a little bit better adapted for more of Eastern Oklahoma where they get a little bit more rainfall. Um, but, and also proper establishment is also imperative to make sure that you get the stand that you need. So you need rain and a good stand for establishment. So all in all, um, while grazing forages is a cheaper option, if you can extend that grazing season, decrease the number of days that you're feeding hay, um, that's all well and good, but you have to decide if it's worth the potential of lack of rain in the fall when you're planting, okay? So is it worth that risk, the potential risk of stand failure um, due to, to weather conditions? Unless you have irrigation, of course, then all is well. And with that, I'll take any questions. Any questions for Taylor? No questions. All right, the, the next transition fits quite well as we're going to talk about some recent research that we've done at Oklahoma State. Next presenter is uh, the first time he's been introduced this way, Dr. Bronk Finch, recent graduate student, grad. And, and now postdoc in my program, but he's going to give a discussion about some of his dissertation work that looked at uh, intensifying the wheat forage system. So with that, Ron. All right, thank you, Dr. Arnell. Uh, as he mentioned, I'm a recent graduate here at Oklahoma State, uh, PhD under Dr. Arnell in nutrient management. And my dissertation focused on winter wheat forage management strategies for intensification of winter wheat forage production systems. So today I just wanted to talk to you about a section of my dissertation work and give you a little bit of background as to why we focused on this research. So roughly 1 million acres here in the state of Oklahoma is utilized for graze out purposes as far as wheat goes. And for those of you that may not be familiar with it, graze out is termed when wheat is gr grown specifically for the purpose of grazing cattle or grazing livestock, rather than a dual purpose scenario such as Taylor mentioned, where cattle are removed around the feek six or hollow stem stage of wheat. Recent research in the past couple of years has noted that split applications of nitrogen improves the biomass production of winter wheat forage systems such as something like a 50% application at pre-plant and then a 50% top dress application, it resulting in the greatest increase in biomass production. While it is known that winter wheat biomass increases linearly with increased nitrogen rate, such as, result, such as having about a half ton yield increase with every 30 pound incremental increase in nitrogen applied to wheat for the purpose of graze out or forage production. Uh, there we go. So this data set I'm gonna to talk to you about is from a larger study in my dissertation that spanned three years and five cropping seasons. Those are three winter wheat seasons and two summer seasons. It was established at two locations across central Oklahoma at the Lake Carl Blackwell site, here just outside of Stillwater and the South Central Research Station at Chickasha, Oklahoma. A three by four by two randomized complete block design was used with three factors of winter nitrogen, summer management, and summer nitrogen. But for this data set, I just wanna focus on the winter nitrogen aspect where we had three levels of treatment, 
with two pre-plant rates, a 60 pounds of nitrogen applied at pre-plant, 120 pounds applied of nitrogen applied at pre-plant. And then we had a split application of that 50-50 where 60 pounds were applied at pre-plant and then 60 pounds were applied again at top dress following the, the uh, spring green up or first harvest, depending on which came later. So the objective of this data set is to evaluate the nitrogen management strategies for winter wheat forage production. And to do so, we looked at three variables. The first one is dry matter biomass accumulation, which will be reported in tons per acre, crude protein production, which will re be reported in percentage, and then gain yield. And gain yield is a calculated parameter that we used that was calculated from taking the net energy for gain, which is the param a parameter given to you by the forage analysis that you can get from a lab such as Swaffle, Servitech, any of the forage analysis labs. And that tells you the amount of biomass, amount of that forage that will go towards the gain of livestock consuming that biomass. We took that percentage and multiplied it by the total biomass produced from these plots, which gives us a quantity in tons per acre of the amount of biomass that will go towards livestock gain. So we're gonna jump straight into the data and it, it might get a little confusing and I understand that, but for a little bit of housekeeping, all of the graphs following this one will look similar to this, where the on the uh, x-axis, you will have location and treatment with Chickasha always being on the right and Lake Carl Blackwell on the left. On the primary y-axis, you will have biomass accumulation in tons per acre. And then on the secondary y-axis, you will have crude protein in percentage when, when it is presented. So the first harvest at these two locations had different harvest timings. At the Lake Carl Blackwell location, we had a more ideal time of harvest of the simulated grazing study you, near the um, late fall, early winter, around the December, 1st of December, while at the Chickasha location, due to environmental conditions outside of uh, outside the control of the study, we had to actually delay that harvest up until, all the way up until the feek six or hollow stem stage of wheat, when cattle are typically pulled off for a dual purpose scenario. That accompanied with the fact that the Chickasha location had a higher residual soil nitrogen at trial establishment, and Lake Carl Blackwell was managed for more low residual nitrogen in the soil. That will attribute to the differences between locations and yields presented here. So to jump into it, we see the 120 pound pre-plant rate increases biomass production at the Lake Carl Blackwell location. Now this is the 120% or 120 pound rate compared to a 60 pound pre-plant rate as at this point, the point of harvest, the split application had not received its additional top dress nitrogen. We saw a three tenths of a ton or roughly 600 pound increase in total biomass production. While at, at both locations, crude protein was impacted regardless of the high residual nitrogen at the Chickasha location with a 2% increase in crude protein due to that increased pre-plant rate and a 3% increase in crude protein at the Lake Carl Blackwell, the more responsive site. When we move on to the second harvest, this is where the graphs might get a little confusing. So I wanna preface this with, we're going to be focusing on these stacked graphs, on the orange bars and the black triangles. That will be the biomass accumulation and crude protein for the second harvest from here to follow. We see that split application at the at, at both locations increased the biomass production of winter wheat in that second harvest. Where at the Chickasha location, it yields on average almost or, or a ton or more biomass accumulation greater than either of the pre-plant rates. While at the Lake Carl Blackwell location, we also saw an increase due to the increased pre-plant rate of roughly seven tenths of a ton, or I'm sorry, nine tenths of a ton rather, while the split application gave us an overall six ton yield in just in that second harvest, which is greater by 1.7 1, 1. than the same rate when applied at pre-plant. 
Moving on to crude protein, we see similar results where that split application yields the greatest crude protein levels. At the Chickasha location, we saw a almost a 1% increase with the increased rate and an additional 1% increase due to the split application of that high rate. Similarly, at the Lake Carl Blackwell location, we had an increase due to that split application of right around 1% increase in protein. However, those protein levels are lower at the Lake Carl Blackwell location due to a lower residual soil nitrogen than compared to Chickasha. At this location, the nitrogen that was available through fertilizer was utilized mostly for the biomass production in that second harvest. So in this graph, we look at the total production of that first year of this study. And we're just looking at the biomass production because crude protein calculations get a little confusing moving into total summing to harvests. So we noticed that at both locations, the split application increased biomass production greatest to 6.6 tons per acre. This is nine tenths of a ton, almost a full ton different than either of the pre-plant rates at the Chickasha location, and is three tenths of a ton greater than the same rate applied at pre-plant at the Lake Carl Blackwell location. Where at that location, we also saw the increased pre-plant rate did increase biomass production on that lower soil, residual soil nitrogen location. Now, this is where gain yield, the gain yield comes in and the gray bars are stacked on top of the total biomass production that are the orange bars. And that represents the amount of that biomass, the quantity of that biomass that will go towards the gain of the livestock consuming that biomass. And we see the results of gain yield to be similar to biomass production as it is a factor of biomass production where the split application still yields the greatest gain yield or the greatest amount of biomass going towards cattle gain with 2.6 tons at the Chickasha location and 2.3 tons at the Lake Carl Blackwell location. Moving into the second year, this year we had more ideal harvest timings for first and second harvest, with first harvest being right around the late fall, or, or, or I'm sorry, mid, late fall to middle winter, first of December timing, and the second harvest occurring right around the boot stage, as would be expected, or as would be ideal rather. Again, we see that in the first harvest, we have an increase at the Lake Carl Blackwell location due to the increased pre-plant rate with a half ton increase in total biomass production due to the increasing rate. While at the Chickasha location, we do see a non-statistic numerical increase in yields by increasing rate, as well as due to the split application with a much smaller, but still 10th of a ton increase, which we attribute to uh, residual soil from the previous split application, residual soil nitrogen from the previous split application. When we look at crude protein, both locations were increased with a 2% increase at the Chickasha location due to that higher pre-plant and a smaller 1% increase at the Lake Carl Blackwell location. Second harvest at this or at this in this year, rather, we see split applications increase both biomass and crude protein levels at the Lake Carl Blackwell location, with biomass levels being increased by six tenths of a ton or 1200 pounds compared to the same rate when applied all at pre-plant. This is a, a result of more nitrogen being available for biomass production from that additional, uh, that, that split application right around the time of that biomass production rather than being applied all up front. Crude protein levels result in a 1% increase when increase in pre-plant rate and an additional 1% increase when that high, high rate is split applied. For the second year totals, again, Lake Carl Blackwell was the only responsive site in the second year. And we see that the 120 pound per acre rate increased biomass to 3.6 tons 
regardless of timing, regardless of whether applied up front or split applied. This is a 1.1 ton increase over a low 60 pound rate. When we look at gain yield, we have a similar effect where gain yield was increased by that 120 pound rate, regardless of timing. Moving on to the third year, we had a single harvest due to early cool temperatures in the fall and um, later cool temperatures and even late freezes in the, the spring of 2021 that made it kind of hard for biomass production to occur in winter wheat. We see that the 120 pound rate increases biomass at both locations, while at the Chickasha location, when applied pre-plant, it yielded the greatest increase by four tenths of a ton or 800 pounds greater than the split application of the same rate. At the Lake Carl Blackwell location, the lower end site, we see that the, the higher rate, regardless of timing, yielded the greatest, yielded increase in biomass production. When we look at crude protein, we see those flip, where at the Chickasha location, the 120 pound rate, regardless of timing, yields 11% crude protein. And at the Lake Carl Blackwell location, we see a 2% increase in crude protein due to that split application. Again, just to recap the biomass production of this third year, as we move into gain yield, where we saw again, as in the previous years, gain yield is similar to biomass production as it is a factor of it. And the 120 pound rate at the Lake Carl Blackwell location yields three tenths of a ton increase regardless of timing, while at Chickasha, the 120 pound pre-plant rate increases biomass, but is only one tenth of a ton greater than the increase seen at, due to the split application. So I know I went through a lot of a uh, fair amount of data and some you know, slides, uh, graphs that might be a little confusing. We don't really know what it means when we think about the entire system. So we wanted to cover that with a three year total. We're gonna to talk about a three year total of biomass and gain yield only. When we look at biomass, we see the 120 pound rate increases biomass production as expected, where at the Chickasha location, it is regardless of pre-plant or split application, we see a uh, right around a one ton to to 1.7 ton increase in biomass production due to that increase in rate regardless of timing. At the Lake Carl Blackwell location, our lower end site, we see that increase due to pre-plant rates, due to the increase in pre-plant rate of almost three tons, while split applying that higher nitrogen rate, we see an additional increase of 1.2 tons of biomass, which, relates to greater gain yield uh, increases. At the Chickasha, the Chickasha location, we see similar to yield, 120 pounds regardless of timing. And Lake Carl Blackwell, we see split application increasing over the low rate, as well as the high pre-plant rate. But at the Chickasha location, we can see a one-tenth of a, one of a ton gain yield increase due to that split application of nitrogen. So what we found is that crude protein in the first harvest can be increased by the 120 pound pre-plant rate compared to either of the other you know, low rate or the split application. While in the second harvest, crude protein is increased by the split application. That tells us that we're gonna wanna see when we want to increase our crude protein. If, if crude protein is our target, we need to know if we are wanting to increase in the fall or more in the spring by using a, a pre-plant 120 pound rate or a split applied rate. Biomass increases are observed for both 120 pound and split applications, dependent upon the residual nitrogen as to when the split application becomes responsive. And gain yield, again, is similar to biomass as it is a factor of biomass production. Well, what is this all worth? That's a big question. We all wanna know what does this mean when we're putting money in and getting money back out. This 
chart here come actually is on the uh, OSU MPK blog. And this tells us the amount of money difference between the split application and the pre-plant application of that high rate. This is over, this is the amount over the three year total where at the Chickasha location, we had that one tenth of a ton difference in gain. And Lake Carl Blackwell, we had a two tenth of a ton difference in gain. When we have a value of gain set at a dollar and 12 cents, we have a total return due to that split application of $12,000 at the Chickasha, that high end Chickasha location and $10,000 at the Lake Carl Blackwell location. When we account for the fertilizer costs and the application cost due to the um, 120 pound pre-plant and the split application with that additional application cost with those set at $241 for the pre-plant and $264 for the split application, we see that we yield an increase in return of $313 at the high end, high residual end site, Chickasha, and $603 at the lower end site, Lake Carl Blackwell, just due to split applying at high nitrogen rate. So in conclusion, we saw increased, uh, increased in rates, increased biomass production, crude protein production, and gain yield of winter wheat biomass. While the split application, when it was responsive, paid off in biomass yield and cattle and, and, and gain yield, but when it was not responsive, it showed to be similar to or the same, the same as that high pre-plant rate. But when we look at it economically, that split application gives us a greater return by just delaying that additional 60 pounds of nitrogen till the spring green up compared to putting it all up front at pre-plant. So with that, I figure that probably went kind of quick. So uh, I'll open the floor to any questions and I'll be around today and tomorrow if there are any questions about this data or others. The, the summer treatments, okay, the question was, did the summer treatments that were applied, the, that being the summer management of the four summer crop treatments and the summer nitrogen applications, did that affect any of the results? And yes, they, they did affect the results um, looking at, at the overall system, the intensification of the system. But just for this data set, I just wanted to focus on just the winter wheat and how the winter wheat nitrogen applications uh, increased. Did it change the response of the winter wheat? No, it did not change the response. The, the summer treatments did not change the response of winter wheat to winter wheat nitrogen applications. Sorry if that was, that was more the direction of your question. Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Did that correlate into your TDN and RFD when you put or did you just? So we, we didn't have, so the question was, did, did any of this correlate towards uh, TDN or RFV? We did have some correlation to TDN. We didn't actually um, analyze the RFV. We only had the ADF and TDN and then the, the net energy values. And we did see on occasions, nitrogen applications did. I don't wanna quote me on this, but I wanna say, Oftentimes we had a decrease in TDN due to nitrogen applications, but it was it was very very depending on harvest and some of the other treatments as well. Thank you. Uh, the question was, what nitrogen source did I use? And I totally glazed over that whenever I uh, got to the methods. Uh, urea was applied. Dry uh, dry urea was. Uh, hand spread ac across all plots. Did you use a stabilizer product on it or just straight urea? No, sir. No, no st uh, stabilizer, just, just a straight urea was applied. Okay. 
The that that sounds that sounds right. I honestly so the question is what what cost of ton of fertilizer did we use? And I don't want to give a, say an exact number. It was going to be we want to say it was somewhere around fifty dollars fifty dollars a ton. 50 cents, 50, 50 cents a pound, sorry. Um, the, the price for, um, yeah, sorry, sorry, that was, that was way off there. The price for nitrogen come right around the 1st of September and the price for gain come from that, that cow-calf newsletter as that was the most recent value I could find. Yeah, I didn't have him update that fertilizer price. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that later. All right, with that, we're going to be fantastic. Dr. So it's kind of fun that uh, Dr. Jordan Bell is joining us, and I'm hoping her, her mic and everything works out well across. But a uh, little background. So I got Bronk from Dr. Bell's program. And so he came with a master's from her program. So she's, it's been fun, fun for her watching. But with that, we invited Dr. Bell, and she's you know, stuck at TAMU. Still water's better, but we understand. <laughs> uh, invited her to talk about some of her work in her forage sorghums and silage. So kind of keeping in that forage aspect. Uh, see if her... Uh, okay, can you hear me? Mic works and the speaker works inside. Can you hear me okay? She's talking. Can you turn up... Can everyone hear me? I'm assuming so. Hey, Brian, can y'all hear me? Should I start? Hello. Oh no. Well, I can hear you, Jordan. You can? Perfect. At least I can talk to you, right? Right. <laughs> I don't know what. Uh, I'm, I'm actually off site zooming in too, so I'm not, I'm not sure what the deal is. Yeah, I hear him in a distance. I hate to just start if they can't hear. Hold on, let me shoot Brian a check. Okay, thanks, Gary. Okay, for those online, actually, Brian did text me to give them a sec. So I think. Everyone online can hear me, but the group in the room cannot. Okay, so he has responded to the thing. Okay. Is that correct? Yes, he did. Yeah, he told me to give them just a second. Okay, good enough. Good to see you again. Yeah, thank, good to see you. Are y'all blowing away? We are. We are in high fire danger. We have a couple of national fires breaking up. Well, I'm hoping I don't have any power outages. I know there's power outages all across the panhandle today. And um, I, before I logged on or started my presentation, I just checked our weather station at Bushland. And we've had gusts up to 71, and it's a pretty steady 40 to 50 mile an hour. So the Texas panhandle might just wind up in Oklahoma today. I 
Okay. Well, hopefully y'all stay good. I'm going to, I'm on mute. So okay. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, Gary. Jordan, go ahead and try again. Okay, perfect. I can hear you now. Okay, so is that good? No, that's not it. Oh, no. We're trying. We, we're just getting it set up through the union system. Okay. Well, it is plugged in. Well, I mean, right. uh, you know, nice, maybe. Um, I guess we could take ours out and give it to yours if you're getting it. But we'd have to take my HP. Oh, I got you. Uh, well, I also have. Mm -hmm. uh, check Zoom. It showed in the bottom corner join audio. Yeah. You may have to go ahead. Join. join. Yeah. Oh, maybe we just have to. Jordan, try again. Okay. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Brian, for first for having me and especially allowing me to present by Zoom. I know the logistics of remote presentations are a great pain. So I really do appreciate it. And also, I definitely want to recognize Bronk. Um, it's exciting to follow him, especially since he was a student in our program at Bushland. And of course, so much of what he was involved with when he was at Bushland was our Ford Sorghum program. So he has a, a really strong history in this program, and it's exciting to follow him. So as I jump into this, I do want to point out that the bulk of our research is focused on silage production. Of course, our, that data can really transmit well to the board sorghums for hay production. I do have a little bit of hay data to share, but the bulk of it is focused on forward sorghums for silage. And of course, because of this is because we have a increasing uh, forward sorghum, oh gosh, now I'm having problems here. Okay, increasing demand for silage across the, the Southern Great Plains into the Oklahoma Panhandle and even other areas of Oklahoma because of the expanding dairy industry. And coupling that with droughts as well as declining groundwater, forage sorghums really have an opportunity to step in and secure some of the silage acres and silage needs that we have. And so the bulk of my presentation, as I mentioned, are going to focus on our research activities. However, I do want to point out that when we start talking about considerations for silage, it's important that we all consider how much water we have and what is the forecast. Over the last several years, I have increasingly worked with producers who have overplanted corn acres, first with the anticipation of grain, I mean of rain, but also um, on low uh, well capacities. And so it never fails that they wind up having lower yields and lower quality than they have anticipated. And even though our producers are generally paid by the time I'm increasingly working with producers who have contracts that are tied to quality. And a few producers haven't read those fine lines from dairies that have said that if um, the, the moisture is not where it should be or quality points are not where they should be, nutritive value points, that those loads could actually be rejected. So it's definitely something to really think about 
um, how water impacts not just the tonnage, but to the nutritive value and quality of these forages. And of course, this isn't just with our, our summer forages, but the, the winter silages or winter forages as well. And so as I talk about those end users, they have quality concerns. Um, one thing that I've repeatedly heard from producers is that they do not want to plant forage sorghums because of sugarcane aphid concerns. And then of course, we even can have um, mites like banks grass might get into our forage sorghums. But I really think it's important to point out that when we start talking about silage, whether it's forage sorghums or corn silage, insects are a problem all the way around. If we have water stress corn silage, we're going to have a spider mite problem and we better get in there and scout and control on time. Otherwise, we're going to see a pretty quick yield and quality um, reduction in the corn silage as well. And then of course, also with regards to forward sorghums, we have um, increasingly been looking at more sugar cane aphid tolerant um, forage sorghum hybrids, as well as I'm going to share our research on sugarcane aphid management and forage sorghums. And of course, when we talk about a planting window, we have a greater planting window usually for our forage sorghums than we do for corn silage. Um, and then we do have to give consideration though to that harvest window. I'm also gonna share some data from a previous student who also went to OSU for his PhD, um, really focusing on harvest timing and the impact of that on the nutritive value of that forage. And also, I do want to quickly point out, and I don't have data that I'm going to share um, on this, but when we start talking about forage sorghums, it's important that we consider the maturity class of that forage. And that is because if we are trying to grow a high tonnage photoperiod sensitive forage for high biomass production, that forage can use as much water, if not more water than a corn silage. So if we are in a limited water scenario, we really do need to be focusing on those earlier maturing forage sorghums so that we can get it in, get it out, and optimize the water that we have without losing tonnage and quality with that. So of course, as we talk about silage, though, the first thing that comes to everyone's mind is corn silage. That is the traditional silage of choice for all of our beef cattle feeders, for dairies, and ultimately their nutritionists. Um, and that is because there's always the belief that corn silage is high in energy, and it is, but it's not necessarily higher in energy than forage sorghums. When we talk about the energy content, we really need to be talking about the grain and the stover digestibility and how those affect the energy value and what um, water stress does to that. If we don't have the grain, the overall forage quality is going to decrease. And so that's something to keep in mind when we're in a drought um, stress situation, we have low grain production in our corn silage and that can affect that energy content. Also, there's always the belief that corn silage has a higher yield potential. And when we look at the newer genetics and the newer forage sorghum hybrids that are available, we see that these newer hybrids perform very well in a stressed environment. They can slow down, they can sit and wait for water. And it, a lot of it is because they do have that very robust root system. They have the waxier leaf that um, does help with that stomatal um, um, activity and transpirational losses, but also forage sorghums are just naturally adapted at being able to sit and withstand some water stress. And so we have to keep in mind that in a stressed environment, corn silage quality is reduced. So this is a picture from our forage sorghum trial at Bushland. And several years ago, when I um, started this, my predecessor was Brent Bean, and, and he did an excellent job actually taking this forage sorghum trial and really giving it um, a, a strong regional presence. And um, when I came in and started doing this work, I routinely received questions from producers, how does the forage sorghums that y'all are evaluating compare to corn silage. And while AgriLife does have corn silage trials, the corn silage is always produced in an optimum environment. We're irrigating at 100% ET. We're trying to achieve those yields that are greater than 30 tons per acre. And so we really did not have a fair comparison on what I would like to call a sorghum acre, where we have limited well capacities. And so what we did is start including corn silage 
as a check in the trial so that we could actually see how that stressed environment impacts the tonnage and the quality of the corn. So right here we have a side-by-side -side comparison of a corn silage next to a forage sorghum and it's just an excellent visual comparison on the potential of the forage sorghum in that water stressed environment. And so as I previously noted, that when we have drought damaged corn silage, we have poor ear development, we have decreased tonnage. But one thing that we often don't consider about in production is what's happening to the feeder. And I'm talking about both at a, at a feedlot as well as for the dairy. And we wind up with, or they wind up with increased shrinkage in a silage pit. And that's why so many of these contracts now have a fine line in there about the moisture content that they are willing to accept their forages. And that's because water stress silage usually has a lower dry matter and lower dry matter silage is more susceptible to greater shrinkage in the pit. And that feeder is paying for the silage that's delivered, the fresh forage that's delivered, not the silage silage that's fed. And so when they wind up with shrinkage in the pit, they could potentially be losing several thousand pounds. And if they haven't properly accounted for that, they could potentially have a forage shortage. So it's really important that um, the moisture content is properly managed. And in addition to just dry matter in the silage pit, um, you wind up with fermentation issues. And so low dry matter silage is more apt to have air pockets. You have butyric acid that builds up. You have palatability issues from that. And then you also have reductions in nutritive value properties, specifically starch, and then the total digestible nutrients. Research has shown that drought damaged corn can have a TDN reduced by up to 60%. So it's definitely pretty significant. So as I talk to producers, I always want to stress that if there is a risk for drought damaged corn, Corn, consider forage sorghum. And so that really leads into the justification for our program at Bushland. Um, our research goal is to address both the quality and the quantity of forage. And we do have a very large public forage sorghum silage trial. This trial is an entry fee based trial. Um, it's uh, managed or the, the entry fees are managed out of our crop testing program in College Station and then we um, manage the trial at Bushland. And we usually have about 80 uh, sorghum entries per year, not including our uh, corn checks. And if anyone's interested in that data, it is available on our Amarillo website. Of course, the easiest way to find it is just to Google AgriLife Amarillo Ford Sorghum, and you can get that um, at the, the reports uh, very quickly with that. This image is from our trial this past year. Um, our trial is located off our research farm with a cooperating producer. It's nested within his forage sorghum production field under center pivot irrigation. And that really does give us the ability to have a trial that is managed in that production scenario. And, and our producers in this region have really liked to see that data generated in that environment. Um, when we talk about our research, we've also done um, some research on sorghum harvest timing and berry processing. Um, we do currently have um, some forage sorghum herbicide trials, and those are conducted by my program specialist, uh, Dr. Kevin Heflin. And then we've also done some work on sugarcane aphid management in forage sorghums. And then we do have um, a trial that I have a graduate student and extension associate, Preston Sermon, who is looking at some sorghum sudan management. So if there is time, I definitely don't want to encroach on lunch. Um, I have a few slides on some of that as well. So um, when we talk about quality forage sorghum, of course, it always begins with um, hybrid selection. And I think it's really important to point out and, and to be honest about not all forage sorghums are created equal. When we talk about corn silage, you put 40 hybrids in a high production environment and they're all going to yield in, you know, really very closely most of them. And they're all going to have a comparable crude protein. Um, but when we start to look at forage sorghums, there are big discrepancies and that's what our data shows. So it's important that we do look at public variety trials and ultimately from multiple locations. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the ability to take this trial to multiple locations, but data from multiple locations is very important just to see the impact of environment. Um, hybrid selection should match the production goals and the end users goals. Um, 
when we look at, as I mentioned earlier, later maturing hybrids, we have to keep in mind that while they have a greater yield potential, do they do we really have the water um, to meet that uh, production demand? Also, later maturing hybrids are more prone to lodging under later season moisture stress. Um, and so we've seen situations where a producer comes in planning for high yields, higher population, high fertility, and all of a sudden we get to later in the season and well capacities are not where they should be and we don't have the in-season precipitation. And those are fields that are more apt to go down. And then of course, we need to choose hybrids based on hybrid specific characteristics and not forage type. And I'm briefly going to touch on that. But I, my point with this is that historically, um, producers have always assumed that a brown midrib hybrid is going to be the best quality. And of course, brown midribs are known for having improved digestibility um, due to their lower lignin contents, higher crude pro protein values. Um, but uh, not all brown midribs are created equal. So I am going to touch on that. Um, looking just very quickly at our 2021 trial, um, our trial was planted on June the 7th. Um, this past year, we planted our forage sorghum at 80,000 seeds per acre. Um, our corn silage, we for comparison, we planted at 32,000 seeds per acre. Um, herbicides, there are not a lot of herbicide options for forward sorghums, and that's a, a big drawback for producers. Um, but we have found good success with coming in with our metolochlores, um, even atrazine. Of course, we have to pay attention to rotational issues, um, especially if we are following with a, a producers following with cotton or something, and or even uh, wheat because of the atrazine. Um, using Husky uh, uh, post-emergent for post-emergence. Um, fer fertilizer, um, our producer does use manure um, prior to a rotational wheat crop that he has. And then we came in with 220 pounds of nitrogen that was strip till pre-plant plus 90 pounds of P205. Um, insecticides, we did apply one application of Savanto at seven ounces per acre. And that was aerially at five gallons per acre. And then our in-season um, irrigation precipitation totaled about 16 inches. So looking at the yields, we have yields that um, topped 32 and a half tons per acre. So again, demonstrating that we do have these upper end yield potentials with our forward sorghums. And then we have yields down here about 18 tons per acre. So, you know, definitely a big difference in yield. So that's where, you know, having a side-by-side -side comparison in that same production environment is a, a great visual and comparison for this. These red bars in here are actually our corn silage checks. And so this really does provide an indication of how corn is going to perform. And one of the things that we saw this year, because we had very timely um, precipitation with our about eight inches of in-season precipitation. Our corn pre uh, performed better than it has performed in previous years. Usually our corn silage is always down about 20 to 22 tons per acre, um, but we did have a hybrid um, that flexed really, really well and performed very well um, this year, but still did not have the potential um, as our forage sorghums in what we call this um, corn environment. And of course, it does go back to, again, the value of that ear. And when we talk about all of our forage sorghums for silage, we are harvesting at soft dough. So at this point, we have um, good grain development and that, that berry, that head is contributing pretty significantly to that grain yield or into that silage yield. So looking at just the value of the ear, one of the things that I um, have done is actually go in and look at the impact and the value of the ear on our silage. And it is an extreme example because what we have done is completely remove the ear. So we do not have any cobs or any grain. Um, and of course, also, we've already had um, water soluble carbohydrates that have converted to starch. So, you know, there is an impact to that. But nevertheless, what we have seen by not having good ear development is that our relative feed quality has reduced by 330% without that grain. And when we look at Pioneer 1151 with an ear, um, relative feed quality of 92 without the ear, 28. Um, total digestible nutrients agrees with that previous research and um, a decrease by almost 60%. And then um, 
our milk per ton cut in half. And then of course, ultimately what's impactful to the producer and to you is what's happening with the yield when we don't have that ear. And so we're looking at about a reduction of seven tons per acre um, in a situation where we don't have good ear development. So again, for quality corn silage, you need grain. And so here's another side-by-side -side comparison. This is Abana's uh, 7401 next to another corn silage and just showing um, some you know, really uh, strong impacts of that water stress environment on that corn. Now, this is um, a comparison of data from our 2021 trial. And what I am comparing are our brown midrib and our non-brown midrib hybrids. And I've plotted the acid detergent fiber, which is an indication of the lignification and digestibility against the in vitro total dry matter digestibility after 48 hours. So what happens in that um, rumen after 48 hours um, with that forage. And so, of course, as we look at ADF, the higher the ADF, the lower the digestibility, and the higher the in vitro, the better digestibility. And what we see is that we have some really good brown midrib forages. This is the, the gray circle, but we also have some really good non-brown midrib forages. This is the, the, the darker um, triangle. And we have some brown midribs down here that perform very poorly with regards to um, the digestibility and the nutritive value parameters. And so my point with this plot and really stressing this data goes back to my initial statement that not all forward sorghums are created equal. It's very important that if we're out there visiting with seed dealers about um, a forage sorghum that just because they say it's a brown midrib, we don't automatically scoop it up. We really need to be talking to them about the digestibility and uh, they, of course they run their own trials. And if they if, if their hybrids are not in our trial, they should have updated data that they can share with you so that you have a really good indication of how that hybrid performs. And of course, when we're talking about digestibility, it ultimately goes back to weight gain. You want a highly digestible forage so you can ulti um, ultimately optimize weight gain. And so we're looking for something that's going to have a lower ADF and a higher in vitro number. So good BMRs, but also good non-BMRs. Do not discredit a hybrid because it is a non-BMR. Okay, so with that, it really leads well into some research that we did with a graduate student at WT several years ago, Colton Robeson, and he did also go to OSU, and I believe that he's recently graduated with his PhD also. And the objective of this research was to investigate the effects of plant and maturity, kernel processing, and ensiling time on the in situ ruminal degradability of sorghum silage to optimize silage quality. And this um, does go back to the value of harvest timing. When we start talking to producers about timely harvesting of our forage sorghums for silage, you know, there's always a challenge and it's easier said than done. We have this very narrow soft dough window and especially producers who are using a custom chopper, if that fields at soft dough and that custom chopper doesn't get to the field for two weeks, well now all of a sudden they're at hard dough and the quality of that forage has gone down. Down. And so producers um, are more often talking to their choppers now about the moisture content of their forage, the stage, and they're really trying to coordinate um, an optimum chopping time. And of course, if you have your own silage chopper, um, it is important that you, you know, are, are watching and paying attention to that so you can get in there in time. But that was the objective of this research. And um, we did use Advanta 7401. We harvested at two stages, soft dough and hard dough. And we used two grain processing methods, cracked and uncracked. Um, we had four ensiling durations, zero being the fresh forage, 30 days, 60 days, and 120 days. And the objective for including uh, the, the three different um, ensiling periods was so we could determine if and siling actually improved the, the quality and the nutritive value of the forage that was harvested at hard dough. So if you are not able to get into a field at soft dough, if you ensile longer, can you overcome those challenges at harvest? 
And this also did include an in situ experiment using cannulated steers um, to evaluate the ruminal starch digestion. And Colton did a fantastic job um, with all that work. So before I jump into the data though, I do want to briefly touch on silage fermentation analysis for ideal silage. There are several characteristics that we do need to keep in mind. Um, we have the pH of the silage about 3.6 to 4.2. And um, when we talk about pH, if it's greater than five, this will indicate poor ferment, uh, poorly fermented silage and often microbial growth. And when we talk about our pH of our fresh forage, fresh forage is anywhere from five and a half to six. So if that ensiled forage has a pH greater than five, there really was not any ensiling that went on. And it's important to keep in mind that the silage process is just a fermentation or pickling process. So um, it, it, pH is very important um, to indicate if fermentation actually did occur. Lactic acid is a very important acid in silage. It's uh, the ideal range is four to 8% of dry matter. Um, acetic acid is actually an acid that's going to be an indicator of poor intake. Um, it's an, uh, also something that builds when we have extremely wet silage or um, loose packing. You also see it where you have slow packing processes, air trapped. So it creates palatability issues and of course, what is acetic acid? It's vinegar. So, you know, if you have silage that smells like vinegar and it's going to taste like vinegar, it only makes sense that you're going to have poor intake. Butyric acid is another acid that um, is an indication of poor silage or poor ensiling. High butyric acid indicates the silage has undergone clostridial fermentation, results in low intake, and also um, at worst case scenario can result in ketosis. And then there's also nitrogen fractions that I'm not going to talk about. But when we talk about nitrogen, we're talking about protein. So if we have nitrogen um, fractions that are out of balance, either we have lost a lot of um, nitrogen and protein losses just due to volatilization. Um, and we see that more frequently with wetter silages. So jumping right into the data, as I mentioned, we had four um, uh, key treatments that we were evaluating. We had the, the two harvest stages, hard dough and soft dough, and then the cracked grain and the whole grain. And cracked and whole is really important. As we talk to silage choppers, producers, and especially if they're using a custom chopper, are often not interested in paying extra to have a kernel processor used. Um, it can cost anywhere from a dollar or more per acre to have that done. And so it's also going to cause that, that chopper to slow down. And when these choppers are moving very quickly, um, you know, unless that producer is willing to pay extra to have that grain processed, then they are often are not using that kernel processor. Another problem that we run into with forage sorghums is that not all berries are created equal. And I'm sure as y'all have all seen, you have big berries, little berries. And so with our little berries, they tend to just go right through those kernel processors. And so um, if, if starch is an interest, then a larger berry forage sorghum um, is definitely something that could be used. So looking just very quickly at the pH um, for our fresh forage, you know, what we see is, you know, we're all about, you know, five and a half. And then we saw a very rapid decline in pH for our soft dough in comparison to the hard dough. So of course, soft dough, we have forage that's ideally in that, or in, the, in that ideal moisture range of about 65% in comparison to the hard dough forage that's usually going to have a lower dry matter. So you're not going to have as quick of a fermentation process. And so that's something that was really important um, to see that regardless of um, the um, cracked versus whole, that the harvest stage really was impactful. Now, once we got to 60 days or later, um, with regards to the pH of the forage, there was no significant difference between harvest stage or the, um, the berry processing. But definitely, you know, if we're looking for a very rapid fermentation so that we avoid clostridial issues, acetic acid building up, any of those issues that are associated with poor forage, we want something to ferment very quickly. And so soft dough is where we need to be for that. 
Now, as I mentioned, lactic acid, that's our good acid. And so what we saw within that first 30 day period is that that lactic acid built very quickly and in the soft O forage. And that's why that pH dropped very quickly. And um, the lactic acid never really reached those ideal levels in our hard dough forage um, until we got to um, about 120 days out. So that was something that was really interesting to see with regards to just that, that buildup of lactic, lactic acid in the forage. And then of course, starch. Um, when we talk about starch within a dairy situation, Starch, of course, is important for energy, for milk. Um, starch is important for weight gain in cattle. Now, of course, dairies are looking at about half of their ration being a forage. And so that's why they're more interested in the starch content of a silage than a, a beef cattle feedlot who is using more grain in their mixed ration to account for that. Um, but what we saw, and this is really as to be expected, in our hard dough forage, we had greater starch content. Well, that makes sense because when we look at the uh, conversion of carbohydrates to starch in the grain, um, the more mature grain is going to have more starch. So hard dough forages have more starch. But the question became, or there was, but is that starch available? And that's why Colton had the in situ experiment with that. And what we saw was that when we actually look at the digestion, ruminal digestion of that starch, that more starch is actually digestible and available in that soft dough forage. So you know, this data really confirmed and validated the, um, the recommendations that we in extension give producers about harvesting on soft dough to optimize quality. Um, we definitely see greater starch availability um, in that soft dough forage. And of course, looking at ensiling duration, it did not matter um, if we extended that duration to uh, uh, 120 days, we never achieved the levels that we had with our soft dough forage. Now, of course, when we start talking about producers, um, usually you're not getting paid on quality, you're getting paid on tonnage. And so when we look at the difference in the tonnage, we see that we had 23.1 tons um, when we harvested at soft dough in comparison to 25.6 tons when we harvested at hard dough. So harvesting at hard dough could generate an additional two and a half tons. And right now our silage contracts are running $65 or more per acre. So at today's prices that could generate $150 an acre. So that's pretty significant. Um, so, you know, it really does go back to, you know, even though we have shown that harvest timing um, is very important. If you're not getting paid for quality, well, then you're definitely going to make more money at hard dough. But in conclusion, uh, Colton and um, his data showed that harvest timing and siling duration were critical. If we're harvesting at soft dough um, with a cracked forage, that forage is going to be, that silage pit, I should say, is ready to open within 30 days. However, if we are harvesting at hard dough and we have whole berries, you know, we're not going to be able to open that silage and feed for more than 100 days. And of course, it's still not going to have the quality of the other forage. So um, jumping right into um, some other research, we looked at um, the impact of sugarcane aphids on uh, forage yield and quality. And of course, when sugar canes moved into the um, Southern Great Plains several years ago, everybody was very nervous about forage sorghums because it's very hard to get in and control sugar cane aphids in a forage field because of those dense canopies. But uh, working with our um, entomologists, we were really able to develop a really good trial to reevaluate the impact of sugar cane aphids on yield and quality. And it, a lot of it actually came from feeders more so than uh, our producers. Feeders were seeing this forage sorghum come in on trucks that had sooty mold on it and it was nasty. And the question was, is this safe to feed? And what's going to happen to this forage after it's ensiled? So that was a, one of the big objectives behind this research. Um, and of course, the fact that we had not previously had damage potential established for forage sorghums 
um, until for the Southern Great Plains until this research was done. And so our objective was to create different levels of sugarcane aphid infestations and correlate those damage levels to forage sorghum yield and silage quality. And we use different insecticides to create different infestation levels. And these insecticide treatments were randomized. We had Lorsban, Malathion, Warrior Intruder, Savanto Prime, and an untreated check. And we did come in weekly and sample uh, leaves to do sugarcane aphid counts as well as damage ratings. Now this is just looking at a side-by-side -side, um, comparison or, or, or comparison from within our trial, sorry, wasn't necessarily side-by-side, -side, but this was a Savanto prime plot where we had very good control and then this was um, our untreated check. So definitely a good visual showing the impact of um, sugarcane aphid pressure on the, the forage. We did use a hybrid Pioneer 841F. They are not really pushing this hybrid anymore because it's very susceptible to sugarcane aphids. And that's what we wanted, a hybrid that was very susceptible so that we were truly looking at the impact of the sugarcane aphid and that it wasn't confounded by potential hybrid tolerance. And this really is important because as we consider production in a water limited environment, yield and quality losses as a result of poor insect management result in decreased water use efficiency. And that's essentially a wasted crop, but really wasted water. And when we have limited water, we cannot afford to throw water away um, on a crop that's lost due to poor um, agronomic management and poor insect management. So as I mentioned, we had different insecticidal treatments um, with both our untreated check and the warrior. The objective for those was to actually flare those sugarcane aphids. And this was not designed to be an insecticidal study, but we really did get some excellent data just demonstrating how many of these insecticides kill the beneficials and cause those sugarcane aphids to flare. And so um, that was the objective of those two treatments. We also had Lorsban. Um, with the objective that it would provide moderate control, about 50% control, and had a shorter residual. And of course, we're now dealing with ban issues for that, um, for production. Of course, there's such a stockpile. I know producers are going to continue to use it. Um, we had Intruder. That is one that provides um, also a very short residual. And then, of course, Savanto. We had several different rates of Savanto. Um, knowing that Savanto is going to provide um, long residual, we wanted to see what different rates would do with that. And then in 2019, we came in and included Malathion um, rather than um, the Lorsban. And so that performs very similarly to Lorsban, though, um, only about five days of residual activity. So I'm just going to share the data from 2017. It was very similar in 2019, though um, we have increasingly seen less sugarcane aphid pressure over the past couple of years, um, which has been good. But nevertheless, the impact of the damage has remained the same. So what we did, as I mentioned, we came in as soon as we started seeing sugarcane aphids in the field started um, taking uh, damage ratings as well as uh, sugarcane aphid counts. And what we quickly saw was that after our um, insecticidal treatments, that the um, untreated check and the Lorsban treatments had a very rapid increase in those sugarcane aphids. And with our um, intruder and warrior, there was a slower increase, or I'm sorry, um, I should say, th this was the warrior and the untreated check. And then we had the lures ban and the intruder, and we saw a slower increase, but still demonstrating that we did not have the extended residual activity that we did see with Savanto Prime. And so we can see right there just what the impact of the insecticide did on killing the beneficials and how having also the um, longer residual activity really did keep um, those sugarcane aphids at bay all the way through harvest at soft dough. Now, when we did our damage ratings at that time, we were using a damage scale for grain sorghum. And this was from a zero to 10 scale going from zero with no sugarcane aphids or honeydew all the way to a 10 with 100% of the leaf area damaged or dead. And looking at those damage ratings, um, we saw a very similar pattern. Um, now, of course, 
even in our Savanto Prime, we still saw, you know, occasional um, um, honeydew spot or, or something, but it was not significant. Less than 10% of the leaf area had a little bit of honeydew or was impacted. Um, but what we saw, of course, with the untreated check and the warrior, we were looking at up to 90% of that leaf area damaged or dead. And then when we get to the lures van and intruder, we were over 50%. And so as we talk about the impact of these treatment or the, the these insecticides and the damage on yield, it's very significant. Um, once we have that honeydew um, build and the sooty mold build on the leaf, we have lodging and um, also reduced photosynthetic activity. We've seen reduction in panicle exertion, reduction in grain production. So a really big reduction in yield due to that. And this is data from those plots. And so we saw that very nice linear decrease in yield as a result of that sugarcane aphid damage. And so from the results from this, what we saw is that the two-year data set confirmed that the cheaper insecticide selection resulted in greater sugarcane aphid infestation and damage. Um, that's because we killed the beneficials and or had re shorter residual activity. The two-year data set also confirmed yield reduction with increased damage. And our two-year data set confirmed reduced nutritive value and increased damage or with increased damage. And so with that, the results really confirmed that we did need to reevaluate that rating scale and have an action threshold just for forage sorghums. And so our action threshold is pretty aggressive because those sugarcane aphids do um, expand very quickly. You know, usually when we look at most of our thresholds, we're, we're very conservative with those, but because again, these sugarcane aphids build very quickly, we responded to that. If pre-boot we have 20% of the aphids infested with 50 or more aphids, we need to pull the trigger and spray. Same thing at boot, as we move into flowering, 30% um, of the plants. And then once we get to soft dough, now we're looking at harvest issues. And so we need to observe pre-harvest intervals for our insecticides and if that's even a possibility. Um, and so um, lastly, on my own time. Um, I, I'm going to briefly touch on some um, data from um, my extension associate, who's also a graduate student at WTMU, and he's looking at sorghum Sudan harvest management. And it was in response to questions about um, ratoon cropping. And is ratoon cropping or having a, a, a second harvest in the, in the panhandle in our Southern Great Plains area actually a point of consideration? And can we produce more biomass with that? Um, definitely something that's performed um, more commonly in South Texas and in other areas, but we have very few producers in this area who are currently ratooning. So we came in with this and also had two different cutting heights, an eight inch versus a four. And the objective was that was to determine if an eight inch cutting height actually had more nodes. And if you have more nodes left, would you encourage greater regrowth? And of course, because this was um, sorghum suit in for hay, we did harvest at boot to optimize the forage hay quality. Um, we were not um, you know, taking this to soft dough like we do for our silage trial. Um, what we saw is that um, there was no regrowth potential for the later maturing hybrids at more northern latitudes. And of course, even though I talk about um, more northern latitudes, you know, I, I do give consideration to what's also the impact of elevation and longitude, because going from Bushland at almost 3,500 feet to Oklahoma, we're looking at a pretty big drop in elevation, and that significantly impacts our growing season. So that could be a big difference um, as I get closer, or as, as we would get closer to y'all's area. Um, but what we saw is that um, for our early maturing hybrids, we did have that opportunity to have regrowth and come in and cut a second time um, it, for both our four inch and our eight inch cutting. Whereas with those later maturing hybrids, there's definitely no regrowth. Now, from a very practical standpoint, you know, we step back and say, well, cumulatively, these yields were almost the same. And so if we are looking at the cost of harvesting, if we are going to come in and have a one-time cutting, we can optimize tonnage with a later maturing forage and, and just have that tonnage. But then again, with droughts, with water stress, if, whatever that may be, we also run into an issue with reduced quality with these later maturing hybrids. 
And so we can potentially optimize our quality or could optimize our quality um, with those four inch cuttings come in, get a really good quality um, forage in a very short window. We were looking at about eight, eight, weeks, eight weeks in and out for these earlier maturing hybrids. So very quick turnaround. And then if you have environmental conditions favorable enough, you can get back in the field and take care of that. Um, oh, and then of course, comparing the difference in four and eight inch um, cutting heights, there was no significant yield loss at the eight inch cutting height, um, especially for that first cutting. So some preliminary results, he does have two years worth of data for this, and he's currently in the process of writing this up. Um, but preliminary results do show no difference in node numbers between the two evaluated heights. That really did surprise me. I had thought we might see um, a significant difference in nodes, um, but no difference in nodes with that. Um, as I mentioned, not a significant yield advantage for ratoon cutting um, for those um, later maturing hybrids especially, um, but the ratoon cutting provide, uh, of early maturing hybrids provides an opportunity for earlier harvest and quality preservation. So just in summary, a few things. Um, sorghum silage is a profitable alternative to corn silage due to drought tolerance, but to produce comparable tonnage, you do need the water. Um, so we have this belief that sorghum is drought tolerant. And I think that this is where producers often have a bad experience with forage sorghums. They come in and think sorghum is a drought tolerant alternative and that they don't have to irrigate it. Um, sorghum can um, shut down during those peak water demands, but still, if we're looking at making adequate tonnage, we still need some irrigation. Now with our data, we showed we irrigated this past year at eight inches. So we're not looking at 100% ET coming in at 18 plus inches of irrigation with that. Um, so, you know, moderate irrigation, you can still perform very well. If corn is tasseling and you don't meet the water demand, you lose quality more quickly with corn than with sorghum. Corn can use more water than forage sorghums, but seasonal water use will depend on maturity class and those environmental conditions. So again, you don't have the water, plant something earlier. And then of course, in addition to um, the work we're doing here, I'm really seeing increased interest in forage sorghums nationally. And um, there's been a lot of interest from the Southwest, lots of interest in Arizona. Um, they've been using our data quite a bit just because they've seen a big transition because of the Colorado River issues in uh, producers transitioning from corn silage to forage sorghum. And we have expanding droughts, reduced reservoir storage, declining groundwater, as well as increasing water district regulation. So a big interest nationally in forage sorghums, and that's been exciting to see. With that, I greatly appreciate the invitation and the opportunity. And if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to take them. Dr. Bell, we get a lot of uh, nitrate testing every year. Do you see any nitrate problem with all this uh, hybrid? So I have not specifically looked at hybrid differences, but you are right. There can be nitrate issues, but we have also seen that drought stress corn can be high in nitrates. And so um, fortunately during the ensiling process that their nitrates are lost, but I always visit with producers about testing and knowing how much nitrates or what the nitrate levels are, because it's not going to be a hundred percent loss. And that's just due to um, volatilization in that um, silage pit. But nitrates, yes, can be an issue. Um, that is why it's important to soil sample. Um, I know that y'all talked extensively about this and it's not just our zero to six or zero to eight inch soil sample, but those deep samples, you know, accounting for that residual um, nitrogen in that profile. If you don't have the irrigation, you know, really consider how much nitrogen you're applying because nitrates can be an issue.
Jordan, you have some text questions. Oh, text questions. Okay, in the chat. Okay, um, we did not evaluate um, prusic acid or nitrate content versus the four and eight inch. Um, and actually that's something that we did talk about in hindsight. That's a great point because we all know that that is a good management strategy. If we do have forage that's higher in nitrates or for, uh, or prusic acid, raise that cutting bar, especially because those nitrates are what's accumulating in the base of that stock. Um, but we were not really in a situation where we were um, susceptible to that. So at the time we did not do that. Oh, let's see, is there another one? Let me go up. Quality difference between, okay, so the question is, is there a quality difference between pit silage and round baled silage? Um, they can help get silage pit up to optimum time. Okay, so yes, when you look at silage management, there definitely is um, you know, some important considerations with round bale silage versus pit silage. Um, when we talk about round bale silage as a whole, that's usually done for Bermuda grass. I've seen people do it for like wheatledge, um, some of those other smaller silages. When we get lots of our, from what I've heard from producers, when we get into our forage sorghums or corn silage, we have issues really getting that packed as tightly in that round bale, um, especially if they're just coming in there and baling it whole and not chopping it. And so that's because you, know, you have these big stocks and air pockets that get in there. Now, if you're looking at actually doing some bagging with sorghum silage or corn silage, it's, it's probably going to be more efficient to actually use those baggers where they can bag it and they can pack those very tight. When we do consider harvest timing, um, you're still looking at a soft dough with that. That's going to be ideal. And um, now one of the things that I did not uh, mention, of course, we were purely trying to focus on the impact of harvest timing and not the impact of an inoculant. Um, people who are bagging have reported that because you don't have a leaching um, or leachate that can occur out of the bags, like you do your drive over silage pits, that you know you can wind up with um, some issues with fermentation issues and acetic acid and things. So they have felt that the inoculants can help with that. So I would definitely recommend just based off of experience and communication with producers to consider an inoculant for a bagging situation. Okay, so we're looking at when is the right time, and so with that, so with that, we we're wanting to see as far as like time goes, and seeing when can you get the most out of that input, out of that application of nitrogen due to the continuous increase of those prices. Okay, so a lot of things uh, play into when it when the right time is. It's your weather variables. Uh, the growth stage, labor availability, and the flexibility of your equipment. So uh, we're going to go in a little bit more into uh, the weather. And so with that, what we mean is you could have uh, severe thunderstorms, which increase uh, uh, the amount of rainfall during a certain time, or it could lead to uh, leaching or runoff. And then as far as drought, you could have uh, losses of nitrogen through volatilization. And so all that's gonna do is take away from your nitrogen use efficiency and decrease your profitability of profit. So with all that being said, can it wait? Well, if you look at the nitrogen use efficiency curves for wheat and sorghum, it can wait. You can wait until for wheat to, uh, uh, until flowering when it takes up uh, 80% and then following uh, boot where it takes up approximately 60% for grain sorghum. And so this is a study where we did just that. We delayed that nitrogen application and looked to see just how it could recover and what's gonna happen to your grain yield. And so in 2020, we actually had a significant increase at the 42 day, uh, days after uh, plant, planting. 
and there were no significant decreases in yield, uh, grain yield. But if you look at the, the weather uh, data I have on the right-hand side, so the uh, orange bars is 2020, and then the gray bars is 2021. And you'll see that the 35 through 56 days, it goes, you get pretty much into a drought. But then on that 56 day, you got a little over eight inches. And so if you go back and you look at how that affected grain yield from the first year versus this previous year. So that could have been lost due to leaching, runoff, et cetera. And in this, in this particular location, it was a sandier soil. So more likely caused loss through leaching. And just to give you a visual representation of just how stressed we let this, these crops get, um, and just another side note, if you look at the top right-hand side for you, no, left-hand, yeah. Left-hand side for y'all, uh, if you look at the difference in biomass and then the plot, plots on either side of the, the center where it's more yellow, um, what's happening there is so that crop is actually changing where it's shifting all of this energy. So you see a decrease in plant height and biomass uh, accumulation because it's changing its growth for its underground, uh, for the roots so it can alleviate the nitrogen stress. And then, so we had a few more locations for the study in 2020. And we had uh, La Homa and Lake Carl Blackwell. They showed a significant de decrease in yield at 84 days after planting, while the double, double crop alva location was 42 through 56. And so that had a lot to do with just that it was double crop, it was planted a lot later and the maturity rate that had that was used for that double crop situation. All right, so now we're just gonna move on to talk about a little bit about source. Uh, the particular experiments I'm gonna start with, we had two locations looking at grain sorghum uh, influenced by a nitrogen source. And just a little preface, all of these sites that I'm gonna talk about were no-till situations, so keep that in mind. And we'll get started. Uh, so you see this first location was at Perkins, Oklahoma, just south of here at Stillwater. And you see three distinct timings. You have a pre-timing, a 21 days after planting timing, and a 35 days after planting timing. And then we also had four sources that we used. Those four sources were Super U, Urea, UAN, and UAN with Anvil. And so for this first site, there was really only one kind of takeaway that we could get from this location. And that was that we did have a statistical difference between Super U and UAN and Anvil. Besides that, this location didn't provide a whole lot of information because there was so much yield variation in this particular study. But again, that, U, that Super U, there's a possibility compared to that UAN and ANVOL, maybe that UAN got tied up on some residues and things like that. And also maybe that additional that addition of DCD to that super U formulation, formulation uh, may have made a, a difference here. If we move to the second location up at Alba, uh, this was just south of, uh, just up by Hopeton. Uh, this location, it looks like there's a lot of really good stuff going on, a lot of differences, but there was actually no significant differences statistically. And that just shows you how much yield variation we've seen in some of these trials. This particular location had a lot of, of variation topography wise. And so that might have been playing a part of, in this particular trial, uh, not providing very much useful information. So this is where I'm going to bring in some of our wheat experiments because we only had those two grain sorghum experiments coming out, coming into this year. And so the first, these three sites, we had a Tacoma. Caldwell, Kansas, which is just north of Medford, and then Perry, Oklahoma. And so I'm gonna focus first on the first timing, which is this November uh, application date. And what you see is kind of a continuation of what we saw in that first year, or that first location of grain sorghum data. That Super U did perform better at all three sites than the other three treatments in that timing, uh, in that early timing in particular. We also saw UAN and ANVOL kind of underperform at two of those sites relative to the dry, the, the, the uh, dry fertilizers that we used. Uh, you also see the UAN, especially by alone, definitely took a hit 
at the Perry location and that Caldwell, Kansas location when we're talking about just that early timing. So again, just kind of the take home from that early, that early timing is that super U, we did generally outperform other sources in this experiment. The addition of ANVOL did provide a yield increase over just UAN alone at two of the three locations. Uh, but then again, just keep that in mind, those two of the three and, and how that UAN may have played with that residue in that field. So if we move to that second timing for Tacoma and Caldwell, and then the final timing for Perry, which are all the three in March, we see that trend kind of change. You begin to see that UAN and ANVOL perform a little bit better than some of the other sources and start to see super use kind of maybe the value of, of using super use compared to urea kind of decrease at that particular timing. We did have a little bit of rainfall about 10 days after application at all three of these sites. So keep that in mind. So we did get that, that maybe that, that using of that nitrogen stabilizer, that ANVOL and that UAN maybe provided some benefit there, but we didn't see it with that super U in that, in that, that March timing in this, this particular experiment. So again, UN and ANVIL, we, had, we did have a, a higher yield, uh, I believe two of the three sites for this particular experiment, it was statistically significant, but on uh, one of the three, it was numerically, numerically higher yield, but, but not statistically. We didn't see a difference in any of these, or at two of the three sites between super U and urea, to keep that in mind. And at Caldwell, we had a, a, a the urea was significantly higher, and I can go back then the super U at that Caldwell location in that March timing. Uh, not sure really why exactly, and Dr. Arnell might have a better idea about that than I do, but going forward, uh, I'm just gonna say that I don't really know exactly why. So moving on kind of the, you see the Perry location did not have a third timing here. Uh, we got in a really kind of a time strap situation coming, in, coming out of the spring. We had quite a bit of snow at some time, some rainfall. And so we only got two of those third timings out. They were in, in April, so how much value that actually provides us is kind of maybe lessens that. But we did re, we did still get a yield response relative to, to the no fertilizer check uh, that you see there. And so even though we were that late, we did have a response and we did recover some of that yield we might have been worried about losing that late. So kind of in conclusion for the, the source work, our data was a little bit inconclusive and it, this work is ongoing. We already do have some more wheat sites out this year. Uh, the use of nitrogen stabilizers can be pretty hit or miss, uh, especially you talk about MBPT and its effective life is really about 14 days at best a lot of, in a lot of scenarios. And so keep that in mind when you're talking about thinking about where to put your money. Um, Super U does appear to perform better early season, uh, at least in the wheat. We saw it once in the grain sorghum. We'll continue to see that. I believe this experiment is going to be ongoing in the grain sorghum this year. And again, that might be due to that the addition of DCD along with that MBPT in that product. Again, like I said, maybe your money is better spent elsewhere. If you know that you're going to get a, or you're likely to get a good rainfall event later, uh, maybe it is a good investment. Keep that keep that nitrogen there until you get that that time of rainfall. Keep in mind that the return on investment for these products, these nitrogen stabilizers, can be pretty dependent on nitrogen unit co or nitrogen cost per unit, as well as your nitrogen use efficiency gains that you get from using those products. So moving on, now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some work we call it sorghum burn. This particular experiments, but we're looking at the influence of in-season application of nitrogen on grain sorghum performance. And really the question is, can in season in be applied in a less than optimal manner than maybe you want to without sacrificing yield? You can see in this particular experiment, in this picture, this was taken at Perkins, Oklahoma, the amount of burn in some of these treatments is pretty severe. And so keep that in mind when we think about how, how much this plant is trying to recover uh, from the damage of that photosynthetic material. So in this particular uh, experiment, some, some just, Important information to know, these, all these sites that I'm gonna talk about were planned on 30 inch spacings. Uh, I don't, don't know on the seating rat, I didn't put it down, but all the fertilizer applies, was applied using 28% UAN with 60 pounds of N applied pre to all the fertilized plots, and then 60 pounds applied in season as well, which is where the treatments come in. 
and those besides the urea, those were also 28% UAN. The applica application methods that we use were urea broadcast, uh, urea dribbled between the rows, UAN flat pans on 20 inch spacing, UAN streamers on 60 inch spacing with and without drops, the same for 30 inch space streamers with and without drops, UAN streamers with 20 inch drops, and then uh, Chafer T bar on 20 inch spacing. And you can see just in the case anybody has any questions, we are talking about a T bar that looks like that again on 20 inch spacing and then also on that far right you see our just regular streamer nozzle on that boom so the first location we'll talk about is chicken shave we did not have a response to nitrogen however we did have a negative response to one treatment and that was the t-bar on 20 inch spacing besides that all of the other application methods did not negatively hurt yield as far as the statistical analysis whenever we did the statistical analysis However, there was a trend at this location for that flat fan 20 inch spacing to also perform poorly, but it was not statistically different at an alpha 0.05. So it could be, uh, it would not surprise us to see that next year as we put these trials out to see that flat fan uh, maybe be a statistically less yield than some of the other treatments. Moving on to Perkins, here we did have a response to, to nitrogen. We have a little bit different scenario on those soils are a little sandier as we might expect, we'd get a, a response to that nitrogen. Again, we see that T-bar on 20 inch spacings, statistically less than the other treatments compared to, all, compared to all the other treatments. We also saw that flat fan was a little bit less than some of the other treatments as well, but again, not statistically different. Finally, we get to the Lake Carl Blackwell uh, location. We again had a response to nitrogen app applied and again, at this location, we had a huge drop off when we used those T-bars. It was statistically different. And we were also extremely close in this location for that flat fan application to be extremely, or to be significantly different as well. Again, so on this particular location, if you look at kind of the high yield range, about 60 bushel, we were sacrificing almost 20 to 30 bushel uh, per acre on, when we used those T-bars relative to the higher fertilized plots in that trial. So our take home from the application method part of this, this presentation was that the T-bar on 20 inch spacing consistently decreased yield. All three of those site years, it was on the dot and always about 20 to 30 bushel relative to those other, other treatments. And again, those flat fan nozzles on 20 inch spacing, they trended towards a decrease, but we didn't have a statistical difference at the time, but wouldn't be surprised to see it in the future. Some other takeaways is whenever we use drops, at the same spacing. So if we compare 30 inch drops or 30 inch spacings with drops compared to no drops on 30 inch spacings, there was no benefit saw from utilizing those drops in this scenario at any of the locations. And then we also did not see a significant yield increase by moving from 30 inch spaced uh, fertilizer or nozzle spacings to 60 inch spacings and skipping that, skipping every other row. Um, visual burn symptomology did not always equate to significant yield loss. Some of these methods are not maybe what you want to do. Maybe you want to use wide drops or some of these other, use some of these other technologies that are out there that, that keeps your crop looking pretty in most, most of the, uh, in the field throughout the year. But just because it doesn't look good doesn't mean it doesn't work. And finally, kind of one last thing on this is excessively stressful conditions could contribute to greater yield loss than we saw in this trial. We hope if we continue to extend this, this experiment and do it a couple more years, uh, we might be able to coach out a couple of those years where we have some really excessively stressful situations and see how that crop responds. So finally, just the last kind of three concepts that, that really drive this presentation home. Uh, there is no one way to manage in. Uh, everybody has kind of their own way. There's more than one way to skin a cat. And being adaptable is a, is a really big key to success. Being able to move that nitrogen application in season if you need to, being able to use maybe some equipment that wouldn't be uh, perfect for the scenario and know that you're not gonna lose yield or less likely to use yield, lose yield at least. Uh, that can be a really, really big benefit. Um, increased profitability is you gotta minimize costs and you gotta maximize output, especially in a, in a situation where you have high fertilizer costs Make sure you're getting the most bang for your buck out of that nitrogen fertilizer. Increase that NUE as best you can. 
And finally, last but not least, don't forget the ladder. Uh, if you're not taking care of your soil pH, not taking care of that P and K, then you're you're getting ahead of the of the horse there, and uh, you could be costing yourself nitrogen use efficiency and uh, really decreasing the amount of output you get from each unit of venue apply. So with that, uh, oops, uh, me and Michaela would love to fill any questions as well as Dr. Arnell, please around. Um, you keep mentioning stat difference. Yes. Uh, don't you think you ought to also do economic difference because even with your chart, you're talking about a fifty dollar yield, but you're saying it's not a sufficient difference. That's a fifty dollar per acre difference in your yield between your truck and you the flat pay. So yeah, how do you how do we explain to our people? Oh, don't worry about a fifty dollar an acre deal because that's not statistically different. Well, and, and maybe kind of one one way to frame it is that so all these trials are replicated four times at each location. So the variability in those yields between plots uh, kind of compensates. So that even though, for instance, like here, that 30 inch with no drop versus the thir say the the 60 inch with no drop, that's uh, probably a 15 20 bushel difference. For the means, but that does not mean that there might be some plots in that experiment that that 60 inch with no drop was higher even than that 30 inch with the with no drop. Well, so, uh, you know, you're saying there's no stat difference of it, but you turned up economics of that. You're yeah. driving home, you're talking dollars per acre, yeah, and some of it's cash rented ground, and you take the 50 dollars an acre out of that. That's yeah. yeah, for sure. Um, I, I can this it's okay. Mike's trying to give you help, but I'll, That's I'll, okay. I'll, I'll handle it. <laughs> any, other, any other questions? Thanks. Is it the part or is it the work? Yeah, so if you go back, let me see if I can. You can see, so in the picture on the left, yeah, it'd be the left one, y'all. Those, those streamer bars, those T bars, really doused a lot of that leaf area. And so you ended up with a lot of burn. Some of these really severe plots here, those, a lot of those were the T bar plots in this particular location. And so you burn off so much of that photosynthetic material from such a concentrated stream that it's not recoverable, is what's happening for the most part. Any other questions? All right, let's give them a hand. I will say on the T-bar and flat fan, they're effectively the same in its coverage. That T-bar, people like moving the T-bar over the streamer because of better coverage than streamer and the dry land conditions. We could have always turned the streamer with row too. That would have helped reduce the burn, but we wanted to be worst case. So we actually, we set it up where it would go like you would on, on a regular sprayer, but you could have just turned that and they would have been more of a linear run. So each of those. And Mike, as far as the economics, this is actually a talk I give a lot, is that we have to rely on statistics until we have enough data to say that the statistics can be moved beyond. With two locations, we can't move beyond statistics because we can't repeat it. But at a certain point, once you see something happen over and over again, then the statistics can start being moved to more of, okay, you know what? We may not hit a statistical difference every time, but this trend occurs in enough time that I'm confident. And I've done, I think some of you have watched it. I've done a talk about how do I judge when something's at point. I need to be at a point where I can say 75% of the time that whatever I say is going to win 75% of the time. 50-50 is just not good enough at the level I, I've got to be at. So I've got to be a majority win. Like if I'm going to Vegas, the odds have got to be in my favor that if I say it's going to happen, it's going to have to happen. But those are great questions that the students have to have. And as a researcher, we have to hit them with like in their defense, you can't say it's real if it's statistically not real. And so we're always walking that line on academics. But with that, we're going to move on to another subject, uh, still fertility, but bringing up Brian Pugh. Brian Pugh is our Eastern, Southeastern, Northeastern, all across agronomist. I don't know what region he's in and what day. Uh, but, but I tasked uh, Brian to let you know, I've tasked Brian with this um, and I knew it'd be hard. He's, he's kind of me like eight times, like I'm not sure. 
but he's got a phenomenal background in some of this work with potassium. And so I, I leaned on him pretty heavily for this talk, but uh, I, I think y'all are going to enjoy it. Well, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Uh, if you feel pressure, I want to filter that over there. Okay, so eight times is not correct. That was only seven. I kept track, okay? Only came to you seven times. So uh, again, we've got a topic here, maybe a little bit different uh, that we're gonna talk about here today. And, and it's really potassium, what we know about potassium in soybeans right now and where we go from here. And again, Brian said, let's stimulate some discussion. We want this to stimulate discussion. This may be a little bit outside of what our traditional recommendations are, but that's where we wanna be. I'm gonna apologize up front because I will tell you, this is kind of a disjointed PowerPoint to me. And I don't like those. I, I hate those PowerPoints like that. I like a PowerPoint that starts from the beginning and goes to the end. It's a nice story. I can pull you right through. And when we get to the end, we know what's happened. I'm just gonna tell you, this is not one of those, okay? <laughs> it's just not. But Brian said, hey, this needs to be a mechanistic view. So. If we look at it from that standpoint, that means that a lot of these different variables that are impacting K fertility, K nutrition of that soybean plant may not be dependent on other variables, okay? They may work independently. So if that's the case, maybe I'm gonna hit your goal with this. I hope so anyway. And you may have to tell me uh, what I'm doing wrong here. There we go, was that me? Okay, I'm gonna try to stay in front of the microphone. Can everybody hear me okay? I tend to have a little volume if I need it. Again, real quick introduction. Uh, again, potassium is now rec recognized as a yield limiting nutrient for soybean on silt and sandy loam soils pretty much all across soybean growing areas. This hasn't always been the case back when I was in grad school. Uh, actually, K deficiencies in soybeans were fairly rare. We weren't seeing a whole lot of those my first year of grad school, and I'll date myself here in 2001. And by a couple summers later, we could drive down the highways over in the Delta, about one out of every seven or eight fields of soybeans, I could point out there and say, hey, there's visible K deficiency symptoms out there, and sure enough, it was. So we were seeing a lot of this K deficiency roll on us pretty quick. I think the most confusing thing for us as definitely as researchers is there's lots of frequent re reports at this point in time from university researchers, from agronomists that are out there in the field uh, that there's K deficiency symptoms showing up maybe in a K sufficient soil. Has anybody seen that? We take a soil test, K sufficiency level is good, but we're still seeing deficiency symptoms. Nobody's seen that? or vice versa, okay? Maybe uh, we're getting no response on a K-deficient soil. Why is that happening? So I think that's what I'm gonna try to address today is you know what's going on behind the scenes there. I hope I'm not going back too basic, but we're gonna go over some uh, basic elements of potassium in the soil and potassium in the plant and how that affects potassium nutrition. So this is kind of opening up that can of worms, Brian. Uh, should we consider complicating soil test recommendations? And, and that's basically what we're looking at talking about here today. We know we have that soil test K. We've got a certain critical level that we need to be at to hit a certain yield. The question is, do we want to start adding in a whole lot of this other stuff? Soil test, uh, soil supplying power, plant demand, normal environmental conditions, unusual weather that might crop up, those droughts, those saturated soil conditions or maybe even man-made issues. And I'll cover a few more of those as we get in here. Why is this important? I think it's important because again, we see maybe with soybeans, we're starting to lag a little bit behind what we've been able to do with corn over the last 60 or 70 years. And I will touch on this briefly as we go in. My humble opinion, I think a lot of this is physiological in nature and it has to do with nutrient uptake from the soybean plant itself. Okay, so how many of y'all are ready for a review of soil fertility? Nobody raised their hand. Okay, well, I told Brian I only had one slide that really mattered, so I guess we could just jump forward to that one slide. Again, I think it's important for us to understand what we're seeing in a soil test and what the plant sees as far as picking up potassium. 
I wish my pointer would work, but it won't. Yes, it will. Okay. This is going to be difficult for me to be able to see and talk in the microphone at the same time, but this is the one I really want you to focus on. That's that soil solution potassium. And that's where the plant is taking up most of the potassium from the soil. So that's free potassium ions floating around in the soil solution, okay? And that's very important because that's buffered by that next pool of potassium, which is this exchangeable K. Those K ions are absorbed on the outside of a soil particle, okay? And they are readily plant available, but they're not available today. It takes a little bit more time to see some buffering. If we look at this soil solution potassium, all we're really looking at is somewhere around 0.1 to 2% of the total potassium that's in the soil. So it's not very much if we look at total K. Then if we look at the exchangeable potassium or the K that's somewhat plant available over the next few weeks or the next month or so, that is being buffered by the non-exchangeable K. And this is that non-exchangeable, also called fixed K. It's held in a clay lattice. It's held in between these soil particles. Plants basically can't get to it for this growing season. All right, so again, if we look at exchangeable and non-exchangeable K, that's about one to 10% of the K that's in the soil. So what you're seeing is that a big portion of what's in the soil as far as potassium is in mineral K. It's in basically rock form that hasn't been weathered down yet. So we do have a lot of long-term supplying power of potassium in the soil. What I want you to understand here today though is when we take a soil test, a Malik 3 soil test, we are trying to characterize how much potassium is readily available in the near term, in the growing season. And that's essentially looking at the amount of soil solution K and exchangeable K that's there, okay? Does that make sense? Everybody knew that? Is that a good refresher? I hope so. Okay, some of the things that are gonna influence soil K availability, there's a lot of them. This is not a comprehensive list. I just put some together that were off the top of my head. What is the current soil moisture right now? Okay, that, typically we see that the better the soil moisture is right now, that was a rhetorical question. I know the soil moisture is pretty low right now, right? Typically, the higher we see that soil moisture go, the easier it is for those plants to get to that potassium, and we're going to come back to that here in a second. Historic rainfall, parent material of the soil, pH differences, clay type, ammonium applications. So when we start looking at clay type, is it a two-to-one or a one-to-one -one mineral? If it's a two-to-one, is it a high shrink swell? That really dictates the amount of potassium that's gonna be readily available uh, in the near term. And I don't know, Brian probably knows better than I do. I don't think we run into a whole lot of the high shrink swell two to ones in Oklahoma, do we? Yeah. Yes, okay. So you, we do have some of those, I guess. That might be something you need to consider. What type of clay do we have there? Ammonium applications is another one. Any nitrogen fertilizer we put down that can convert or is in an ammonium form can actually bind potassium into that clay lattice and make it temporarily unavailable. CEC is real important. How many of y'all are starting to hear more about CEC? I think the reason I'm hearing more about it is for our new crop that everybody's wanting to grow in Oklahoma and they want CEC values. But CEC is important to tell us the supplying power of potassium in that soil. And then ETC, what does that stand for? That just means et cetera. There's so many more, okay? Y'all thought that was some soil property, didn't you? All right, K uptake. This is the slide. This is the one slide if you take anything home, I want it to be this, and then I'm gonna speed up a little bit and move on through this. K is relatively immobile in the soil. Now it does have potential to leach downwards, we know that, and it does move quite a bit more than say phosphorus does, but we consider it to be immobile. There's two major forms of K transport in the soil to get a K ion from out here in the soil to that plant root. We're not gonna talk about physiological, uh, the physiology of nutrient uptake. We're gonna talk about how to get the K to the root. The first one is diffusion. Diffusion occurs on that moisture film around a small soil particle, okay? And it's fairly slow process. And you can imagine if we've got good soil moisture and all these soil particles are stacked together, those moisture films are doing what? They're touching. It's pretty easy to move that K ion through there, through the gradient, through a concentration gradient of diffusion. If we get dry, that doesn't happen. 
So again, it's about 90% of K uptake in an upland soil. It's not that way when we get into a saturated soil or at field capacity. Uh, we can touch on that here in just a little bit. So what we're talking about is that ion can move 0.01 to 0.1 centimeters per day. So as you can see, it moves, but it doesn't move a whole lot. The other way that we can uptake is mass flow. And the way to think about that is just movement of soil solution through micropores, even micropores. Uh, and it can move quite a bit more. And actually there's been some research done there that it can move up to 10 centimeters a day. So we're getting up to four inches of movement there. That's a way to move potassium a pretty good ways. And it's usually only about 10% of K uptake. But with some of my background in rice, what I will tell you is we see diffusion and mass flow are about 50-50 in a rice field. Now, how many of y'all grow rice? How many of your growers grow rice? Nobody, right? I know one guy at Spiral, Oklahoma that'll grow some every five or six years. But what I want you to understand is the closer we get to field capacity, the more we could rely on some mass flow for uptake, okay? Again, since K diffusion occurs with only a few millimeters of a plant root, K that is further away than that, it may be in a plant available form, but it's just positionally unavailable. So that's what we're dealing with with a soybean plant, trying to pick up these potassium ions is getting a root close enough, diffusion can occur. I won't spend much time here just other than to say that pH is important for potassium, maybe not quite as much so as phosphorus. I don't know if Brian's, I guess Brian stepped out maybe. I tend to think a lot more about phosphorus when I get into low pH or high pH with some of the compounds we can form. Uh, but anytime we get below a pH of about six, we do start to affect availability of K. Here's a, just a good example of what we've traditionally been able to look at. And this worked really well 30 or 40 years ago. And it was basically looking at anywhere on the Eastern side of the state, you know, we've had highly weathered soils. We get a lot of rainfall. Potassium levels are typically what? Low. Anywhere on the western side of the state, less rainfall, less weathering. Potassium levels are typically higher. The problem is we're seeing that change definitely here in the last decade or two. So we're seeing a lot more low K levels out west. And a lot of that could be attributed to, again, mining those nutrients from the soil. So as we look at these intensive cropping scenarios, we're willing to maybe put a lot of nitrogen down. Of course, soybeans fixing its own. We can pull a lot of potassium uh, on a per acre basis year after year. And we essentially outrun that supplying power of that non-exchangeable K and that mineral K fraction. Does that make sense? Okay, review of K functions in plants. Brian, keep me on track on time here. I know Brian's gonna get up here at the conclusion and we're gonna, we're gonna have a good little discussion. Uh, but again, remember K does not make up any compound in the plant. It's only the K ion by itself. And that's pretty unique amongst all of our nutrients. Whoa, I swear I didn't hit that button that fast. It is active in over 60 critical enzymes. Okay, and that's one of the most important things that when I look at potassium, nitrate reductase is a good example for all of you out in Western Oklahoma. If you wanna lower nitrates in the sorghum Sudan family, make sure your potassium levels are good. When we have that nitrate reductase enzyme, that lowers that. It does directly affect photosynthetic efficiency, translocation of sugars within the plant, uh, as well as offers improved disease and pest resistance. It does aid in lignification of vascular bundles in the stem, so it gives it straw strength. You know, that's a good, good way to keep wheat from lodging and things like that is to have sufficient K. And then here's my favorite. Here's the one I always talk about to people, drought tolerance. That's probably the biggest thing that K can give you. And there's various reasons for that, but it is essential for normal transpiration and directly controls the actual stomata themselves. That's how we open and close those stomata is with the potassium ion. So now getting into the nitty gritty, let's talk a little bit about what we're seeing here. Nutrient removal, just how much potassium do we remove from an acre of soil with a soybean crop? Everybody all already knew this, I'm sure. We're looking at about 170 pound per acre uptake on a 60 bushel soybean crop. That's quite a bit of K. And if we harvest that grain, we're taking about 70 
pounds off with the grain, okay? So again, harvest index of about 46%. So that's quite a bit of K that we're removing on an annual basis, especially if we're removing all the above ground uh, biomass. And that's why we tend to see a lot of issues on crops maybe where we're belling hay. Uh, we're really pushing, we're growing sorghum sudan or Bermuda grass, we're really pushing it hard. We can mine potassium down in three or four years to a very deficient level. What about K demand from the plant? When does soybean want optimal or maximum K uptake? And again, this is a nice curve. This came uh, from some researchers up in uh, one of the I states and what they're showing you here, this is basically the amount of K that that plant's taken up as we progress through the season. What I really want you to pick up on here is somewhere around this Oh, full flowering stage. That's where we really start to get into very active potassium uptake. And that rolls on through past full flower R2 all on into R5, somewhere in there, R4 to R5 is where a lot of that potassium has already been taken up by the plant. So if we characterize that, we say most of the K uptake of the soybean plant is really needed somewhere in that reproductive stage, early to mid reproductive stages. And then we can actually get some partitioning of potassium that was in leaves, that was in stems. We can move some of that K into the developing grain at the end of seed fill as well. Now this to me starts to tell a pretty good story about soybeans. And it goes back to that graph that I showed you, you know, why is soybeans kind of lagging behind the advancements we've seen in corn. And I said, I think a lot of it's physiological in nature. And there might be someone that argues with me on that. Brian might want to argue with me on that. But I will tell you that we're dealing with a totally different physiological root system on soybean than what we deal with on corn or wheat or a lot of our other crops. If you look at this study here, they looked at, this was Central Great Plains. They had basically soybean and they used fill pea as a comparison. They looked at root distribution measured at nine inches and 44 inch depth at late bloom and mid pod field. What they found is that the water deficit, so they looked at it under irrigation with no water stress, or they looked at it with just normal rainfall. They didn't see any differences in root distribution through that root profile because of water stress. So what does that tell you? Is soybean good at going down and finding moisture if we're in a dry year? Absolutely not. Okay, 97% of the roots were in the surface nine inches of soil in that study. Contrast that to the irrigated uh, fill pea, 80% was in the top nine inches. Non-irrigated, which was rainfall fed, only 66% of the root system was in the top nine inches. So fill pea, a legume, very good at going down deep, trying to find more moisture and therefore being able to find more nutrients as well. So keep that in mind. And then the big one for me is this root surface area. My advisor did a lot of work on cultivar differences in rice and in wheat actually on root surface areas and how that changes nutrient uptake. And if you read that bottom bullet point right there, what you see is soybean was about 10 times less root surface area per kilogram of mass than what field pea was. So what that tells you is we have a root system that really when we get in dry times, not only is it harder for the plant to pick up the K because the K is not diffusing to the root, we just don't simply have as many root hairs out there to pick K up. Okay, real quick on this one, Brian said put this in. This is rice, by the way. Normally I would not put this in here in a winter crop school at OSU, but I, but I did it. I guess, yeah, you're welcome. So this was some of my data that I worked on again when I was in grad school on rice. The reason I put this here is, again, we, we do see a gradient. We do see a trend that as we get into field capacity or saturated soil conditions, K availability is higher for that plant. What I really want you to focus on though, this is Malik 3K measured the same way we do here at OSU. This is soil solution K. Now, we'll tell you one of the differences with rice compared to soybeans is active uptake is in early vegetative growth. That's when a lot of K is taken up by the rice plant compared to soybean. Well, what you're going to notice is when active uptake occurs, what happens to Malik 3 soil test K pretty rapidly? Drops, doesn't it? 
We're depleting that exchangeable or that ready, readily available K fairly quickly. And again, we're doing that through this soil solution and the malic three or the, excuse me, the exchangeable K is buffering that soil solution K. So I just wanted to give that to you because I want you to understand what would we expect to happen in a very dry condition? Would we see that same trend? We would see the levels decrease, but it wouldn't be near as rapid, right? We're not depleting that soil near as fast when we're in drier conditions. Okay, jumping on through this here, let's talk a little bit about what we've been seeing lately. This is kind of the textbook K deficiency symptoms that you're gonna see. Everybody talks about brown spot in legumes. We tend to see that in alfalfa. A lot of times we don't see that in soybeans though. Most of the time what we see when we see K deficiency on soybeans in the vegetative stage, is we're gonna see something like this up here, marginal chlorosis, okay? That's the number one key. Edges of those leaves will be chlorotic in very severe K deficiency. We may start to see some necrosis on those leaf edges. And Brian, if I'm starting to see deficiency in early vegetative growth that looks like this, what does that tell me about my K level in the soil? Yeah, I'm probably extremely low. I've probably been neglecting the last four or five years what I should have been doing which is taking a soil test and putting out K. I don't want to see visible symptoms that early in the growing period because I said earlier, maximum uptake rate of K occurs when in the soybean life cycle? Reproductive, right? Once we get to reproductive growth. So what about that? What about reproductive growth? This is one here that we actually saw uh, Dr. Arnold, Dr. Lofton, we were up at Ottawa County at a soybean field day this fall, late summer, and I took that picture right there on one of the rows. One thing you're gonna notice different is when we get that soybean plant into that reproductive period, it is so focused on partitioning and moving potassium to that emerging pod and to that newly filling grain that it will forego sending potassium to the youngest growth. So all of us in here have heard K is mobile in the plant. It always goes to the youngest growth, right? You're always going to see deficiency on the oldest, lowest leaves, correct? Except for when we get into that reproductive growth stage. Most states now are identifying this. There's still a couple that are arguing about what it truly is, but I think most now believe it is K deficiency that's occurring. One of the things you might keep in mind, those symptoms are often gonna be seen on that, that first, if you're starting at the top of the plant going down, the first fully developed trifoliate. That's where you're gonna see that yellowing, that marginal chlorosis. Okay, and then we've also got this scenario, which is soybean top dieback. Uh, seeing a lot of this in other states. Uh, researchers starting to bring this up something very common that you see. I've had a couple of fields where I've seen this before in the last few years. What we're seeing at this point, what we're thinking we're seeing here is this is either an extremely deficient K spot. So we're, we're really short in the plant on the amount of K that we have, or there's multiple things going on here. We're drought stressing the plant. There's not enough moisture to move K to that root system. Maybe there's soybean cyst ne nematode and we've reduced the root's ability to uptake nutrients. So there's usually multiple things going on if you start seeing this tattered appearance, appearance in the upper leaves. Why are we seeing more K deficiency? Again, I think a lot of it is overall, we've improved our management, especially over the last 20 years. You know, that's why we're all here. We're
Yeah. Most studies do show that broadcast applications, so we can still get good updates as long as we get around. And I will, you know, I'll go into some of that. But yeah, if I'm saying that in vegetative growth, that worries me because that's really going to be that might be a a soil K index of sixty ppm, fifty ppm, something like that. You're good. You keep going. I'm follow up, so you got all the time in the world. You want to keep going yeah, you're good. Okay. All right. Let's see. Yeah, I'm seeing it very early in the season that that throws me. I'm trying to be patient. Okay, I start over. You want me to start? Hey, I just have to do this for the rest of my talk. Yeah, that's what we are doing right now. Sorry about that. Not your fault. Fluffy Soul Syndrome, anybody heard of that? Okay. This is kind of a little thing I used to say. Again, drought is a really good thing. To and I always say, is it drought in this case? So, what I have to simply plant some less able things. Thank you. 
water down and you'll get hot, dry, clean conditions. Investigation. They start grinding out on some. Years that fell into this, but hitting hunger. Everybody heard of hitting hunger? I know everybody's heard of luxury consumption, right? Luxury mm -hmm. consumption means the plants don't think. What is also a phenomenon called hidden hunger. Symptoms, but it is sufficient enough. I always go back to the soul test. First step, good. Okay, so same time of year, Brown says. Sample, say three, four, five weeks later. What would my K levels look like? What if I sample in the fall versus the spring? Or I try to compare one year. Okay, that's very important. We do. So we want to monitor that correct depth. If you think it might be potassium, consider sampling that separately. Okay, we can do some comparison. Yeah, and it's something off the top. We can compare the two different spots in the field to figure out. Threshold starts the decision making process. Again, so test A next to 250. And so that doesn't mean. Now, the question I get is can we still be confident in our soil test? What do you think? Can we? Yes? No? Brian says yes. I said. Value. So, critical value is where we get 95%. I'm not looking at actual you know, I'm looking at sufficient. How much is that? 112, right? Okay, so that tells me I should be hitting 95. Here's a study. This is from our neighbors over at East University of Arkansas. 34 seconds of data from zero to 148. Mega 3 came range from 46 to 167 ppm, which was 59 to 100 percent of yield. All those factors today. So, what does that tell us? As our soul test any index keeps going lower, what happens to our probabilities of response? I want to do that. Well, we talked about that some. Again, 91 to 130 pp. 60% response when phase. 
So again, we don't always get the response we think we should. We look across indeterminate versus determinate, group fours, group fives, soil test K, Malik 3 soil test K was still the best way to get the most accurate answer. They found the critical K concentration was 108 to 114 ppm, depending on the model they looked at. What did we say our number was for OSU? 112, right? Which would be 250 on the K index. So I feel like we're pretty in line with a lot of other states doing some pretty intensive soybean work. Okay, the next step, set up those monitoring sites. If you've got those areas, you think they're starting to maybe show some hidden hunger, pay deficiency, make that a monitoring area that we can go in. Brian would be glad, I know, to come out or have a county educator come out and put a K-rich strip on that area. Let's see if we can see some differences there. We can run a combine across here. We can harvest it and see if we had yield differences. Here's a big one for me. Keep a nutrient budget. How many producers you think sat down and think about that every year? How many actual bushels did I pull off that field per acre? And how many pounds of P and K was that? You think a lot of them do that? No, but that's a great way to stay ahead of deplenish, or excuse me, depleting nutrient supply in your soil so keep track of how much you're taking on. Scout those fields routinely. And then here we go. We get into tissue sampling. I think, Mike, that was you that asked that, wasn't it? So this is where maybe we're going to verge off a little bit and get into a point of discussion and be a nice segue for Brian to get up here. But I would say, especially for those marginal soils, and how do we know we're on a marginal K soil? I just told you in the last slide. Come on, somebody throw me a bone here. Soil test. That's what you said, wasn't it? He gets a bonus. He gets a door prize here. Yeah, we use the soil test to know where we fall at. Are we over sufficiency? Are we below that critical level? Are we extremely deficient? That's, that's the first step. The second step, though, could be to determine hidden hunger, trifoliate or petiole tissue sample. And I will tell you, there's a pretty good video University of Arkansas has up that talks about the process of sampling that if you're interested. Uh, and I'll show you some data on that right here. This was some work that was done. Again, my old advisor worked on some of this. But they basically looked at different growth stages from R2 all the way on up to R6. What was their sufficient, critical, and deficient concentrations in that trifoliate and petiole and according to him he feels like he's very confident in their ability in those stages of the plant's growth to predict k nutrient status for those marginal k soils so that's those soils that we really don't know are we going to get a response or not right this would be that next step to see do we think we'll get a response on it before we're too late because we can go in here and do this sampling in r2 when does most of active K uptake occur for soybeans? Starting when? Two. So if Mother Nature's good to us, we can go in, top dress K, get a rain on it, get it in the plant. Basically, again, how you sample, it's just that top fully expanded trifoliate. You can split that in two. You've got the trifoliate, the petiole in the other hand. They can look at both of those because there are different concentrations of K for each of those. A lot of universities are looking at this now. I'm, again, I know University of Arkansas, LSU, uh, University of Kentucky, North Carolina, and, and a couple of the I states are actually looking at this. Purdue is one of them as a, a really good means to identify those marginal soils that might not be showing classic K deficiency symptoms. University of Arkansas and LSU identified a critical value of less than 15 ppm. So that's one and a half percent in that trifoliate leaf at R2. That's kind of their threshold. 
And they've also done some work on seed K concentration at harvest by node. And what I'm being told there, it's not all been published yet. But that is a way, if you're willing to wait until harvest, they feel they have really good correlation between K concentration in the seed at each node at harvest and what the K status of that soil is and therefore what the yield is going to be. So that might be a new one that's coming down the road as well. All right, I'm going to wrap this up at this point. I've probably spent too much time here. Uh, but again, in conclusion, a base knowledge of that K. How, how does it react in the soil and how does it react in the plant? I think that gives us a better understanding of why we're seeing some of these K deficiencies. Okay, and here's a big thing that I try to point out to producers. If you're in a water deficit, you're most likely in a K deficit as well. It's because K is linked to water that closely. Many K deficiency problems are occurring on soils with marginal K levels. You've got to monitor that and stay ahead of K removal. That's the easiest way. I will tell you from my forage background as well, I started some trials uh, over at University of Arkansas before I left. They took those 10 or 12 years. Within four to five years, we were able to take a K index of 350 down to 40 to 50, just by putting 250 pounds of end down and harvesting all that biomass off every year. We can mine that K out so fast. Keep track of those nutrients and where they're going so you know what your status is. Soil testing is still a great tool, again, it's probably the best tool we have just for identifying soils that are really gonna give us that response that we wanna see from fertility. A nutrient budget can help us track K. We should begin considering ways to assess this hidden hunger because it's a real problem. And if we've got hidden hunger for four or five, six years and we don't see it, guess what happens on year seven? we start seeing visual symptoms and then we're really starting to get in the hole at that point. So again, if we can start to identify this hidden hunger symptom and when it's occurring, it's gonna put us ahead of the game on K management. Couple of the knowledge gaps that we got up there, how will factors other than soil test K begin to shape our K recommendations? And again, there's a lot of them. We don't wanna make things so complicated for producers that it's hard to follow. But I think we're getting into a point in time if we really want to keep stair-stepping yields up, we have to start looking at some of these other issues that affect K availability. How can we improve our predictions for K response on marginal K soils? Again, maybe it's tissue testing. Maybe we'll figure out it's something else. And then how can we accurately identify that hidden hunt? Questions? <laughs> Mm, I'd be pretty careful with that with soybean. Brian's probably got a better number than I do, but. Yeah. Two, three pounds. It's row spacing and salt. So salt content or row spacing is how many will take that vegetable and row spacing will take that. If you go there on row, you want to go on two weeks spacing, you can put a whole lot down. If you want to be on 30, you better cut that. We have that for that. Soybean is pretty susceptible compared to other, other crops. Other questions? Okay, y'all are taking it easy on me because I had technical difficulties, right? All right, well, I guess that's my segue for Brian now. I appreciate it. Thank y'all. Have a good day. Who's that? All right, we're good to go. All right, so I'm watching about three things right now because that iPad that's streaming has 9% battery life. And so I'm trying to make sure virtual and you all have the same experience, which is wonderful because it's me, right? Somebody left, Mike left. I can always get a response out of Mike. Jerry May, nothing? Okay, fine. All right, <laughs> if we can bring up uh, that last. So I kind of brought mine in as a, a kind of a, thought it's going to be a little bit of a story uh, about what's going on maybe we're working on it we're getting there um, but we're going to talk about fertilizer prices of, of course I will tell you so while that's happening as you see we're going to have snacks down here during the poster session I learned a long time ago if you put food posters then people stay for posters Post festivities uh, for after the six o'clock. Um, maybe get our slides looking at the well. 
I'm ready for slides now, if you can get those going. Uh, at six o'clock, we're gonna open up. We'll have uh, snacks, hors d'oeuvres, and a bar right across. So it's all right here. So we don't have to go far if you wanna visit. Let's see here. Yeah, I'm waiting for the slides to come up on the screen. There we go. Awesome, okay, that's good. All right, well, what now? Uh, story, so this first part, how many of you have, well, we'll, we'll go in here. I had to change, whoa, yeah. I had to cover that up. You know, if you know this meme, you know what it said, and I didn't want to get fired this early. Um, so prices, they're ugly. How many of you have been paying attention? Not, I, I know y'all care, been paying attention to the price. That's not the question. And, and maybe unlike every other speaker, I get a show of hands. How many of you have actually been paying attention to why fertilizer prices are the way they are? Couple. All right, so you all may be able to correct me. I'm gonna do my little dance. And so this is gonna be a little bit of a story time on why we're sitting where we're at and uh, maybe give you indication on if we can have really good hopes for really cheap nitrogen spring of 22. Yeah, everybody laughed as you should. All right, so this isn't gonna be making anybody feel better, but. All right, so can you, um, can you back out and click? I've lost my advancing there we go all right so good follow uh if you're on twitter follow this guy right here uh he has a a daily blog or a newsletter he puts out that you have to pay for i'm not telling you to go buy his stuff but if you're on twitter this guy has daily updates on the fertilizer market and often hourly updates and i'm not talking about oh fertilizer price is high he will give you note, oh, a significant UK fertilizer plant not going to produce, or China is about to buy, or China's not to about to buy, or he's going into world fertilizer market hourly outcomes. What is fertilizer at Neola or at, at you know, New Orleans versus what the foreign market looks like and what does that mean? So this, this Josh, and I've had some communication, he is on his stuff and he does really well. So if you just enjoy that kind of, or want to be a glutton for punishment, good stuff there. Also, I utilize this as a good way to confirm or deny what I already heard. A lot of what I'm going to tell you is more of what I hear, right? This, I can't like give absolute facts, but I'm going to tell you what I've heard from talking to people that run the potash mines and run the phosphate mines and run the fertilizer plants. Uh, but this was a pretty good one, fb.org. Too many to count factors driving fertilizer price higher and higher. That is it. We're not looking at one thing. We're not looking at five things. We're looking at a continuous crap storm of stuff that happens to the fertilizer marketplace. It's just ongoing, rolling, fun times. So with that, FOSS was the first. So we can actually track it by the product, by the why, and by the how if we look at the fertilizer prices. So FOSS was the first one that really started taking up. And now you might have thought it was potash, but it was FOSS took the first leap. That first leak coming around January, February, and it plateaued out around March about the same time potash went up. And you'll see the potash numbers later, but we took that first spike. Uh, and then you see again, a later spike, you'll see that November, uh, December. So the one on the map, I didn't have anything past October, but you see kind of getting into November, the phosphorus prices started going back up with the 10340. Uh, I do follow the DTN price charts pretty well. They do a great job of lining this out. Uh, so what pushed FOSS along? COVID. The, all the many things about COVID, that was the first one that really hit the FOSS market. Uh, An interesting aspect, it was a twofold deal, is COVID started impacting the plants. But it wasn't just the plant workers that COVID was impacting. Think about stuff that happened. When we went into significant COVID in, in March, April, May, how much driving did we you do across the U.S. minus truck and toilet paper to places? A whole lot less. You know what the number one product that is utilized that doesn't come out of mine in creating phosphate fertilizer? Sulfuric acid. Where do we get sulfuric acid? It's a byproduct from the, the petroleum industry. 
Petroleum industry doesn't start, doesn't produce petroleum because there's not a need. There's no sulfuric acid to build fertilizer. And now it's not necessarily that we don't have FOSS to build the fertilizer with. We don't have an easy supply of sulfuric acid to provide to create the FOSS, phosphate. So it was really, that was the first kitchen in the get up is that sulfuric acid line is that we started shutting down the petroleum production because nobody was traveling. There weren't jet engines running, planes running, all this stuff. And so their constant supply of sulfuric dried up. Their cost of getting sulfuric that they were once getting as effectively as a byproduct, now they were getting produced sulfuric, not byproduct sulfuric. So that's the first rise in the phosphorus market. It didn't help that there was a countervailing uh, in the works. And you can dig more into this. How many heard about the, the mosaic countervailing suit? Couple? All right, so this is non-political, but it's all about the politics. The, pol the current state of politics at that time completely allowed for this. And I'm not saying it's bad or wrong or in, in unright. I'm just telling you the facts of the matter is that because we're protecting our US commodities, it allowed for this to happen a lot quicker than ever. Because what countervailing was is basically mosaic saying, you know what, we mine in Florida. We got to pay a crap ton of money to fix everything we do. Those folks over in Africa and Morocco, they leave big old holes in the ground and they don't have to do anything. It's not fair. Help us sell our product, be more competitive. It's tough to argue, right? Until they lobby 25 to 30% tax on all tariffs on all imported fertilizer, except for Australia, which at the time already has its own tariff. It's called diesel. And so immediately, Mosaic or OCP, one of the largest producers, had barges sitting in the Ola and other places. They just sent it to Canada or down south. You see a spike coming around the same time that passed. Oh, by the way, the day that that passed, there were other things that will come up later in this conversation when we start talking about nitrogen. But that didn't help. It lobbied basically 25% tariff on the 50 to 80, 50 to 60 percent of the phosphorus that we apply or that we put out in the uh, U.S. So we got that happening. Potash. Potash happened in June or July. Now this one's a little bit harder for me to get at. There's a lot of storylines that I followed on this one and, and you can argue with me and I'm not going to say you're wrong. There's a couple happening. One, we're coming in out of COVID. So the potash mines start ramping back up. Potash mines had to lay off or at least put off a lot of their workers during that time. So during COVID, the number of workers. Current reports that I got, this was in the summer, so this is coming in August. They have the 70% of workers they put off to the side, didn't lay off, you know, hope to come back. Only 15 to 10, 10 to 15% returned. Most of these mines were operating with people that hadn't been on the job for more than 12 months, most of them under six months, and the majority of the workers were one month in. Machines were breaking and nobody even knew what machines did, much less how to repair them. That slowed down a lot of the production out of New Mexico and other areas. Then we have the whole transport production, transport issues. we got a whole lot of stuff going. And then our friends up in Canada that have their mine that's about a one mile, it goes between 0.95 miles to 1.1 mile below ground, which goes through an underground ocean. And they freeze that ocean to keep it from leaking down below. It's true, they, they drill, drilled right through a freaking underground aquifer. And so they freeze the, freeze the ground where they're bringing it up. They started leaking to the point where they couldn't quite control it anymore. So the Saskatchewan mine started having significant leakage. And I'm gonna tell you, if you have water leaking into a thing that's nothing but potassium chloride, walls and such, it's not a pleasant thing. I wouldn't wanna be down there with, with much moisture. And so now one of our top producing mines in Canada start having issues. That's why we're opening up new mines. They're sinking a new hole. Uh, it was already taking them about an hour and a half to get to the mine face every day. And so they were, they were thinking about sinking a new hole. So that will open back up. Again, if, if I'm wrong, if you've heard better things, you can, you can argue that's fine. This is just what I know. Transport and other things. Oh, nitrogen. There's a lot of words you can tie with this one, isn't there? Um, yeah, February, wow. So 
we've got February 21, February 22, data inning, we, we're looking at projecting out. Um, yeah, November just skyrocketed. So let's talk a little bit about that. It actually started back in 2011 in, in that Texas storm. This was the beginning. This is what I'm talking about. This was the beginning of the one little thing that led to another little thing that led to another little thing. Those Texans liked their natural gas when it was cold, and we sent everything we had down to them. Any, by the way, you know how nitrogen fertilizer is made? They take atmospheric nitrogen, make it really, really hot, and add a whole lot of pressure to it and turn it into ammonia gas. How do you get heat and pressure in Oklahoma or anywhere? Natural gas. What's heat in Texas? Natural gas. Certain fertilizer manufacturers had a significant amount of natural gas sitting around when Texas needed it. So they liquidated most, of, if not all, supplies going down to Texas. Now, at that same time, how, how good was the oil field going? Was there just a boom going out there in February in the Oklahoma oil field? Nope. Production, not really ramping up. So we had issues there with the building that back up. That did come into play. Uh, so that historic weather, this last one, the gas crisis forces two UK plants to halt work. That wasn't done in February 21. This is the last month. Effectively, a lot of our foreign producers are looking at prices that are just insane for their natural gas. And so they're just shutting down. They're saying, you know what? We're out. Multiple UK plants, multiple Russian plants start to shut down because of the cost of gas going into the winter. They're saying, oh, sorry, we're out. Uh, at the time, so we look at Chinese exports. There was a time that uh, got really worried. We had a price hike because China stopped exporting nitrogen. It's because their own local product was so high that the farmers couldn't afford it. So they stopped exports so that they'd start fertilizing China ground. Then they opened it back up. So we got all this happening. This whole thing is coming in and it's playing out and it is playing out ugly. And that's why I'm saying if you're hoping that January 1st, all of a sudden fertilizer price drops back down to 33 cents a pound of N. Just keep walking. I know this is this is this was just released. Um, shoot, I think I just pulled this off two days ago. This was Josh. This is the German. We get a fair amount of nitrogen from Germany, UK, Russia, and that. This is their cost. That's not their fertilizer price. That's their that's basically their power price, their energy cost. We're luckily going back down. So this is our, if you look the one on the near month, that's US. But look at it, Western Europe and the UK, their prices are going, we just all across the board, the energy costs, that spike that happened uh, is gonna hurt. And guess what? We're getting into winter. And if we actually hit winter, it's not gonna help anything. I don't know what else to title this besides it's not going to help. This was another countervailing anti-dumping uh, uh, act placed because guess what happened the day after Mosaic won their suit? Our nitrogen fertilizer companies saw that, you know what, maybe we should do the same with Russian, Russian nitrogen. And so they applied for uh, countervailing and anti-dumping against Russian nitrogen. By the way, we get a fair amount of our nitrogen from Russia, Trinidad, and Tobago, like a lot. You already know about the issues with ports getting Christmas presents, getting stuff in, getting products in. That's where our fertilizer comes to. Ports are having issues there. That's a whole nother story if you want to talk about the, the port issue. But at least commodity groups are seeing this and they're yelling at it. So National Corn Growers, I don't know what this really means for National Corn Growers to say we're disappointed in you, fertilizer people. I mean, I guess it's like shame on you, but we're not going to do anything about it, I guess. But there is, there's actually looking to be some suits against the fertilizer companies doing all this stuff. But, you know, it, it's, it's what our times are right now. And I don't have a better answer or anything besides that. Uh, it's not looking good. I'm just going to flat out tell you guys, I hope and I pray that fertilizer prices start coming down. But I'm not going to stake my reputation to tell you that fertilizer prices are going to come down anytime soon, especially not in the spring. Our corn acres estimates, unless something changes, corn estimated corn acres in the corn belt are big. And guess what drives fertilizer price along with natural gas price? Corn price and corn acres. It's it's gonna be it's gonna be a tight spring. 
this is everybody's like down you ready to go drink now and not later um it depends on who you talk but i've heard 98 million that's it's big numbers it's, it's whether you believe them or not but who knows? I mean, if we see this, are we going to see corn acres go down in the corn belt because nitrogen price is high, or are we going to see less nitrogen and corn acres stay there? There's been a fair amount of prepaid, but I've talked to a bunch of corn farmers in Illinois and those other places that the prepaid played fall, the prepaid fault applied anhydrous was big. Absolutely, they did a big chunk of that prepaid fall applied. But because of environmental conditions, there has been a big shift in the corn belt to, to spring applied. And those numbers are not, there's still a significant amount of corn farmers that, that have nitrogen not bought. What was the corn acre left? I, I, I'm gonna, what's that? Nine, two. So, so I, don't, I don't know, I'm, I'm the soil scientist trying to tell you about fertilizer marketing, just telling you that it's, it's rough uh, and it will slightly improve maybe, but I'm not gonna say it's going to. We'll get through this, it'll come back around. But I've got a couple minutes and so I'm gonna make you listen to me about my research. I just wanted to give a couple points of things that, that you guys need to keep. Uh, Raiden and, and Michaela already showed this one, but it's important. Y'all, if we aren't soil testing, Right now, when fertilizer is a buck a pound of N and, and potash and phosphorus where they are, and we're fertilizing blindly without a, fer a soil sample in the last five to 10 years, if you're fertilizing ground and haven't had a soil sample in 15 years, I'm sorry, but shame the hell on you. Even a composite, something to give some kind of status on where you're at and judging that. But that soil sample should be the basis of what we do. Now, it's not the gospel. You, I love what Pew said, and I wanted him to, is because we can understand that our soil tests are a chemical evaluation of a biological process. Are they flawed? Yes. Are they better than a wild guess? Yes. And so at least give you, give you a starting point to know where you're at. Soil pH, and, and I've, I've already seen Twitter, the piles of lime are blowing, and so the neighbors are getting the lime. Um, I'm sure that's true. Maybe they should apply the line before it started blowing, but soil pH is going, it is a kicker. It is important. It is important on your herbicide. By the way, I'm not a weed scientist, but is herbicide getting cheaper? No. Soil pH and herbicide have a very significant interaction. And if we're not applying herbicide to proper soil pH, you can just assume that your herbicides are not working as effective as they should or you need to know about those rotations. PNK, here's my take home on PNK. There are absolute reasons, and I know a lot of you consultants utilize replacement rates in your PNK, and I have no, no qualms about that when we get above a certain yield threshold. Have no qualms. You start growing big crops, and you start this mass balance of removing more P than you're applying, more K and you have drawdown, completely get that. This year, if FOSS is still in the 70 and 80 cents a pound and potassium still in that range, I think it's a decent year to walk away from replacement, but you do not walk away from sufficiency. We've got enough research that shows at least sufficiency will yield you maximum yield. Unless something happens in the soil that you can't control like, like uh, clay plants or things like that, the soil test will get you to what you need. This is not a replacement year. And I would, I would hazard to guess not many are doing really quick buildup this year either. But look at how you're doing your recs, because if you're doing push button recs, if you're going through SST or you're going through a company, pretty sure you've got some replacement built in. And if you're trying to cut your producers a little bit of slack, you might look at readjusting how you do those replacement recs for PNK. If your phosphorus recommendation changes based upon yield, you're doing replacement. If your potassium recommendation changes based upon yield, you're doing replacement. I'm not saying that's bad, but this is probably not the year. So take a look at how those numbers are mapped out, how you crunch those. It's an opportunity to help the producer who's trying to figure out, take that money and put it somewhere else that's needed this year. We'll get to nitrogen. Don't skip the P and K. Do it smarter. Do it, do it 
run that air seeder as a variable rate applicator, get it in the ground. Don't be broadcast spreading FOSS this year. Put it as a band, use that air seeder, use something. I know, Mike, we're going to have to broadcast PNK. I get it, but if you're going to short it, that air seeder is an amazing variable rate applicator. That grain drill is amazing, very puts it in the soil in a concentrated band. It's right there. If you can't do it in, in one pass, do it in two passes, there will be inefficiencies to gain. Um, we know that we can maximize yield using sufficiency, especially with phosphorus cross crops. You know what, in potassium, we're pretty good about it too, unless there's a soil thing. So don't doubt Oklahoma State, Kansas State, TAMU, whoever it is you're getting those sufficiency numbers from. They are good on the average. We're not make, going to make it lose yield. Yep. Are you guys any work with those air drills on buying urea and standing weeds? So are we doing any work with an air seeder applying urea and standing wheat? And I will tell you, I have been trying to get somebody to give me a free mini air seeder for a long time to do that work. I need one about eight to nine foot wide air seeder applicator. So if you can work on that, Mike, we don't, but I could tell you what it'd do. I mean, I can dump anhydrous in and standing wheat. I'm not worried about urea. Don't go in with one of those hoe drills and tear it up. But if you've got something to slow disturbance, Get it slightly off-road, and you can put your in the ground. We've done a lot of work. In fact, Brent Bala, former master's student, that was his master's thesis, was to look at the influence of drilled nitrogen using a grain drill, not even no-till. We were using box, John Deere box drills, right, Brent? Just to put it in the ground, and guess what? If conditions were conducive to loss, it was amazing. If it was a good, if it was a good time to apply fertilizer anyways, it didn't matter. Kind of like OMBPTs oh, or those urease inhibitors. If there's lost pathways, it helped. If there's no lost pathways, it was is about a neutral response. But in some cases, some really good. So don't skip. Maybe be a little bit uh, creative in how we're doing things. FOSS impact. I just want to get to this. This is crazy. I just want to note it. So this is some stuff done at Lamont. Some low P, low K. I'm not even go through the data, but what we're looking at is for double crop. P and K, when was the best time? Do we want to put double crop fertility on in the front with the wheat? Do we want to top dress the wheat with the double crops P and K, or do we want to put it on in front of that soybean going in the ground in the summer? This is just wheat yields and ignore that other than this was a low pH. We're talking about the pH was a 5.4, uh, Malik 3 PPM, so it's 18, low P, low K, acidic. My best yielding plot in the wheat was when we top dress phosphorus had a little bit down front and the soybeans, phosphorus we put on top dress actually increased yield. And that's that number 10. It was statistically better about anything else we did. So yes, Mike, it made money. But in that case, we were able to go after the fact and fix a phosphorus deficiency. Not something I expect to say very often, but we're having good range in the spring. We got out there, it's probably about mid, late February got it on, and it was triple superphosphate, 0460, 18460 would have done the same. So I'm saying if you see a deficiency or you didn't take care of it pre-plant and we got a good spring coming out and getting warm, it might be something to look at if you've got good wheat prices and a good stand to bring it out of that, that, that condition. K is in mobile, I'm gonna move, I don't wanna get there. My last line is exactly what Brian, I want Brian to say. Hey, don't forget it. If you got a deep sand, guess what? There's also chlorine. And so our deep sands out west, those chlorines, especially you've got value in that chlorine. I have seen that. Also, K, it's more than just chemistry. Don't blame the soil test if it doesn't work all the time. If you're if you got a four foot tall soybean plant and your roots go two inches in the ground, don't blame the soil test on being bad. Because that's happened a lot. I mean, it, there's other things. It's more than just chemistry, so let's work. We can top dress. By the way, those beans, Brian, came back that top dress K. I, on all those, those soybeans that Brian showed, I top dressed it with K when it was about that big. So uh, it's about eight inches tall. We gained 15 bushel from that. And by the way, it was a 25 bushel crop. So without K, it was 10 bushel, and with K, it's 25 bushel. And so, yes, we could get in there when the crop was going, spread some KCL and get a win. Free plant versus all season. This is going to be one of my last comments. I know we're running free plant. I know it's a thing, but we don't have to. 
33 locations, 31 locations responded to nitrogen this across a lot of years. Two of them, the grain was better out of 31 with pre-plant nitrogen. Seven, the grain was better if you did all in season. Protein 21 was better. This is basically saying pre-plant would have won two times all in season. I mean, everything in late February, March would have won seven times. Everything else, it didn't matter. Grain wise, protein wise, it mattered 21 out of 33 times. So that's telling me if you didn't get your nitrogen on now, I don't care. Let's see what comes out of this, this dry spell. Starts raining in January, February or March, that's fine. We were fertilizing up to well after peak six, call us in, getting everything back. We don't have to go early. We have full and absolute capability to fertilize for a very long period of time. And even when you're deficient, we can be deficient for three months and come right out. That yellow wheat out in Northwest Oklahoma around Alva that didn't get free plant, I'm not worried about it. Let it start raining, let's put on some nitrogen, let's run. It's fine, it's good to go. We can, wheat's tough, it can be deficient, it can come right back. In fact, I think it's going to be better. I'd rather have deficient wheat right now some of that big green stuff that's starting to suffer and turn blue. Grain only, I know forage guys, you need it, but grain only, I am liking me some small spring wheat. I mean liking wheat being small in the spring. I'd much rather come into February 1st with a smaller, smaller crop of a good stand than big lush stuff that could get burned up or burned back. I ended early to give us time have time for questions. My battery's about dead online. I don't know if those guys are still going or not. Um, are there questions for me? Say that again. What number do you use for like let's say P205 raising some beds or something? Gotcha. So P205, if I if I'm running, if I want to increase, how much do I increase soil? How much do I apply to increase soil test by one PPM? It'd be either K2 or P205. K2, it's a, it's a, it's, I can't remember off the top. I know on P205, uh, for one PPM, it's seven. Now that's an average. If you're at a two, it's going to take 12 to 15. If you're at a 25 PPM, it's going to take five or six. So it's a magnitude. The lower your soil test, the more it takes to fulfill the calcium and magnesium and aluminum. Uh, as you get closer to that critical, it takes a little bit less. But on average, seven for uh, P205, and, and I had K20 in my head the other day, and I just I lost. I think it's around 15. I can't remember what it is. You have lime on the ground. Already got wheat planted. Hmm? You know, wheat's wheat done, or you're going to try to plant some of the lime on the ground? If I had lime out in a pile and the wheat's growing, I, I'd get it on and let it rain. It depends on the, any nitrogen management. I mean, it's, there are, all, I've heard of before of getting that pH shock, but I think we can handle it and just get that lime spread instead of letting that pile turn to rock. I have no research that proves that you can't spread it in season. All right, with that, so. Group two, we have the group two inhibitor, uh, ALS inhibitors. So these would be things like amazomox, chlorosulfuron, uh, you know, anything that's that's in the group two, your MEs and, and your sulfonylureas. Uh, of course, you use quite a few of these in wheat, uh, you use some in corn, um, a few in soybean. Then you have group one ACCase inhibitors. Uh, so things like select, uh, aggressor, Quite a number of group one herbicides using wheat and then the fourth mode of action to get it just over half is the group five ps2 inhibitors so things like atrazine metribuzin and but again you know this is four modes of action more than 50 percent of the global market for herbicides that's a lot of selection pressure on very few target sites you have one two three four different enzymes in the plant that are under the selection pressure here and then if you add two more, so your group 15, so this is things like metolachlor, pyroxysulfone, 
and then group four oxen, things like 2,4-D and dicamba, you know, then you're at almost three quarters of the total market on six modes of action, six uh, different sites. A lot of different cases of herbicide resistant weeds globally, uh, over 500, and then occurring in 263 species, both grasses and dicots, broadleaves. And we've got resistance to 23 of the 26 known herbicide sites of action in a lot of different countries and, and a lot of different crops. So it's a big issue, you know, in the U.S. and around the world. But again, this the, you can boil it down pretty simply that we use not that many herbicides to do most of our weed management. And it's just a, a lot of individuals, a lot of opportunity for genetic variation that can survive these different herbicides. This graph is from the, the weedscience.org survey that Ian Heap runs. And you can see here the increase over time for resistance to different mode of action groups. And you wouldn't be surprised to see that the top four lines are also the top four modes of action that I just showed you based on the market use data. So the more it gets used, the more resistance we have. Uh, group nine is glyphosate. And so you can see it did take more than 20 years after its introduction to start to see resistance. So that was a really rare one initially. But then, you know, it goes up and now it is the, the fourth most uh, resistance by number of species. And again, that's not the, the only way to measure it because, you know, it's, one species might have a huge distribution and a huge impact, but it, it's kind of one way we can get a sense of the picture. Group one, so your ACCAs inhibitors, grass killers, and your group five, um, things like atrazine, those are the first ones to be reported with resistance. And group two is the most resistance risk, the ALS inhibitors. So you can see that from their introduction in the early 80s, right away, a lot of resistance in the steepest line. Big issue across crops, but especially in wheat, corn, rice, and soybean, and cotton, you know, where uh, production is highly mechanized and uh, no-till is uh, reduced tillage, very popular to help, of course, all the benefits for soil health and soil and water conservation. We have to control the weeds. And uh, so if you're not using tillage or relying on herbicides for a lot of that weed management, again, the selection pressure can be much higher. see sorry For some reason my slides not advancing right now ah uh, yeah sorry I had a few too many animations the computers are running a little slowly so um, yeah on this last slide I just want to point out the the kind of historical trends of, of resistance so again triazine resistance in the 60s ALS and ACCAS resistance starting in the 80s of course, Roundup Ready introduced in the U.S. in 96. The first case of Roundup resistance was in the other use of, you know, the more traditional use of glyphosate at that time that had been in orchards and fallow. So we see roughly, when you look at Roundup resistance, it's roughly equally in uh, kind of those fallow and orchard uses as well as in the cropping systems where you have the Roundup Ready trait. But then the glyphosate resistance uh, kind of trend line occurred. And again, you can see the top most used herbicide groups here. Now, when we talk about mechanisms, like I said, any trait that slows down and prevents the herbicide from reaching the site of action or reduces its toxic effect once it gets there. So what does that mean? You know, we're talking about the physiology and uh, biochemistry of the plant. We have two umbrellas that we can think of. One is a target site resistance. Each of these herbicides has some kind of protein in the plant that it binds to, and that's called its target site. That protein is encoded by a gene. And you know the genes are the instructions in the DNA to make all the proteins that make up the plant. So in that target site gene, you can have a mutation and that can change something about the enzyme so that the herbicide no longer binds to it or not as well. And this can be as simple as just changing one amino acid in that protein structure can make it so the herbicide will no longer bind or get where it needs to go within that protein. You can also have uh, increased expression or amplification of the gene. And um, this is a way in which you can get more of the protein there. So it takes more herbicide to overcome it. The thing about target site resistance is that it's specific to one mode of action group. And I'll come back to, again, you know, why do you care about resistance mechanisms? You can care because it helps you 
manage resistance. When we talk about managing resistance, it's delaying it or help reducing it from having such a severe effect. And target site resistance mechanisms are good to understand because that resistance mutation only gives resistance to herbicides in that group, in that mode of action group, not to unrelated ones. The next group of resistance mechanisms, however, does have the issue, um, just wait for the computer to catch up here. I think you know, we're having a, a high wind day here on, on the front range in Colorado, and I think that must be just uh, slowing down the electronics a bit. Um, so the, the, as a, we're waiting for it to come up, the next site is called non-target site. So this is anything that is on the way for the herbicide to get where it's going. You think about when you're spraying herbicides, it's got to land, if, if we're talking about a post-emergence herbicide, it's got to land on the leaf. It needs to translocate all the way uh, into the leaf to get in inside the cell. So it's got to through the, go through the waxy cuticle. It's got to pass a cell wall, cell membrane. Then it might even need to get into the chloroplast to where it actually has its activity. And when that's the case, there are a lot of potential barriers the plant might be able to put up. Uh, it could kind of capture the herbicide and store it in the vacuole. It can have enzymes that will break down the herbicide so it's no longer toxic. And these are the same kind of enzymes in people. Uh, if you take a, a drug, a medicine, uh, your liver has enzymes that break that down over time. Uh, so it, it kind of removes it from your body. Well, plants can do the same thing with herbicides. So a lot of crops are tolerant to herbicides because they can break down the herbicide really quickly and the weeds don't. But weeds can sometimes uh, have variations for that kind of mechanism so that they can break down the herbicide quickly. Um, and so again, this is what we call non-target site resistance. Enhanced metabolism is where they break it down quickly. Altered translocation, this can be, you know, the herbicide doesn't move around as well as it should. Glyphosate as a herbicide is one that moves really well in the plant. And there are actually mechanisms where the plant, uh, the herbicide is absorbed into the leaf, but it doesn't move where it needs to go. There are also some mechanisms called rapid necrosis. So this is where you apply the herbicide and the leaves die so quickly that uh, the plant actually can kind of drop them off, just like a lizard dropping its tail when it gets scared and it can run away from a predator. Uh, the plant can drop the leaves so quickly that the herbicide's not absorbed and moved to the rest of the plant. There's a case of this for glyphosate resistance in giant ragweed, also a case for uh, 2,4-D resistance in a horseweed species that's in Brazil. So the thing with non-target site is that, especially the enhanced metabolism, it can give you potential for cross resistance across different groups. So for example, resistance to both the group 27 HPVD inhibitors, as well as the group four synthetic auxins, or you know, perhaps across both group two ALS inhibitors and group one ACCAs inhibitors. And this is where we have a lot more to understand, but just know that the plant can break down the herbicide and if it starts doing that fast enough, it lives. And that's kind of what gets selected for in the enhanced metabolism. And what about multiple resistance? This can either occur through this enhanced metabolism or plants can accumulate multiple mechanisms. A lot of our weeds, think of ryegrass, uh, palmer amaranth, water hemp, they cross pollinate. So they can kind of swap resistance genes and build up multiple resistance genes within one plant. And that's what you see in this graph here is weed species with resistance to more than one side of action over the years, you know, two, um, got a lot of species with that, three, four, five different modes of action, six. And again, for our most uh, difficult species like Italian ryegrass, like palm and the water hemp, this is uh, unfortunately the trend is that you get uh, this buildup within a species, within a population, within individuals of resistance to multiple herbicides. And that's what you can see in this graph on the right is resistance to multiple sites of action within a population. So that means within this population, you know, two, three, four, five different herbicide modes of action would not work. So this can really start to limit options, obviously, for, for management. And again, this is because of cross-pollination, the multiple mechanisms combined. This is showing Palmer amaranth with male and female flowers. So, you know, 
species like palmer amaranth and water hemp have incredible genetic diversity and really respond quickly for resistance. This paper is a, a recent one showing water hemp from Illinois that what within one population is resistant to these five side of action groups. So your ALS inhibitors, PPO inhibitors, atrazine, PS2 inhibitor, HPBD, so mesotrione, and 2,4-D. And in this case, there's no history of 2,4-D use. So it's something of these other herbicides selected a non-target site mechanism giving resistance to 2,4-D. The same group has also just recently published a paper that uh, this population is also resistant to dicamba. So uh, it just shows you that the non-target site resistance is, is really a challenge. This is a photo of a different 2,4-D resistant water hemp population. This one is from Western Nebraska. And uh, in various research, uh, including some we've worked on at CSU, it's been found that this is uh, one of the enhanced metabolism resistance mechanisms. So there's a gene called cytochrome P450. It's a gene that uh, plants have a lot of them, 300 to 400 versions of this, this protein. And that's how they can, they both make a lot of compounds that protect them from insects, for example, as well as they can break down compounds that might be toxic to them, including herbicides. So we've studied this and we know that it's, uh, it's reversible by some P450 inhibitors, and, uh, but that's what's happening. They rapidly break down 2,4-D. Also, there's this example of uh, another water hemp population from Illinois that's resistant to esmetolachlor, group 15. And uh, so it's doing that through enhanced metabolism. It can break it down quickly, just like corn breaks down metolachlor very quickly. Uh, so now it does this water hemp population. It's also multiple resistant to other herbicides. So the problem of multiple resistance, again, of course, we're getting less weed control and yield loss, using additional herbicides and more management for increased cost. When these weeds are surviving, they're getting more seed production, building up the seed bank, leading to long-term problems, and ultimately this decreases profitability and threatens food production. These graphs are uh, the reported U.S. herbicide use data that Andrew Kniss at University of Wyoming put together. And you can see that, uh, so this is the trend over time for use of glyphosate and other herbicides and the total herbicide use. So when a uh, soybean is kind of the best example to look at, uh, introduced in 1996 for the Roundup Ready trade, you can see glyphosate was used a little bit, kind of pre-planned burn down. And then um, over time, that use of glyphosate is going up in terms of number of treatments per year, of course, and the use of other herbicides going down. So things like your PPO inhibitors, lactofen, for example, ALS inhibitors uh, like imazepir um, in soybean going down. And then uh, around you know, the mid 2000s, and we start to see glyphosate resistance becoming more common. Glyphosate stays there, but the other herbicides are coming back up, right? And the total number of treatments going up. So this is where this increased cost is. And of course, people are paying the trade fee. They're still getting weed management out of glyphosate for a lot of weeds, but they're also using other herbicides for uh, the, the other weed control. So it's just, you know, you can kind of see this relationship that uh, with resistance, costs you more and it's more complicated. To help illustrate the point that resistance does exist in, in the weed populations before you use herbicides. So it's, it's clear to, important to understand that herbicides do not kind of induce resistance or you know you don't apply a low rate and the plants sort of get stressed and then they can figure it out. But in fact, these resistance mutations are in populations. And this uh, example is just a, a really cool one in that this is black grass, so it's a grass weed and wheat. It's very common in France, Western Europe. They have these old collections in the museum herbariums, and they went between 1788 and 1975 when these were collected, before, of course, any group one herbicides were used. And they found that there's a mutation in, a, in a, one of these grass plants in a museum in France that was collected in 1888 that would give resistance to both the fops and the dims in group one. So it shows you, again, resistance is there before herbicides are used. If we use the same mode of action over and over, it's going to increase in, in the population. So to give you a sense of metabolic and target site issues around the world, um, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but 
uh, each continent, you know, soybean production in Brazil, six modes of action. You're probably familiar with Palmer amaranth and water hemp, seven modes of action resistance reported in the US. Uh, black grass in Europe has seven modes of action reported. Barnyard grass, uh, which I'm sure you're dealing with as well, has 10 modes of action resistance reported around the world, not all necessarily in one place. And then annual ryegrass, Lolium rigidum, uh, which, you know, very closely related to Italian ryegrass has 14 modes of action of resistance reported in the world. That's it's essentially every herbicide that's ever been introduced to control it, hey, you, you can find a resistance somewhere. So it's uh, certainly a global problem. Again, wherever there's mechanized farming and uh, use of herbicides in wheat. Now, this is kind of a question that um, this is Anita Cooper. She's a PhD student who worked with me and now uh, she's at Bayer Crop Science. Why, again, is multiple resistance a problem? You know, in the past, new herbicides got discovered very often. And so this graph that she's put together is kind of what you call viable options in U.S. soybean and corn. So how many different herbicide modes of action are there for, uh, for a given weed, for example, Palmer amaranth? And uh, then this red line is the year of the first resistance report to that mode of action in Palmer amaranth. So understanding, of course, this doesn't mean every Palmer amaranth has a resistance. Uh, it doesn't mean that, you know, that herbicide is off the table. But you can see that at the moment, there's one mode of action for which resistance is not, that is available in soybean and corn in the U.S. as a registered product for which there's not a reported uh, resistance. And you can see that the slope of this line, particularly over the last 15 years, is a lot steeper than the slope of this line, right? You know, one new mode of action getting introduced in, in the last 20 years. So what that means, you know, we've got to have smart use of chemicals, uh, rotating and mixing our, our modes of action. And of, of course, using non-chemical weed control techniques as well. Anything you can do for a competitive crop, cover crops, help reduce the seed bank, Harvest weed seed control is, is really important because this herbicide innovation rate is just very limited and there may, may be some new ones, but they're not going to come very fast and, and uh, we really have to work in, in the space that we're in. So how to do that? Of course, IPM and, and that's the theme of this section. And for weeds, you know, it's often considered a wicked problem, the economics, you know, it costs more to manage resistance, or maybe there just aren't registered options. Um, but we can think about creative mixtures and, and look at emerging technologies, non-chemical management, and also think about identification, monitoring, prevention uh, as well as part of the whole IPM picture. Um, I'm thinking that, you know, I'm kind of up uh, getting close to the time here. I want to tell you a little bit about species identification when it comes to that, because um, in some places in the country, Palmer amaranth is listed as a prohibited noxious weed. And in others, of course, it's not. It's just there. It's been a problem for quite some time. But the problem is that if you're producing seed, say like a pollinator seed mix or something to sell somewhere else, it's really hard to identify this, the pigweed seeds and cells from each other. So we've uh, developed some diagnostic assays. You can see here, you know, red root, water hemp, palm ramran, smooth pigweed, really similar and very hard to tell apart, as are the seedlings. So we can extract the DNA from these, and we have a DNA marker in which we can detect uh, even one palm ramran seed and up to 50 total pigweed seeds, you know, in this case, water hemp. And uh, look for it in seed mixtures um, or in grain for export. I was like this photo. This is one from uh, Bayer looking at a, a cotton picker, and you've got palm amaranth growing out of the back of it. So obviously a pretty tough plant. But um, we have these markers for palm amaranth and for water hemp. So it's a, another thing we can do to just help make sure we're not moving seeds around. Um, when we're thinking about uh, yeah. So this is the more recent paper published on it where even we're more sensitive down to uh, one Palmer Amaran than uh, 200. Um, so again, it's a, a nice sensitive DNA marker and, and pretty inexpensive to run. Diagnosing resistance is, is also kind of a, a costly issue. So we can do a greenhouse assay like you see here and, and you can measure the resistant plants, compare them to susceptible plants, but this takes time. If you've ever sent in a sample, 
uh, for monitoring. It, it really takes time and it's quite expensive. Different groups, this is a group at Syngenta that developed a agro seed germination assay so you can kind of test the plants quite quickly, in this case for panoxidin resistance. Um, other labs can do things to actually measure those metabolites when I was talking about enhanced metabolism. So uh, in that case, you can pick up, okay, yeah, this plant is breaking it down quickly, it's probably resistant. Uh, but again, you know, relatively expensive and a bit time consuming. Genotyping, just like I mentioned for species identification, we can do that for these target site mutations. For example, ACCase and ALS mutations uh, can be done. So that is a, a nice way that you can monitor. We have another DNA-based assay. In this case, uh, talk about glyphosate resistant kochia. It actually has extra copies of the gene, so it makes more protein. And so we can measure that either the gene level or the RNA level. This is something we do pretty often. Uh, crop consultants in Colorado and Nebraska, Wyoming, will send in a piece of kochia leaf to the lab, and we can run this DNA test in a few days and get the answer back to say, yes, those plants have extra EPSPS copies, they are glyphosate resistant, or no, they're not. Maybe it was more of an application problem. Generally, they do show up as resistant when people send those samples in. And this is just the data that you can see where uh, they have you know, six to eight copies as opposed to one. Um, so it's, it's definitely something that we, we can test for. Do this with sugar beet growers as well. So you can see here samples in Wyoming and Western Nebraska that we've tested that have this increased gene copy number. And this I especially wanted to show you because this has some data from uh, Texas Panhandle, Oklahoma, and Western Kansas. So we've been working with groups uh, all around the region and Montana as well, Idaho, Oregon. So look at glyphosate resistant kochia. And without getting into the details too much, we can have a, a DNA marker to have kind of a DNA fingerprint for where this kochia originated from. We found there's a version of it that is kind of from the, the Southern Great Plains. And that's the first one that it seems to have originated in Western Kansas. Then we have a different version that appears to have occurred in uh, kind of Northern Montana and Canada. And then a third version that appears to have occurred independently in Oregon and Idaho. So we're trying to understand how these are organized, but they all have these extra copies of the target gene and we can, um, investigate them that way. So in addition to you know, knowing that it's resistant, we can learn something about how it moves around. This also can tell us things about, yeah, the kochia really tumbles a, while, a lot. Are we getting movement uh, maybe in custom harvesters or in planting? These are all the kind of things we need to think about. We can measure the RNA for metabolic resistance. This is just an example of these P450 genes that they're increased to so diagnose resistance that way. Finally, the best resistance diagnostic, if we can get there, is the protein. So, you know, we probably have all seen too many of these lately with COVID, antibody, rapid tests, but uh, you can, in this case, this is one for resistance. This is one of these metabolism genes called a GST in black grass, and they, they can actually just crush up a little bit of leaf and put it in here, and you have a control line that lights up, and if you get the other line, you have a lot of that protein and, and it's resistant. So maybe we can get to that point where a crop consultant can go out in the field and have this kind of test kit to test for herbicide resistance. The last thing I want to mention is uh, the use of mixtures. So even sometimes when you have resistance, here's a case of uh, clethodin um, select. You, you, know, you have resistance to a high rate as well as resistance to butro butroxidin, but you put them together and they're not resistant. So this is something that, you know, at the research level we can do uh, to understand, okay, resistance to one herbicide, even these are within the same mode of action group, uh, but perhaps there are ways in which uh, these kind of mixtures can, can help. And this is just a bit more data as well on some of the pre-emergence herbicides for ryegrass that, uh, for example, putting prosulfocarb and uh, triolate together controls populations that are resistant to prosulfocarb and triolate uh, separately. So there can be some hope and herbicide discovery is also happening. Um, you know, a few discovered recently, we won't go into the, the details on those, but you know, there are some new products and, and as well, uh, there's definitely a lot of investment in this area to help uh, get us there. Uh, but we don't want to rely only on uh, new, new discoveries because as you can see here, multiple resistance 
is increasing. I think that's the take home message for you and it's increasing faster than we discovered new herbicides. Metabolic resistance is an issue because of this potential for cross resistance that we still need to learn more about. We need good stewardship, therefore, to, for our available uh, resources. And that's, you know, harvest weed seed control, driving down the seed bank, all, all these things in IPM. And the testing as, as part of IPM monitoring can help us know resistance patterns. By understanding the resistance mechanism, we can have lab-based methods that can be pretty fast and, and not too expensive compared to a greenhouse assay, as well as testing some kinds of mixtures to, to find new, new options, and as well monitoring both our seed trade and our grain export so that uh, you know we know grain growers can be penalized at export if, if there's contamination of certain weed, speed, weed seeds or herbicide resistant seeds. Certainly it's a big problem, you know, the economics are huge and uh, the, the innovation that people are working on in addition to herbicide discovery is how to knock out that enhanced metabolism and, and even uh, work on maybe gene silencing. Uh, so just like you see RNAi and, and corn products now for Western corn rootworm, could we do something like that in weeds? And I think that's where, you know, partly the field is going as well as, of course, precision applications, monitoring, uh, you know, all robotics. There's definitely exciting things going on in the weed side. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, again, you can see my email here if you'd like to contact me or on Twitter, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you may have. And just, um, I'm not sure, I know when uh, Misha, you were introducing me, I didn't hear the sound in the room. So I'm just thinking if uh, anybody's talking right now, the, the sound is off. Todd, I'm gonna, if you can mute for a second. Sorry, two audio feeds don't work. Can you mute on that side? All right, so uh, let's show Todd uh, appreciation and thanks for having me. Any questions as we, as we move on? No. Todd, thank you so much for your time and your ability to do this for us. We greatly appreciate it. This might be the first one at Crossco that we had two Colorado State profs presenting. So uh, I think we're going to keep it going. It's been a good, good series. Uh, next, we have uh, Kelsey. You want to make your way up, please? So, Kelsey, Kelsey I'm going to get your name wrong, so I apologize. Uh, Ona Four? Ona Frey? Ona Ono Free. I still did it wrong, but we're getting closer. All right. We'll just leave this here. Mike should be good. We can lower this down. Here is your clicker. Mm -hmm. Okay, hi everyone. Good to see you all. So sorry you're hearing me so late here. We're gonna talk about diseases at the end of the day. I know nobody likes to talk about diseases. But we're hopefully we'll have some um, some good discussion here. So I'm Kelsey Anderson and Nofri. I'm the lead and board pathologist at Kansas State, the new extension pathologist. I started there a couple years ago. So I'm grateful for the um, invitation here to talk about the moment. I have to confess to you all that this is my first time in Oklahoma. So I'm really embarrassed to say that I made the drive down from Manhattan. It looks great, so I'm excited to see you all and to learn more about Oklahoma, but um, hopefully I can talk a little bit about what we've been finding in Kansas, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. So if you have any questions, if I'm showing you some data, anything comes up, um, please feel free to raise your hand and hopefully we can have a good talk. So I would like to talk about fun side today. That's what I'm talking about a lot in Kansas, so that makes sense. And it was a big year for fun side to meet last year, so it should be a pretty timely topic. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about weed treatments too. So we've had some emerging issues in our weed seed that have made seed treatment of increasing importance in this region. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we go through. So here's my contact information. Please feel free to follow me on 
Twitter too. I put out a lot of information, hopefully timely updates about what's going on um, uh, with new diseases during the season and, and different programs that we have. So feel free to follow me there. So I'm going to talk about three diseases here that are pretty important and were especially pretty important this last year in Kansas and also this region. So anyone who was great for us in the week here? I think that, that was a pretty big problem in Oklahoma too, right? I was watching Bob Hunger's reports. I watched them like a hawk because whatever happens here definitely is coming to us in Kansas. So I got my eye on you uh, throughout the season. I'm going to talk about future and med life. So this is a disease that is becoming increasingly problematic in Kansas, and I believe this region as well, because we've got expanding coordinators. So this disease really loves corn and wheat. So we have a bad thing in corn and this is really good wheat. And we start to get problems when we get a lot of coordinators around our behaviors. I'm also going to talk about future and then I'm going to talk about common bun. So has anyone heard of common bun, thinking, smut, and wheat? Not the, not the coolest named disease, right? Thinking smut, but an emerging concern, especially in this part of the country. So we'll talk some more about it. That we can do about. So, when we first start talking about the right? so certain things, but it grows. And I think you're okay. You're okay. I need to do something. Do I need to move. No, nope. I... I'm going to ask you to do this for audio sake. Just kind of wrap that around your neck. Okay. Sorry about that. So, stripe rust gets its name because it grows in stripes. So, it's different than leaf rust. We'll look at that in a minute. And a, a great way to tell stripe rust from some other things is if you wipe your finger along the wheat leaf, you should get orange spores that, that wipe off on your hand. Um, if, if it's a really bad disease situation, you might be walking out of the field with, with orange boots. And that happened to me in some parts of Kansas this, this past year. This is a disease that really enjoys cool, wet weather. <clears throat> so we did have a lot of that in parts of Oklahoma and Kansas this past season. And we did have pockets of regions that were um, pretty severe. So stripe rust spores, they blow in every season, they don't survive here in Oklahoma or Kansas. They have to blow in um, every season. They survive here in Texas and in Mexico, and they hop fetch their way in the spring through Texas, through Oklahoma, and then they arrive in Kansas and work their way up through Nebraska and hit our friends in, in, in South Dakota and North Dakota. So we're watching Texas. <coughs> In Kansas, we're really watching you guys here in Oklahoma. And of course, what happens in Kansas also is very important for what happens in Nebraska and, and so on. So stripe rust, when we're talking about a couple of these diseases, and this is particularly important when we're thinking about the fungicide application, it can infect any time of the year, right? It can infect this time of the year. It can infect early in the spring. You can see those stripe rust um, pustules really at any point. But it's only going to cause very significant damage when you have infection on your flag leaf, right? So the flag leaf is the driver of a significant amount of our yield in wheat. And so that is really important for when we're timing our fungicide decision. And it's important, too, when we're thinking about our, our fungicide decision for stripe rust and for fusarium head blight, because the timing for those applications are different. So here, if we put on an application for stripe rust, we might we might be hurt for fusarium head blight later in the season, right? And this happened to a lot of our producers in Western Kansas this year. So Western Kansas is usually not a place where fusarium head blight is a problem. But this year we had unusually wet weather, we have higher corn acres, and that really did lead to some producers being caught off guard. So it's something going into this season, we're gonna have to be really watching for. So when we first see stripe rust, right, when we put, put out some of our first reports of finding this in the region, we'll see something like this. So we see those orange spores that are produced on the leaves and they grow typically in stripes. And hopefully that's all you see in your field. So hopefully it doesn't take off. So under very bad conditions, right, you might run into something that looks like this. So here we have um, almost 100% of the leaf area covered, right? So that's gonna be a pretty bad yield loss. Luckily, we've got really great wheat breeders in this region. I know we've got great wheat breeders here at Oklahoma State. I know we've got great wheat breeders at Kansas State, right? And they've been working a really long time on these issues. And so we often don't see this type of infection because we have a lot of genetics working in the background. Sometimes those resistance genes, they break, 
or they start to fade and we get populations that can overcome them, but the genetics will still do some heavy lifting. And that's really important for striped breast. This is um, actually a susceptible variety in one of my fungicide trials. So this is the border, right? You don't wanna see anything like that. Um, and I'll illustrate here that actually we have good genetics and our fungicides, they work really well for striped breast, right? We just gotta get them on. So here, a call I get a lot is, um, you know, diagnosing striped breast, pictures of striped breast. If you want to send me pictures of striped breast from Oklahoma, I would love that because I love to see it coming uh, before it gets to us in Kansas. But here you can see an untreated leaf. You, you see that classic striping and you see those classic spores. But sometimes I get pictures that actually look like this. So we have stripes, but no spores. What's that? That's an actual a leaf that was sprayed with a fungicide too late. So you start to get what, what we kind of can, can see are blank, blank stripes. So if you ran your finger along that, you wouldn't have any spores, but you can see that fungicide application, it went on late and the damage is done. So I can't recover the, the yield there, but it did arrest the infection. So I won't get any more infection, but that can be difficult to diagnose too. There's a couple other stresses that can result in that kind of damage. Um, but I sprayed that with fungicide, so I know that, that that's what happened there, right? So you can see that timing for the stripe rust application is really important. You don't want to hit it too late. So when we're thinking about that stripe rust fungicide application, the real time that we want to start applying and not before is that FEX9 time point. So that's when my flag leaf is fully extended. I don't want to go too early. I'll show some data that illustrates that but I could go on later, right? So it's really at that point thinking about if there's disease pressure present and also if I'm going to maybe want to delay a bit so I can make a, a fusarium head blight fungicide application. And we'll talk about that in, in a moment. But really that flag leaf, when that flag leaf is out on most of my plants is the time we want to go on. So how do we make that decision for the stripe rust fungicide application, right? First, do I have a variety with resistance? So like I said, there are genetics in this region that can do a lot of the legwork for stripe rust, right? So if there's a variety that has um, maybe a rating of a three or a four or below, that might not be the best candidate to make the most money back from a fungicide application, right? So that would be my first, my first thought or the first question I ask a producer or one of my agents when they call. The second question is, has stripe rust been reported locally? So we in Kansas, and I know here are tracking stripe rust progression through the state. So we're watching that Southern border with Oklahoma like a hawk to see when that first arrival comes. And then we're reporting um, county observations after that. So if stripe rust has been reported locally, then I wanna check my weather, right? So we have some um, risk models that we'll run in Kansas that show if weather is conducive for stripe rust to develop. But those conditions, they're not rocket science, right? So we want to see if we have cool, wet weather. So we did have cool, wet weather in a lot of areas um, in Oklahoma and Kansas this year during that spring period when those flag leaves were out. And that's really the, the time that's, that's most dangerous for strike for us, right? And then we're going to really see a payoff. So like I mentioned, there are a lot of varieties in this region that do have some stripe rust resistance, although it changes because we get those population shifts, right? So we get new populations that can overcome our resistance in the region. So at Kansas State, we publish a list of varieties. And the thing about this publication is that every year we screen multiple varieties in multiple locations under high disease pressure against the, the races of stripe rust that are most prevalent in our region. So here we update this every year. So in certain years, you might see in our, um, in our rating guides that something that was more resistant has become more susceptible. This happened with a Syngenta variety monument. So that resistance starts to slip. And then something um, that was more resistant might be a candidate for a fungicide application in subsequent years. So it's always good to check variety resistance ratings, especially time when we're thinking about that fungicide application. So this is the call I get um, for like three weeks around in, in April and May, what do I spray, right? Should I spray and what do I spray? Those are the biggest questions that I get asked. And people wanna know how effective are common fungicides for striped breast control, right? And so we wanna answer some of those questions, but 
they're being answered not just by us at K-State or the great extension pathologists here at, at Oklahoma State, but they're being answered by a big regional committee. So if you go to the Crop Protection Network, you'll see that there's a fungicide efficacy table for control of wheat diseases that's updated every year by a working group of pathologists. So every year we synthesize our data and we update this table with new products and new recommendations. And we publish this individually. So we publish the same table in our K-State publications. And I know Oklahoma publishes the same table in their Oklahoma publications, but it's all the same data because we work on it as a group. And here you can see for some of our major diseases, powdery mildew, Staginospora, Septoria, Stripe rust, Leaf rust, um, Stem rust, Head scab. You can see that uh, each of the ratings for those products. So if a product's good or very good in our trials, or if it's not labeled, so that's a, a key um, piece of information here. Um, you see some information about the harvest restrictions. So we'll talk a little bit more about the harvest restrictions when we get to talking about fusarium head blight here in a moment. And then we see the products and the active ingredients. So just a, a, a call out to that resource. It's really good. It's updated annually. And a lot of data actually goes into generating this, um, this publication. So in our, in our field at Kansas State, we also look at fungicide efficacy trials. And so we do this in a uniform protocol with multiple states so we can synthesize this data and update those, those tables and our recommendations. So this is um, some data that's from our, our part of the state around a Manhattan a location called Ashland Bottoms. So this was a location that actually had pretty bad stripe rust pressure this past season. And I, one thing that um, I do with my, re, my fungicide trials is I make sure that they're all tested against a, on a variety that's very susceptible, right? So we want to see how well these fungicides work, fungicides will work uh, independent of some of that, that genetics that can do some of the, the leg work. So this is a, a, just a comparison of a single um, flag leaf application. It was made when that flag leaf was out and a later application at early flowering, uh, not two applications, just those two in case there was fusarium head blight in that field, but there was not. We test a laundry list of products, right? So we've got your Nexacore, your Top Guard, your Preaxor, your Trivacro, your Delaro, your Quilt XL, Tilt, Tebustar, which is that kind of generic Tebuconazole product. Um, and then Prisaro and Moravis Ace at that later time point. Well, they all work really well. So there are some, you know, I wouldn't focus on the individual tree, um, product comparison. Where um, there were different rates on labels, we always went with an intermediate rate or we just went with the labeled rate here. So these are just labeled rates for each of these products. And you can see at the top is my non-treated check. So disease was very high in this field. We had about 80% disease on our, on our upper canopy. So that is definitely going to impact yield in, in wheat. And you can see my flag leaf applications, well, they did a really good job at controlling disease. There might be some individual treatment differences, but the, the point here is that all of these worked really well. And I would have really been happy if I got one of those fungicides on, any of those fungicides on uh, in a year like that with that high of natural pressure, right? Even my early flowering, a slightly later application um, worked really well, but getting it on on time at that flag leaf time point was uh, was the best scenario in this in this particular case. And why is that important? Well, we might be running into fungicide shortages this year, right? So we don't always have access to every product. And this is important to know for stripe rust. We'll talk. It's different for fusarium head blight, but for stripe rust, what we see is the difference between getting the fungicide on at the right time. Uh, and getting different products on individually just doesn't seem to be, um, be, be as, as big. And so what we're seeing uh, when we're thinking about the products is, is really what are we seeing when it comes to yield, right? So now I flipped my axes here. My non-treated check is on the bottom. We had pretty good yields at this location for us. Um, and you can see we had about 30% yield protection from even our, our, our lowest um, yielding treatment, right? And you can see that if we think about the economics of that, right? So say I have 30% yield protection. Well, that's a pretty big deal, right? I protected that flag leaf. 
and say that that resulted in about 20 bushels per acre, which it did in this case. So I got back 20 bushels per acre. So say I have a really a, a pretty good grain price, right, at 550 per bushel. Well, no matter my application cost, I was going to make my money back, right? So that was about $110 per acre that I, I saved there by applying really any of those products at that point, right? So getting that treatment on really paid in this particular year. And even if I only had 15% yield protection, in this case, if the grain price is reasonable at 550 per bushel and I get 10 bushels per acre um, back, still going to get 55 bushels per acre, right? And, and when we're thinking about our application costs in Kansas, they, they can be um, pretty reasonable. Even, even if you have the generic versus a more expensive product. So getting that product on is really, um, really the important message here. So I've been talking about fungicide timing and I do get this question a lot. Um, and, and this data, I think the point is to illustrate it's so important. So sometimes, I know we have issues, at least in our region, where we have to think about, you know, when the plane can actually fly on a product. So we have a ground rig, maybe we also have issues if we can't get into a field at a particular moment. But getting on at that, at that peak nine is really important, and I'll, I'll show you why. So this is a trial that we have going that assesses a couple things. One, how long a fungicide lasts. So we get that question a lot. Is this fungicide going to last through the end of the season and provide sufficient protection, right? But also we want to know about timing. So are we going to get yield protection by applying too early or, or, or is later in the season a better idea, right? So here we have a couple of varieties. I'm just going to present one location because I think it has a nice illustration. We have two timings. So peak seven, that's before the flag leaf is out. Right, so that flag leaf, when it emerges, most of these fungicide products, they don't translocate to the flag leaf, the, to the new tissue, right? So that flag leaf becomes um, unprotected when it emerges. If I apply my fungicide at peak seven, right? At peak nine, so that's when my flag leaves are all fully extended and I can provide um, protection to that flag leaf. And we compared a few different products. So a mixed mode of action product, Nexacor, Folicure, which is um, a single mode of action Tepipanasol product, uh, Top Guard, which is a single mode of action product as well, Headline, which is um, a representing some of our strobilurin fungicide uh, classes, and then we, we applied Prosaro as well. And one thing I want to uh, point out about this is we put this adjacent to our USDA striped breast nurseries. So the pressure in these nurseries is really high all year long. So we have no limitation of striped breast spores coming in and these uh, on these particular plots, right? So walk with me here. I'm going to show some some graphs, but hopefully it makes sense. And if it doesn't, just raise your hand and say like, hey, explain that again. So here in this first um, first kind of set of, of bars here, you're going to see our early applications of each of our fungicides. So this is at peak seven at that pre-flag leaf application. Then we've got our healthy control. So this is something I go in and I spray every two weeks with fungicide. So it's totally off label, but hopefully it doesn't get disease, right? So I'm spraying this all the time uh, to keep it clean. Here I've got my on time application. I'm calling it late here, but it's really on time. That's at peak nine. And then I have my, my no fungicide control. So that's what's gonna happen if I, I don't spray anything all year, right? So at this point, we're 13 days after that first fungicide application, right? So here we, we sprayed a fungicide application at that um, pre, pre flag leaf stage at peak seven here, and that's 13 days later. So we don't have a lot of disease here. And this is two days before that, um, that flag leaf application, right? So you're seeing we're starting to have some pressure um, in those untreated plots here. Um, uh, but, but really, we don't have much disease yet. It's starting to develop. So this is 29 days after that Fix 7 application. So here you can see that that unprotected flag leaf across our treatments really did have a high amount of disease, right? So if nothing else, this illustrates that putting that fungicide application on too early is really not going to provide um, provide the protection we're looking for, right? So that's compared to the untreated control. So that's 30 days later. So if we're thinking about stripe rust, right? We need about 
10 days from the time it infects the leaf until we start to see symptoms. So if we're thinking about how long our fungicides are lasting, we get some protection, and then we need about 10 days of an incubation period to start to see symptoms. So, so just, just add some, some information there. So then this is where we're at our flag leaf and we're, we're about two weeks later and all of those fungicides, well, they're, they're holding up really well. So here we are 36 days past our pre-flag leaf application and we're 21 days post our flag leaf application. So still very low disease, some breakthrough infection, but certainly not going to, um, to be yield limiting. Again, we have some um, uh, 27 days later, 42 days later um, for our, our peak seven. Well, it wasn't like putting water out on those plants, but I certainly wouldn't have made my money back if I had made that early fungicide application, right? So here the message is we really have enough protection from that flag leaf application in, in these locations to last us through the season. Here we are 27 days later. And that translates into yield. So here again is my healthy control. You can see that's our highest disease. I mean, our highest yield, sorry, disease yield. It's like late in the day for me here too. So I apologize. So there's our healthy control. And here's our untreated control. So no fungicides. You can see we have maybe a, a tiny bit of protection from that earlier application in some of our our treatments, but really the that flag leaf application made a lot of our money back. Very similar to what we saw in those efficacy trials, right? So that's a lot of graphs to tell you that you need to apply at that flag leaf or later to provide some some yield protection. So in 2022. We should be prepared for fungicide shortages, right? So we're talking about this in our winter meetings in Kansas. I'm not sure if we're talking about this here, but you can't always get the product. But the good news is that a lot of these products work very well. There's different reasons for choosing different fungicides, um, uh, but, but really the timing is, is very important when we're talking about yield protection, right? We want that full flag leaf extension. So I'm gonna to switch to another disease, Fusarium head blight here. So like I mentioned, there's a sister disease called um, gibberella ear rot in corn, gibberella ear rot, fusarium head blight caused or scab caused by the same pathogens. They get cooking in that system, that rotation system, and it's hard to get them out. Um, so if we're going in corn, wheat rotations, or we're near a corn uh, wheat rotation, that's when we can get in trouble with fusarium head blight. So when we are looking at fusarium head blight, we see these characteristic bleach spikelets. They can start anywhere on the wheat spike. So sometimes we compare this to frost damage. There's other things that can cause our wheat heads to bleach. Uh, but fusarium head blight is characteristic in that they'll bleach individual spikelets. And sometimes you'll see a, a salmon colored uh, spore on, on the outside. So that, that orangey spore that will form under high humidity and that's really diagnostic of fusarium head blight. We are only concerned about fusarium head blight during the flowering period. So you can have spores and you can have really conducive weather pre-flowering, but if you don't have that perfect weather during flowering, it's not as big of a concern, right? So that flowering window is the only time we can get infection from fusarium head blight. That makes, a really, um, that makes it really critical to apply the fungicides in the right timing for this particular disease, right? There are varieties that have resistance, although in Kansas we have a, just a small um, number of varieties that, that actually do carry resistance to fusarium head blight. And that fungicide application in terms of management can be made at this very specific growth stage, so early flowering or later, um, until we butt up against our, our pre-harvest intervals on our products, right? So one of the problems, there's a few problems with fusarium head blight. So it causes the visual symptoms, um, but it also causes what we call tombstone or lightweight kernels here. So a lot of chalky kernels that you'll see. So that lowers uh, yield and it lowers test weight. Ooh. Oh no. So we're gonna start from the beginning. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't know what I did there. And one of the other problems, when we're thinking about fusarium head blight is the mycotoxin that it produces, DON, deoxynevalanol, sometimes called vomit toxin, results in feed refusal. 
in cattle, um, can be harmful to humans as well, and is, um, uh, is regulated at the federal level, uh, but also can result in, in discounts uh, at the elevator. So there's a button here that I will try not to hit again that caused that to happen. Um, so we wanna control not only the disease, but it's really important to also control that toxin and controlling just the visual severity or the visual disease does not always control the toxin. So sometimes we have disproportionately high toxin levels uh, compared to our actual disease, right? So we have a couple different things we have to think through when we're thinking about the fusarium head light fungicide application. So again, we want to think about our resistance. So there have been uh, several studies that have been done that have shown in meta-analyses across multiple years in multiple locations that the combination of fungicide and um, genetics is going to result in your highest yield gain for fusarium head light control. Um, but when we're thinking about our individual farm level decision, right, we really want to think about FHB um, and SCAB and if it's been an issue on our farm in the past. Now, some of our Western Kansas producers got caught off guard this year. They just didn't know they had such high pressure locally. Um, and I think that it's an emerging concern, not only in, Can in Western Kansas, but in parts of Oklahoma as well, um, because of the increase in, in some corn acreage, right? So it's something that we just need to keep our, our, um, our, our, our eyes on going into the future. And then we need to think about that conducive weather. So the weather um, has to be rainy and cool during that flowering wi window. So rainfall during that flowering window is critical. And I'll show you how we can assess that in a moment. And then we probably will get um, a spray that pays off, right? So when we're thinking about this fungicide decision, it's really important to get it on at that flowering time point. So when we have our anthers visible, and then we can go check the weather. So has anyone been to this website, wheatscab.psu.edu? So this is an awesome resource that's probably two decades of, of um, research in the making. And it basically project, projects the risk of fusarium head light in, in most of our wheat growing regions, right? So you can see Oklahoma there um, as well. And so it's really important to assess our risk to check this, um, this tool during the growing season, especially when we're coming up on that flower. So you can see here, uh, this is a snapshot from one of our periods uh, this year uh, around flowering in May, probably a little late for Oklahoma, most of our, our region here. Um, but you can see there was, there was high risk uh, in, in Eastern Oklahoma. So if you come in here, you can toggle and, and select some expert commentary, but you can also zoom in on your state. So I'm sorry, I'm gonna show Kansas here, but if I come up here and I zoom, I can zoom in on Kansas, and then I can select some things about my specific cropping system. If I go up to this little menu here, I can choose if I'm growing winter or spring wheat, um, if I have a susceptible or a moderately resistant variety. And, and I can also toggle on some information about my counties and my streets and, my, and places, and that makes it a little more, um, more, more um, straightforward to find an individual farm. But one of the key things here, so you can actually key in the date or your anticipated um, flowering date. You could go back in the past and look at your risk. And then it forecasts risk up to 72 hours after that, that entered date. So here we've got um, May 18th of, of this past year. So you can see at that point that we had pockets of risk um, uh, in areas that we typically in Kansas see risk, this eastern part of the state. This is a, a hot spot for fusarium head blight uh, because it, it does have the moisture for it. But we also had risk, risk areas in central and, and western Kansas, and that's what caught us off guard in this past season, right? So unlike stripe rust, when we're thinking about fusarium head light, there are only a limited number of products that are labeled for control. And so several of these have been on, um, on the market for a long time. So Prozaro, Proline, and Caramba. I was working on Prozaro 10 years ago uh, when I was working on my master's. So you, that, there really hadn't been a lot of um, change in, in the products and, and the mode of action. So here you can see that all of the, the most of the labeled products have this DMI class of fungicides here. It's important that we don't spray our strobular and fungicides. They don't control fusarium head light 
and they can result in disproportionately high DON. So you'll see that you don't have things like azoxystrobin labeled for fusarium head blight control. Recently, within the last five years, Moravis ACE was introduced into the market. And that product introduces um, not only a DMI, but also an SBHI. So that's a, a newer mode of, uh, or a different mode of action. And that's important because there have been reports of um, fungicide resistance uh, showing up in populations of Fusarium uh, griminiarum in different states. And most of our states are very sensitive to this particular SDHI. So just like weeds, unfortunately, we got to think about resistance management and we have to be good stewards of our fungicide products. They, they sneak up, it sneaks up on you a little bit more with fungi, but we definitely have to think about resistance management, right? So having new modes of action is, um, is great for the market. There are two that was a new product, um, uh, recent product in the last five years or so. There will be two new products labeled for uh, fusarium head blight control. So there's Spirex, which is a KSF product, and Prozaro Pro, uh, which will be a replacement, a bear product for Prozaro. And that Prozaro Pro actually also adds a group seven SPHI fungicide. So that um, uh, will be a, a good addition to the market here. We just have some very preliminary data that I won't share on these two products. Um, we don't want to share just one year of data, for example, on a product. So we do have um, fusarium head -like trials where we compare um, fungicide efficacy, but also where we compare the integration of um, fungicides and uh, variety resistance. And so in this case, we um, compared uh, three varieties. We'll call them just representatives of the class of resistance. So Zenda is one of our best available um, fusarium head blight varieties uh, in Kansas. And then Bob Dole is something that's more intermediate. They're not perfect. So both of these varieties will definitely have to see the high disease pressure years, but they, they are better than something like, for example, um, Westbred 4458, which is very susceptible here. We also compared two timings. So we compared, um, oh, rats. So we compared that, that um, speaks 10.5.1 timing. So that's that flowering time point where we have our anthers out. That's what we consider perfect timing for fusarium head blight control, early flowering. And then we also compared an earlier time point. So one of the label recommendations for Moravisase and one of the nice things uh, potentially about it, oh, well, that's just not right. I don't know how I did that again. Right. <laughs> Someone take this thing away from me here. So um, one of the things about Moravis Ace is that it was labeled to be applied at Beaks 10.3. So that's at that actually at um, mid heading. So that would be kind of a step change for Fusarium Head Blight. So most of the products have not been labeled to be applied um, at that timing. Um, but what you'll see is that uh, there's a slight issue with that. So we still recommend that perfect timing or that flowering timing or later uh, be used for fusarium head blight. So if I do this a third time, I'm just going to end the talk. <laughs> so you can see here when we are looking at our, our um, varieties compared with our fungicides, this is index. That's a measure of our um, our severity of disease, so how bad disease was visually. We also look at the grain and we look at toxin and other things. But here you can see Zenda, our more intermediate variety or our more resistant variety. Well, it does, in a high pressure situation, it does a lot of the legwork here. So here's our untreated inoculated. You can see there's a good amount of disease in Zenda, but nothing like we saw in WB4458. So in those high pressure, situations, it's always better to go in with a, a moderately resistant variety, right, and not rely on the fungicide. Um, but if we add Prosaro at anthesis, so at flowering, we do get a significant reduction in disease in, in all of our varieties, but uh, particularly in Zenda here. And we saw that um, uh, fairly good control with all of our products. Um, this, again, is Moravis Ace at flowering and Moravis Ace early, so pre-flowering. And we do get good control. Um, Moravis Ace might be a bit of a step change. So in, in the multi-state data, we do see slightly better disease control. So that's a good option uh, for fusarium head blight. 
The caution, though, that we've seen in some of our, our data um, from multiple states, and we're still thinking through, is that actually uh, when we're looking at Don, that vomit toxin, uh, we, when we're thinking about Moravis 8 applied early, we actually see higher Don than we would expect in some varieties. So here you can see Zenda, our untreated and inoculated, and our Prosaro application at Anthesis, our Moravis Ace application at Anthesis. You can see there was reasonable control of Don in Zenda, but here you see disproportionately higher Don in that, that early application. And that's been something that's been seen in several varieties in several states, right? So the recommendation, um, so that's something we don't want, right? We don't want grain that looks pretty healthy and it goes in and it gets docked for having um, high, high levels of Don. So it's still better to get that application on late than it is early for fusarium heads. Like, so if you start to flower and you get five days into your flowering window, that's still a better option and you'll still get more, more control of Don and disease than you will by applying by applying early, right? That's what some of this data is showing. So I don't think I have, how much time do I have here? I don't want to run to like, like a couple minutes left. So I just want to touch on just one more subject. Um, and this is something that has been a problem this year and last year in Oklahoma and Kansas. And so we've been getting calls from the Wheat Commission in Oklahoma and in Kansas the wheat coming out of this region has high levels of common bun or stinking smut, right? It's been graded smutty and that is affecting our trading partners, right? And some of our downstream buyers of the wheat. So they've come to us, the plant pathologists, and they said, please get people to use C treatments and get rid of this problem. Because even if our grain is blended in, you can imagine with common bun, you get blended into a lot of a lot of nice healthy grain, and these spores will get um, will get blended in, and you'll have spores on everything. So I've got tons of samples that came out of Oklahoma and out of Kansas, and every elevator sample that I've tested out of both states has common bun spores that we can detect. So that is not great, right? The good news is there are several seed treatments that work really well for common bun. And those seed treatments provide protection for multiple diseases, right? So you get a lot of time for your buck. It's not that expensive, at least where, where we are, to apply a fungicide seed treatment. And you get control of not only common mud, but other like smut, for example, loose smut, which can kind of um, eat away, ankle rob your yield, uh, can cause early help with early season damping off and some of our root and foot rot. So you do get a lot of protection from applying those early seed treatments, right? This is what we just talked about, um, uh, about those discounts. So one of the, the key things is you don't um, see common bun really until harvest. So it's one of those diseases that can, can sneak up on you a bit. And the hardest calls I've had this past year out of, out of Kansas were these calls where loads of grain were rejected completely because the levels were so high. Um, it can also cause uh, different problems like, like fires during harvest, right? So, so that's really something we don't want. Also just a bad, bad, uh, bad news for our yields, right? So here we have um, some, it's hard to see here, but we had a 50% height reduction in our untreated uh, mini plots here where we were testing uh, seed treatment fungicide efficacy. And you can see you have almost perfect control with applying something like uh, Raxel Pro MD, for example, just a, just a seed treatment that has one of the products that works. So we have a publication where we talk about seed treatment fungicides for wheat. I would invite you to check that out. Um, uh, a lot of these fungicides work really well for, um, for common bun. And we wanna make sure that we have these um, active ingredients that are labeled for common bunt. So those, those DMI fungicides work really well, tebuconazole, um, diphenaconazole, any product that has those in them uh, work really well. We wanna make sure we have pretty well clean seed because the chaff can really affect how well our, cover, our seed is covered with the treatment. And we wanna make sure we mix our seed treatments pretty well uh, to have uniform coverage. Here in our, our table, you can see that actually um, we have several products here, Cruiser Max Vibrant Cereals. Almost all of these have one of those um, 
those products, those DMI fungicides, diphenaconazole, et cetera, and all of those are, are labeled for common fund. And we see good protection, right? So just getting that seed treatment on is really important uh, for this particular disease, right? So having one of those active ingredients uh, will, will almost perfectly protect against common fund. We want to make sure we have that good coverage there. So I'm sorry if I went over time. I probably don't have much time for questions, but did anything come up here that uh, anyone has any questions about? Oh, use area lines in the soil. So it survives in residue very well, up to um, up to some of the studies have shown even up to five to ten years in residue. So if that residue gets managed, you can definitely see a decline year after year. So if you go in with something like soybean, um, you can see a reduction in, in inoculum over time. But if you do have some of that corn residue or wheat residue there, you, you still could have a problem. Hopefully that answers your question. So unfortunately it can survive a while in residue. All right. Thank you, Dr. Andre. Yes, thank you. All right, I appreciate you coming down from Kansas and uh, uh, presenting. We have one more, so don't run away yet. We have one more, then we're going to go to refreshments. We'll be outside. Uh, after Dr. Royer, come on up, Dr. Royer. After Dr. Royer, we're going to announce the uh, grad student poster winners uh, and, and also share our appreciation with the judges. But without further ado, Dr. Royer, help us kill the bugs. If you can, send that over your head. That's the second mic for the first one. Okay. Great. Okay. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here um, to do this today. I want to talk about a couple of things in terms of sorghum headward management that uh, and share some things that we're doing with you and some concerns that we have as well. Um, see what we can see what we can talk about addressing those. So, you know, we always think about headworms. It's really a complex. It's not one species, although this is probably the predominant one that we'll find in our uh, sorghum heads. The corn earworm, it damages both the whorl and panicle, mostly the panicle, but causes severe yield loss to developing head and the fall army worm, which um, a lot of times kind of refer to it as the whorl worm as well, uh, but it will get into both the, the, uh, the developing head and the whorl. Um, haven't, I've never been very successful at trying to control them in the whorl. And I think part of it might be that uh, by the time we notice them, uh, they've, they've gotten really big and they're buried pretty deep in the world and they're not that easy to get accessible, but maybe one or two of the pesticides that we have registered now, if you want to spend the money, um, can control them a little better. But this is something I wanted to talk about first, that chlorpyrifos is gone. And it was a, I mean, I think it was a really good product to have around. If I was having to pick one organophosphate insecticide uh, to keep, it would probably have been this, this one. It's really kind of unfortunate that it's not. But there's been a history with it. Um, I, I uh, monitor a group called uh, Beyond Pesticides because they, they send me they send me a weekly thing that I'm supposed to contact my congressman to complain about something or another. And I, I do that. Uh, I just want to see what, you know, what they're thinking. But um, chlorpyrifos has been on their, uh, their uh, list for a long time. And it's been a process that's gone through with this. And so you can see here that uh, back in 2000, um, I had been here in Oklahoma that long. That's when registrants voluntarily eliminated most homeowner uses. Um, and it was, it was a, I, I remember using it before that when I was, uh, before 2000, it was a pretty good cockroach product at the time. It was used as a termiticide as well. 
and they uh, they so they voluntarily eliminated their their use as a termiticide and use on tomatoes. Um, maybe with the termiticide, they had other products that they thought were going to be better anyway. But uh, they also restricted use on apples and grapes. That was back in two thousand. Uh, then EPA started uh, the next and two years later to establish buffer zones to protect water and reduced application rates on a number of crops and increased requirements for protective clothing for uh, workers, personal protective equipment, that kind of thing. And then in 2011, they completed a comprehensive review on human health risks. And uh, so in 2012, they reduced aerial application rates and created no spray buffer zones uh, for ground air blast and aerial applications, especially around public spaces. Then in 2014 to 16 is when they started revising the human health risks assessment. And that's where, uh, uh, that's where the, the Ninth Circuit court, uh, uh, court got involved because they had this data, but they weren't releasing it and they weren't making a decision on it. And so they were kind of forced to, EPA was forced to uh, make a decision to issue a final rule on that. And so um, right now it's not available. It, uh, the tolerances have been taken away, which, uh, you know, if you remember when fear Dan was labeled for uh, use in a lot of crops, once the tolerances are gone, the use is gone. and um, the companies are probably not going to be uh, as interested in going through the process of even evaluating the non-agriculture or non-food uses uh, for possible re registration. We'll have to see on that. That's something that's coming up by October. So it's gone. And uh, here's some of the products that were labeled for headworm control. There's, of course, Lors Band, but it was also sold in a number of generic compounds. Uh, Bolton is a combination with uh, gamma cyhalothrin. Cobalt was a combination with gamma cyhalothrin. Uh, Lambda Fos was a combination with Lambda. And Stallion was a combination with Zeta. So it was expanding their, their application, that uh, was expanding their, their, their spread of con uh, control. So what are the alternatives now? Uh, I, I, I wanna point something out here because I've heard this uh, theme talked about a little bit um, about resistance development. And I, I just wanna point out that there's a lot of products that are registered for control of headworm, but there are a lot of them are in one mode of action, pyrethroids, so you can see all the ones here, there's alpha, beta, delta. Um, of course, we've heard about delta for other reasons, right? But uh, we haven't, I guess we don't have Omicron here anywhere. So, uh, but we do have gamma, lambda, and zeta. Uh, they're all pyrethroids, um, resolved molecules, that, but they all pretty much work in the same mode of action. So uh, we tend to rely on these quite a bit. That's what's out there and um, the, uh, the cost effectiveness is pretty pretty high. So just need to point out that if reliance on one mode of action and one type of control will do the same thing for insects as it does for weeds and it will do the same thing as it does for uh, resistant uh, uh, plant diseases. So, but there's a lot of products that are registered and available and they have headworm, <laughs> A fall armyworm or corn earworm on the label. We do have some other alternatives. Uh, Carbaryl is a, 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 a carbamate uh, mode of action. These are all these are all numbers that uh, the you know we've had, we've talked about. I've heard we talked about Hyrac and Frac. Well, this is Irac, and uh, this is the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee, and they come out with their list of uh, modes of action. <clears throat> So we have several products uh, that are different modes of action that are available to help control headworm. Um, and some of them are very effective. And then we have mixes as well that uh, typically include a pyrethroid, but they also include some other mode of action as well. And that at least uh, when, when a product like that is, is uh, applied, 
it's attacking that insect from two different uh, ways. And it's a lot harder for an insect to develop resistance to two different um, uh, modes of action than it is, is one, uh, at least according to my, uh, my old toxicology teacher uh, from years ago. And we also have this baclavirus that has uh, it's, it's halogen or phologen that are um, starting to be used. Um, the, the picture on top there is, is uh, let's see if I can do that right. I took that picture in a field in west, uh, northwestern Oklahoma um, where uh, halogen had been applied. And it was amazing how well it worked up there. It got, they got it out there at the right time. And you see these, uh, let's see if I got, yeah. You see these dead caterpillars, they, uh, they get infected with the virus, they crawl up on top of the plant, and then Mother Nature helps spread that virus around to other areas of the field and, and it blows. And it actually, in this case, it went from one field and, and jumped over into another field and started affecting that when the virus started getting blown around and, and attracted. Want to keep, that, keep this in mind, these are very specific species specific uh, viruses, baclaviruses. Uh, halogen works on corn earworm. Phologen works on fall armyworm, but they don't necessarily work uh, with the other species. And you, uh, the, red, the recommendations that, uh, that seems to work the best are to apply early so that virus will start infecting the caterpillars and then spread. Uh, so the biggest challenge is getting out there at the right time. And the biggest challenge for the manufacturers is actually mass production of these vir uh, viable viruses uh, for sale. But uh, talk to my colleagues in Kansas. Um, they're, they're, really high, they're really high on this. And I've seen it work in Oklahoma in a couple situations that works pretty well. Let's see. There we go. Someday, um, one of the things that I know that people are looking at now are what they call RNI, uh, RNA, uh, I pesticides. And what these things, these are very specific as well. They bind to a messenger RNA. They interfere with its ability to transfer information to the, the DNA that forms the proteins at the cellular level that these, these uh, organisms do to continue to live and grow. Um, there's a couple ways that these can be um, applied that they're looking at. One of them is to be uh, transformed plants so that uh, they're actually producing the RNAi in their plant tissue um, so, because they typically have to be um, consumed to, to work pretty well so that they, they receive it and they get, uh, they get the RNAi and it, it starts interfering with them. Uh, they're also looking at topical applications, something that uh, um, be able to apply similar to a pesticide application. They, uh, you know, they've done work at different times on insects, plant viruses, pathogenic fungi, and nematodes. But the, the, what's interesting is, for example, with insects, they work, uh, they, they've shown that these things are very effective on something like corn earworm beetles but they're not very effective on caterpillars. So they've still got some ways to go to really develop these things so that they can be effective in a way that we would want to, to have them available. But um, they also offer some other um, benefits in terms of um, not, be, they, not affecting, <clears throat> not affecting uh, uh, natural enemies and non-targets or uh, for, for health as well. So. Um, this, could, this could be something we'll be looking at in the future, especially as some of our older uh, technologies get taken away like uh, chlorpyrifos has been. I also just want to point out that when we're talking about uh, uh, controlling corn, uh, controlling headworms, sorghum headworms, that some of the insecticides that we have will flare sugarcane aphid in particular and kill the natural enemies that might be helping with uh, other insect problems. At one time, natural enemies were not very uh, important in terms of trying to control this, this insect and sorghum because 
uh, they just overwhelm the system. But since we've started deploying uh, uh, resistant uh, tolerant varieties and they're being grown, uh, we've seen that uh, the sugar cane aphid, I, I guess I should say it's called the sorghum aphid now, it's actually considered to be a different species from what they originally thought, but very closely related. But it uh, has not been as much, at least in the last few years, has not been uh, seen the, the tremendous outbreaks that we saw a few years ago. Um, so, but I just want to point that out that this can, uh, th this is a, a potential if, if you're not thinking about um, what products to use to, um, so you won't flare aphids. So the next thing that I want to talk about is uh, uh, an effort that we've been doing with, with uh, not only with sugarcane aphid, but with sorghum headworm um, over the last few years. And so we're looking at developing a presence absence sequential sampling program for headworms. Uh, and so why are we developing an application? Well, uh, According to some of the surveys that we've seen in the past, panicle feeding caterpillars either rank first or second most important insect problem in grain sorghum. I would say there's probably other ones that have surpassed it at different times, but uh, this last year, I probably got more uh, questions about headworm control than I did virtually any other insect, except for maybe chinch bugs. Uh, they're also more common in late planted sorghum. So I just want to go through the process that, that we're working on and trying to develop a sampling application. Back in 1979, George Teets and, and a colleague suggested a threshold for headworms that was based at one to two larvae per panicle. That threshold was based on a static average plant population, a static row spacing of 40 inches and did not consider mortality of the caterpillars at different life stages or different instars. So it was pretty, it was pretty straightforward and simple, but uh, uh, a little bit uh, controversial as well. Uh, so we scout for them. We typically use a, a, a shake bucket method as a traditional sampling method, examine 40 heads, Treatment threshold is nominal threshold of that one to two larvae per panicle. That's what was traditionally suggested. Back in 2007, and I remember this uh, greatly because uh, very um, strikingly because Dr. Teets was on my PhD committee when I was working on my PhD. And he was like, uh, I don't know, he was definitely elevated higher than what I am right now in terms of my mind. He was, someone that I uh, had a lot of respect for, but a colleague of mine, uh, Alan Knudsen and, and Greg Kronholm, both of them, noted that sorghum plant density ranges from about 35,000 plants to 100,000 plants per acre, depending on the cultural system. It might even be less than that. Previous research showed that mortality of first and second instar caterpillars was extremely high. So you could get, if they were in the first or second instar, they were getting uh, knocked out before they even had a chance to, to do any damage uh, for most of them, for a high percentage of them. So the ones that survived, uh, there was a lot less of them that survived and were able to start causing damage. They also noted that the crop price and control costs vary from year to year. So, that nominal threshold of one to two caterpillars per head didn't really account for any of these things. And this was controversial because uh, uh, I don't know if, if, if any of you are from, uh, familiar, but Texas has a um, uh, data review uh, couple of days where they review a lot of the extension and research information that was developed. And, um, Dr. Knutson and Greg Kronholm presented this information and there were people yelling at, oh, how can you do this to, you know, George Teets? He's, you know, he knows everything about sorghum. Who do you think you are saying that he didn't do it right? It didn't, it didn't turn out, it turned out okay. Uh, Dr. Um, Teets read the paper and said, yeah, you're right. So uh, things calmed down after that, but 
um, they were they were almost physically threatened <laughs> for presenting this information because it was going against something that, that happened before. So they suggested a dynamic economic injury level based on control cost, grain value, the caterpillar population that accounts uh, uh, um, that also accounts for the high mortality of first and second instars. And so um, after that, uh, several people, uh, including Dr. Elliott and Dr. Giles here, um, Dr. Uh, Bacalou, uh, Mike Brewer at Texas A&M, Brian McCormick at Kansas State, Bonnie Pendleton at West Texas A&M, and, and myself uh, started thinking about developing a more um, robust system for estimating potential damage from, from headworms. And it was also developed and presented in, as a uh, computer program. Um, so it was accessible on a computer at the time. This was published in 2014. So our goals uh, were to use that shake bucket method that was already used and develop a sequential sampling technique in other words, to be able to, on the go, make a decision based upon the accumulated caterpillar count and not by taking a set number of samples. So if you had nothing out there, or if you had really overwhelming numbers, you wouldn't have to spend much time making that decision. It would tell you right away, you either don't have to worry about it or take, you know, take action right away and develop, uh, develop a, um, and then not, uh, develop a rapid sampling program that's packaged in an attractive, easy to use data uh, to make treatment decisions. That were our goals at the time. So the first objective was to develop the rapid sampling system that could be used in the field. And, and our first go around was just kind of a paper system. Um, and then we wanted to convert it to an internet based decision support system that combines both goals with existing information on economic thresholds so that you could determine what the threshold is and, and then use that to make the decision, uh, have a decision tool available. So this, this research that was done to develop this um, was taken in Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas in, in uh, well over, I think 115 fields where we took 50 samples in each field. And then the model was developed to uh, validate statistically that sequential sampling plan so that we could uh, make it usable. So for the assumptions then, the actual economic thresholds were based on the number of caterpillars per acre. And if you think about it, regardless of whether you have 35,000 plants or 110,000 plants, a caterpillar is gonna eat the same amount of grain regardless of what your plant population is. And, and the plant populations are not gonna uh, go, you know, you're gonna have, you know, because of compensation from the plants, um, they can compensate. Um, so, you, so it's really more important to think about the threshold being caterpillars per acre and not caterpillars per plant. And that, that's how the economic threshold was developed. But, you know, when, you, when you're talking about a threshold of 135,000 caterpillars per acre, how do you estimate that? So we have to convert it back into, depending on what your plant population is, that's how you figure out how many um, you're gonna treat and, and make a decision on based upon what your field has for a plant population. The best way to do that is to actually count the number of heads per length of row and then the row spacing and then come up with a, you know, maybe a thousandth of an acre and get a most accurate um, plant um, count. Or you can go with uh, pounds of seed planted per acre, which is a little bit less accurate accurate, or you could do neither and assume that one inch of rainfall results in 1,100 1, heads per acre. These are averages that uh, Rick Kokenhauer gave us a, a while ago. He says, if you don't have any, anything else, that's, that's at least uh, 
um, a possibility. And you can determine that by uh, figuring out where your location is on a map and looking at mesonet uh, long-term data. We also needed to make sure that we estimated headworm populations are characterized by their size, thus accounting for the high mortality. I obviously didn't spell that right, but um, the first and second instar caterpillars. So we're just going with what we would say predominantly large ones, which are over a half inch, predominantly uh, medium ones, which are you know right around a half inch or um, a mixture of the two. Small headworms are not counted because they really don't live very long to be able to do anything due to natural enemies, cannibalism, and weather. So this is what was originally developed. This is what we put on the um, computer. It's a computer program located um, at that website, which no longer exists. It had several elements. It, it had information on sorghum headworm biology and damage, calculator for determining economic thresholds, sequential sampling forms, sampling instructions and information on other sorghum pests that you could look at while you're out in the field. So going forward, uh, why would we go ahead and develop that glance and go smartphone application for, for headworms? Um, the major reason was that uh, Dr. Elliot got tired of having to pay a lot of money to update the software every couple of years. And then you had to download the new um, um, so software and then they had to pay for it. And, and it, it was like every two or three years, um, it would require um, relicensing and, and a new version. And it was very expensive. And so neither of us really wanted to continue to pay to keep that running and available to everyone that wanted to use it. And uh, at the time, I just wasn't smart enough to talk to Dr. Arnall about uh, all the things he was doing with smartphone applications. So our goals now are to, uh, to develop an application that can be used in the field independent of uh, how many, you know, how much reception you have in a given area, calculates the economic threshold based on control costs and crop value, We'll calculate plant population and convert the economic threshold in from caterpillars per acre to caterpillars per plant. It's presence, absence, sequential sampling. So you're just deciding, you know, this, this is so, how many we have right now. And it kind of is an accumulated number of caterpillars and, and it, the sequential sampling. And we also want to make sure that if you're sampling multiple fields, you can keep track of the decisions that you make in any given time on multiple fields, as long as you name them different field names. And we've got finally got some experience doing this. We're just about ready to release uh, the sugarcane aphid application. Uh, right now it's being beta tested, but it's been tested for uh, some time. And it, it will be available uh, download through the App Store in both um, uh, Apple and um, either, either, either smartphone that you have, whatever system you're using. But right now it's being evaluated by the App Store. They have to go through a checklist of things before they'll, they'll allow it to be uh, presented. But it's, it's uh, at that stage right now where um, the app store is actually evaluating it, but it works in the same way. It uh, allows us to, to make uh, control, estimate control costs, price of grain per bushel, whether that in this case, whether the variety is resistant to sugarcane or not. And then it's just a question of looking at a plant, deciding whether that plant, the two, the two leaves that you sample, that you look at have less than 50 aphids or more than 50 aphids. If it has more than 50 aphids, you just say it's an infested plant. If it has less than that, you say it's not infested and it keeps track at every uh, stop that you make uh, of those three plants. And you just uh, punch those in and it will give you, uh, it'll tell you to start sampling. And once you get a decision made, it'll tell you to um, either treat or not treat or keep sampling one of the two. So with that, 
I think there's a, there's time to announce the awards, um, and I appreciate you sticking around, listening to me, and it won't be before long that we can go party, I guess, a little bit, right?